Technology and Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Commerce will now come to order. Today, we will be holding a joint hearing entitled Disinformation Nation, Social Media's Role in Promoting Extremism and Misinformation. Due to the COVID-19 public health emergency, today's hearing is being held remotely. All members and witnesses will be participating via video conferencing. As part of our hearing, microphones will be set on mute for the purpose of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members and witnesses, you will need to unmute your microphones each time you wish to speak. Additionally, members will need to be visible on screen in order to be recognized. Due to the anticipated length of this hearing, the committee will take a 15 minute recess around three o'clock to provide witnesses and members a restroom break. Finally, Documents for the record can be sent to Ed Pazmarski and Joe Orlando at the email addresses we have provided to your staff. All documents will be entered into the record at the conclusion of the hearing. The chair will now recognize himself for five minutes. Our nation is drowning in disinformation driven by social media. Platforms that were once used to share photos of kids with grandparents, are all too often havens of hate, harassment, and division. The way I see it, there are two faces to each of your platforms. Facebook has family and friends neighborhood, but it is right next to the one where there is a white nationalist rally every day. YouTube is a place where people share quirky videos, but down the street, anti-vaxxers, COVID deniers, QAnon supporters, and flat earthers are sharing videos. Twitter allows you to bring friends and celebrities into your home, but also Holocaust deniers, terrorists, and worse. Now, it would be one thing if every user chose where to go organically, but almost everything is scripted on social media platforms. Facebook recognizes antisocial tendencies in one user and invites them to visit the white nationalist. YouTube sees another user is interested in COVID-19 and auto starts an anti-vax video. On Twitter, a user following the trending conversation, never knowing it is driven by bots and coordinated disinformation networks run by foreign agents. Your platforms have changed how people across the planet communicate, connect, learn, and stay informed. The power of this technology is awesome and terrifying. And each of you has failed to protect your users and the world from the worst consequence of your creations. This is the first time the three of you have appeared before Congress since the deadly attack on the Capitol on January 6th. That event was not just an attack on our democracy and our electoral process, but an attack on every member of this committee and in the Congress. Many of us were on the House floor and in the Capitol when that attack occurred, and we were forced to stop our work of certifying the election and retreat to safety some of us wearing gas masks and fearing for our lives. We fled as a mob desecrated the Capitol, the House floor, and our democratic process. People died that day, and hundreds were seriously injured. That attack and the movement that motivated it started and was nourished on your platforms. Your platform suggested groups for people to join, videos they should view, and posts they should like driving this movement forward with terrifying speed and efficiency. FBI documents show that many of these individuals used your platforms to plan, recruit, and execute this attack. According to independent research, users on Facebook were exposed 1.1 billion times to misinformation related to the election last year alone, despite changes to your policies and claims that you removed election misinformation. Our nation is in the middle of a terrible pandemic. Nearly 550,000 Americans have lost their lives to this deadly disease, more than any other country on the planet. And an independent study found that on Facebook alone, that users across five countries, including the United States, were exposed to COVID disinformation an estimated 3.8 billion times, again, despite claims of fixes and reforms. And now, as the Biden administration is working to implement the American Rescue Plan and get vaccines in people's arms, 
We are faced with waves of disinformation on social media about the safety and efficacy of these shots. These vaccines are our best chance we have to fight this virus. And the content that your websites are still promoting, still recommending, and still sharing is one of the biggest reasons people are refusing the vaccine. And things haven't changed. My staff found content on YouTube telling people not to get vaccines and was recommended to similar videos. The same was true on Instagram, where it was not only easy to find vaccine disinformation, but platforms recommended similar posts. The same thing happened on Facebook, except they also had anti-vax groups to suggest as well. And Twitter was no different. If you go to any of these super spreader accounts that remain up despite the policies meant to curb this anti-vax content, you'll see this content. Now, understand this, you can take this content down. You can reduce the vision. You can fix this, but you choose not to. We saw your platforms remove ISIS terrorist content. We saw you tamp down on COVID misinformation at the beginning of the pandemic. And we have seen this disinformation drop when you have promoted reliable news sources and removed serial disinformation super spreaders from your platform. You have the means, but time after time, you are picking engagement and profit over the health and safety of your users, our nation, and our democracy. These are serious issues. And to be honest, it seems like you all just shrug off billion dollar fines. Your companies need to be held accountable. We need rules, regulations, technical experts in government, and audit authority of your technologies. Ours is the committee of jurisdiction, and we will legislate to stop this. The stakes are simply too high. The chair will now recognize Mr. Latta, ranking member of the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology for five minutes for his opening statement. Well, I thank the chairman for recognizing me, and I want to thank our witnesses for being with us today uh, for a conversation that's long overdue in the Energy and Commerce Committee. I'm deeply concerned by your decisions to operate your companies in a vague and biased manner, with little to no accountability, while using Section 230 as a shield for your actions and their real-world consequences. Your companies have the power to silence the President of the United States, shut off legitimate journalism in Australia, shut down legitimate scientific debate on a variety of issues, dictate which articles or websites are seen by Americans when they search the internet. When these actions are taken, users have little to no recourse to appeal the decision if they are aware of your actions. In most cases, we simply don't know. What does this mean for everyday Americans? We are all aware of big tech's ever increasing censorship of conservative voices, and their commitment to serve the radical progressive agenda by influencing a generation of children and removing shutting down or canceling any news, books, and even now toys that aren't considered woke. This is fundamentally un-American. At a recent hearing on disinformation and extremism online, Professor Turley, one of the nation's foremost experts on constitutional law, testified about the little brother problem a problem which private entities do for the government, which it cannot legally do for itself. As of January of this year, Google has a greater than 92 market share in search. Facebook has over 2.7 billion, billion monthly users, and Twitter has 187 million daily users. Your companies have enormous control over whose ideas are seen, read, or heard around the world. This gives you great power, and if misused, as we have seen in recent years, your actions have a ripple effect throughout the world that result in American voices being removed from the marketplace of ideas. While the little brother problem of censorship is frightening enough, other serious harms are occurring on these platforms that affect ordinary Americans. Young American children and teenagers are addicted, actually addicted to their devices and social media. This problem has been exacerbated by the pandemic and will only get worse if children continue to be separated from their peers and cannot learn from their teachers in a classroom. Your platforms are purposely designed to keep our children hooked to their screens. The use of social media has been linked to increased rates of depression, mental illness, cyberbullying, and suicide among America's youth. Illegal drugs continue to be sold online despite your previous commitments to solve these issues. Mr. Chairman, I, I do ask unanimous consent to submit a letter to the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy for this record. 
uh, without problems. objective support. Thank you very much. Serious problems continue to persist, and I wonder how much you are truly dedicating to combating these actions. What actions are you taking to educate Americans about the dangers of using your site, especially the dangers for our kids? As ranking member of the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology, we have oversight of any change made to Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Section 230 provides you with, the, with liability protection for content moderation decisions made in good faith. Based on recent actions, however, it is clear that your definition of good faith moderation includes censoring viewpoints you disagree with and establishing full independent appeal process that doesn't make its content moderation decision based on American principles of free expression. I find that highly con concerning. I look forward to today's hearing and as an important step in reconsidering the extent to which big tech deserves to retain the significant liability protection. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, gentlemen, yields back. The chair now recognizes Chair Schakowsky, chair of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Commerce for five minutes for her opening statement. Thank you, it's a pleasure to um, co-chair this meeting with you. Um, I want to welcome our witnesses and thank them for coming. It is not an exaggeration to say that your companies have fundamentally and permanently transformed our very culture and our understanding of the world. Much of this is for good, um, but it is also true that our country, our democracy, even our understanding of what is truth has been harmed by the, pro the pro proliferation and, dis and dissemination of misinformation and extremism, all of which has deeply divided us. What our witnesses today need to take away from this hearing is that self-regulation has come to the end of its road and that this democracy, this, this democratic, uh, dem the, the people that you see before you um, uh, elected to by the people um, is uh, preparing to move forth with, with legislation and regulation. The regulation that we seek should not attempt to limit constitutionally protected freedom of speech, but it must hold platforms accountable when they are used in, to incite violence and hatred, or as in the case of the COVID pandemic, spread misinformation that costs thousands of lives. All three of the, of the uh, companies that are here today run platforms that are hotbeds of misinformation and disinformation. And despite all the promises and new policies to match, disinformation was, uh, disinformation was uh, rampant in the 2020 election especially targeting vulnerable, vulnerable communities. For example, Spanish language ads run by the Trump, but the Trump campaign falsely accused President Biden of in being endorsed by Venezuelan President Maduro. The spread of disinformation fell, um, uh, disinformation fed upon itself until it arrived at the capital of the United States on January 6th, which cost five lives. The lives lost in the insurgents, uh, insurgency were not the first cases of these um, platforms failure, or nor even the worst. In 2018, Facebook admitted a genocide of the Rohingya people in Myanmar was planned and executed on Facebook. 2020 saw the rise of, a, of coronavirus disinformation on Facebook platforms, including the um, playing of the, uh, we, we, they called it the plan-demic. This film got 1.8 million views and 150,000 shares before it was removed. Um, Disinformation like planned 
uh, pandemic um, made people skeptical of the need for vaccines and almost certainly cost um, contributed to the horrible loss of life during the pandemic. Disinformation and also HAPS, HAPS platforms to spread viruses, I'm looking for a, a time, um, to uh, d disinformation also um, hopes, um, HAPS from platform to, uh, to, to platform, it be at plan, Plandemic actually was first on YouTube before it was on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Misinformation regarding the election um, dropped 73% across social media platforms after Twitter permanently suspended Trump um, as well as um, uh, an, uh, an, uh, also, I'm sorry? Okay. Um, and also the uh, Capitol insurgency and QAnon. But the question really is, what took so long? The witnesses here today have demonstrated time and time again that uh, they um, that that they do not um, that self-regulation has not worked. They must be held accountable for allowing disinformation and misinformation to, to spread. Um, and that is why I'll, I'll be introducing the Online Consumer Protection Act, which I hope will earn bipartisan support. And thank you, I yield back. General Lady General yields Lady. back. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Bill Arrakis, ranking member for the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Commerce for five minutes for his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Thank you for participating in today's hearing, all the, the witnesses and the members. I've been thinking about this hearing since our side first requested this uh, hearing last year. My time in Congress has provided me enough knowledge about the history of the committee to know what the Telecommunications Act was and importantly, what it wasn't. Components of the, that law have been struck down by the courts. Uh, while other provisions are interpreted and applied differently than first conceived. This is all a departure from congressional intent. Regardless of what one thinks of whether all of the Communications Decency Act was the right approach, the same members that voted for Section 230 voted for that entire bill. The statute was meant to protect our society, specifically our children. To our witnesses today, here lies the problem for you. You don't want the federal government telling you what parts of your company you're allowed to operate. So imagine things, imagine things from our perspective when you pick and choose what parts of the law you want to follow. I really do admire your ingenuity. You have created some, something truly remarkable in my opinion. But with that power, you must also be good Samaritans, and you have an obligation to be stewards of your platform. If your legal department doesn't believe you're bound to the intent of the law, I would hope your moral compasses will. Many of my colleagues will raise legitimate concerns about the attack on the Capitol from January, and other colleagues can point to what occurred in our cities last summer. These were all incidents where social media escalated tension, incited chaos, and bred extremism through echo chambers and algorithms. As the new Republican leader, quite an honor, on the uh, Commerce Protection and Co uh, Commerce Committee, so the Consumer Protection and Commerce Committee, I have been digging into how your companies operate. That led me to run a survey, survey of my district following our big tech hearing announcement. The conclusion is my constituents simply don't trust you anymore. With thousands of responses, over 82% say they do not trust big tech to be good stewards of their platforms or consistently enforce their policies. That includes my constituent who told me, we were providing information to local families on teen suicide 
risks on Facebook live stream. It was blocked by Facebook. Another constituent said she has seen countless teens be bullied online or simply not able to process a devastating comparison game that they are forced to deal with on social media. Others told me they stopped using your services altogether out of fear and distrust. One even told me they quit social media due to treatment from your co companies over their family's Christian views. Each one of these represents a story of how your companies have failed people. And you'll be hearing from my colleagues with more of these stories about how big tech has lost its way, highlighting a much larger problem. People want to use your services, but they suspect your coders are designing what they think we should see and hear by keeping us online longer than ever and all with the purpose to polarize or monetize us, disregarding any consequences for that assault for the assault on our inherent freedoms, which we hold so dearly. So I don't want to hear about how changing your current law is going to hurt startups because I've heard directly from them accusing you of anti-competitive tactics. None of us want to damage entrepreneurs. What I do want to hear is what you will do to bring our country back from the fringes and stop the poisonous practices that drive depression, isolation, and suicide, and instead cooperate with law enforcement, law enforcement to protect our citizens. Our kids are being lost while you say you will try to do better, as we've heard countless times already. We need true transparency and real change. We need, again, not empty promises from you. And we've heard that over and over again. The fear you should have coming into this hearing today isn't that you're going to uh, get uh, upbraided by a member of Congress. It's that our committee knows how to get things done when we come together. We can do this with you or without you, and we will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Pallone, Chairman of the full committee for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Doyle and Schakowsky for this very important hearing. We're here today because the spread of disinformation and extremism has been growing online, particularly on social media, where there are little to no guardrails in place to stop it. And unfortunately, this disinformation and extremism doesn't just stay online. It has real world, often dangerous and even violent consequences. And the time has come to hold online platforms accountable for their part in the rise of disinformation and extremism. According to a survey conducted by few earlier this month, 30% of Americans are still hesitant or simply do not want to take the COVID-19 vaccine. On January 6th, our nation's capital was violently attacked. This month, Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas identified domestic violent extremism as the greatest threat to the United States, and crimes against Asian Americans have risen by nearly 150% since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Each of these controversies and crimes have been accelerated and amplified on social media platforms through misinformation campaigns, the spread of hate speech, and the proliferation of conspiracy theories. Five years ago, during the 2016 presidential elections, Facebook, Google, and Twitter were warned about, but simply ignored, their platform's role in spreading disinformation. And since then, the warnings have continued, but the problem has only gotten worse. Only after public outrage and pressure did these companies make inadequate attempts to appease critics and lawmakers. But despite the public rebuke, Wall Street continued to reward the company strategies to promote misinformation and disinformation by driving their stock prices even higher. And now, despite repeated promises to seriously tackle this crisis, Facebook, Google, and Twitter instead routinely make minor changes to their policies in response to the public relations crisis of the day, and they will change some underlying internal policy that may or may not be related to the problem, but that's it. The underlying problem remains. 
So, Mr. Chairman, it is now painfully clear that neither the market nor public pressure will force these social media companies to take the aggressive action they need to take to eliminate this information and extremism from their platforms. And therefore, it's time for Congress and this committee to legislate and realign these companies' incentives. Today, our laws give these companies and their leaders a blank check to do nothing. Rather than limit the spread of disinformation, Facebook, Google, and Twitter have created business models that exploit the human's brain preference for divisive content to get Americans hooked on their platforms at the expense of the public interest. And it isn't just that social media companies are allowing disinformation to spread, it's that in many cases, they're actively amplifying and spreading it themselves. And fines, to the extent they're levied at all, have simply become the cost of doing business. The dirty truth is that they are relying on algorithms to purposely promote conspiratorial, divisive, or extremist content so that they can take money, more money and add dollars. And this is because the more outrageous and extremist the content, the more engagement and views these companies get from their users, and more views equals more money, Mr. Chairman. That's what it's all about, more money. It's crucial to understand that these companies aren't just mere bystanders. They're playing an active role in the meteoric rise of disinformation and extremism because they make money on it. So when a company is actually promoting this harmful content, I question whether existing liability protection should apply. Members on this committee have suggested legislative solutions and introduced bills. The committee is going to consider all these options so that we can finally align the interests of these companies with the interests of the public and hold the platforms and their CEOs accountable when they stray. That's why you're here today, Mr. Zuckerberg, Mr. Uh, Puchai, and Mr. Dorsey. You failed to meaningfully change after your platforms played a role in fomenting insurrection, in abetting the spread of the virus, and trampling American civil liberties. And while it may be true that some bad actors will shout fire in the crowded theater by promoting harmful content, your platforms are handing them a megaphone to be heard in every theater across the country and the world. Your business model itself has become the problem, and the time for self-regulation is over. It's time we legislate to hold you accountable. That's what we're going to do, and I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Doyle, and, and Ms. Schakowsky, because I know that you're very serious about moving forward on legislation, which we will do, I promise everyone. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentlemen, yield back. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. Rogers, the ranking member of the full committee, for five minutes for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ten years ago, when I joined big tech platforms, I thought they would be a force for good. I thought that they would help us build relationships and promote transparency in Congress. I can testify today, I was wrong. That is not what has transpired. You have broken my trust. Yes, because you failed to promote the battle of ideas and free speech. Yes, because you censor political viewpoints you disagree with. Those polarizing actions matter for democracy. But do you know what convinced me big tech is a, a, is a destructive force? It's how you've abused your power to manipulate and harm our children. Your platforms are my biggest fear as a parent. I'm a mom of three school-aged kids, and my husband and I are fighting the big tech battles in our household every day. It's a battle for their development, a battle for their mental health, and ultimately, a battle for their safety. I've monitored your algorithms. I've monitored where your algorithms lead them. It's frightening and I know that I'm not alone. After multiple teenage suicides in my community, I reached out to our schools and we started asking questions. What's going on with our kids? What's making them feel so alone, so empty and in despair? And this is what I heard over and over again from parents, pediatricians, school administrators and teachers. They're all raising the alarm about social media. A day doesn't go by that I don't talk to friends and other parents who tell me, their 14 year old is depressed. She used to love soccer. Now they can't get her to do anything. She never gets off her device or leaves her room. I, I think about a mom who told me she can't leave her daughter alone ever because she harms herself. For the family who's recovering after almost losing their daughter to a, a predator she met online. 
These stories are not unique to me or Eastern Washington. I recently heard of a young college student who has lost nine friends to suicide. This is unimaginable. The science on social media is becoming clearer. Between 2011 and 2018, rates of depression, self-harm, suicides, and suicide attempts exploded among American teens. During that time, rates of teen depression increased more than 60% with a larger increase among young girls. Between 2009 and 15, emergency room admi uh, admissions for self-harm among 10 to 14 year olds tripled and suicide substantially increased. One study found during that time, teens who use their devices for five or more hours a day were 66% more likely to have at least one suicide related outcome compared to those who use their device for just one. Other studies have found that teens who spend more time online report lower psychological well being and more feelings of loneliness. Remember, our kids, the users, are the product. You, big tech, are not advocates for children. You exploit and profit off of them. Big tech needs to be exposed and completely transparent for what you are doing to our children so parents like me can make informed decisions. We also expect big tech to do more to protect children because you haven't done enough. Big tech has failed to be good stewards of your platforms. I have, uh, I have two daughters and a son with a disability. Let me be clear. I do not want you defining what is true for them. I do not want their future manipulated by your algorithms. I do not want their self-worth defined by the engagement tools you built to attract their attention. I do not want them to be in danger from what you've created. I do not want their emotions and vulnerabilities taken advantage of so you can make more money and have more power. I'm sure most of my colleagues on this committee who are parents and grandparents feel the same way. Over 20 years ago, before we knew what big tech would, would become, Congress gave you liability protections. I want to know, why do you think you still deserve those protections today? What will it take for your business model to stop harming children? I know I speak for millions of moms when I say we need answers and we will not rest until we get them. Thank you. Back to General Lady. General Lady yields back. Uh, the chair would now like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' written opening statements shall be made a part of the record. I would now like to introduce our witnesses for today's hearing and thank them all for appearing today. Uh, first, we have Mark Zuckerberg, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Facebook, Sundar Pichai, Chief Executive Officer, Google, and Jack Dorsey, Chief Executive Officer of Twitter. Uh, we want to thank all three of you for joining us today. We look forward to your testimony. Uh, each of you will uh, have five minutes to give your opening statements. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, we'll start with you. You're recognized for five minutes. Chairs Pallone, Chikowski, and Doyle, Ranking Members Rogers, Lata, and Bilirakis, and members of the committee. I'm glad that this committee is looking at all the ways that misinformation and disinformation show up in our country's discourse. There are important challenges here for our society, and we have to decide how we want to handle speech that is legal but harmful, and who should be responsible for what people say. Misinformation is not a new problem. It was 200 years ago that a congressman said that a lie would travel from Maine to Georgia while truth was still getting on his boots. And disinformation has often been spread through traditional media too. But the internet gives everyone the power to communicate, and that certainly presents unique challenges. Now, people often say things that aren't verifiably true, but that speak to their lived experiences. And I think we have to be careful restricting that. For example, if someone feels intimidated or discriminated against while voting, I believe that they should be able to share their experience, even if the election overall was fair. Now, I don't think anyone wants a world where you can only say things that private companies judge to be true where every text message, email, video, and post has to be fact-checked uh, before you hit send. 
But at the same time, we also don't want misinformation to spread that undermines confidence in vaccines, stops people from voting, or causes other harms. At Facebook, we do a lot to fight misinformation. We remove content that could lead to imminent real-world harm. We've built an unprecedented third-party fact-checking program, and if something is rated false, then we add warning labels and significantly reduce its distribution. We invest a lot in directing billions of people to authoritative information. The system isn't perfect, but it's the best approach that we've found to address misinformation in line with our country's values. It's not possible to catch every piece of harmful content without infringing on people's freedoms in a way that I don't think that we'd be comfortable with as a society. Our approach was tested in 2020 when we took extraordinary steps during an extraordinary election. We removed voting misinformation, banned hundreds of militias and conspiracy networks, including QAnon, labeled posts that prematurely or wrongly declared victory, and directed people to official results. We labeled over 180 million posts. We directed 140 million people to our official voting information center, and we helped four and a half million people register to vote. We did our part to secure the integrity of the election. And then on January 6th, President Trump gave a speech rejecting the results and calling on people to fight. The attack on the Capitol was an outrage, and I want to express my sympathy to all of the members, staff, and Capitol workers who had to live through this disgraceful moment in our history. And I want to express my gratitude to the Capitol Police who were on the front lines in defense of our democracy. Now, I believe that the former president should be responsible for his words, and that the people who broke the law should be responsible for their actions. So that leaves the question of the broader information ecosystem. And I can't speak for everyone else, the TV channels, radio stations, news outlets, websites, and other apps, but I can tell you what we did. Before January 6th, we worked with law enforcement to identify and address threats. During and after the attack, we provided extensive support in identifying the insurrectionists and removed posts supporting violence. We didn't catch everything, but we made our services inhospitable to those who might do harm. And when we feared that he would incite further violence, we suspended the former president's account. Now, many people are concerned that platforms can ban elected leaders. I am too. I don't think that private companies should make so many decisions like this alone. We need an accountable process, which is why uh, we created an independent oversight board that can overrule our decisions. And we need democratically agreed rules for the internet. The reality is our country is deeply divided right now. And that isn't something that tech companies alone can fix. We all have a part to play in helping to turn things around, and I think that starts with taking a hard look at how we got here. Now, some people say that the problem is that social networks are polarizing us, but that's not at all clear from the evidence or research. Polarization was rising in America long before social networks were even invented, and it's falling or stable in many other countries where social networks are popular. Others claim that algorithms feed us content that makes us angry because it's good for business, but that's not accurate either. I believe that the division we see today is primarily the result of a political and media environment that drives Americans apart. And we need to reckon with that if we're going to make progress. Now, I know that technology can help bring people together. We see it every day on our platforms. Facebook is successful because people have a deep desire to connect and share, not to stand apart and fight. And we believe that connectivity and togetherness are more powerful ideals than division and discord and that technology can be part of the solution to the challenges our society is facing. And we are ready to work with you to move beyond hearings and get started on real reform. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg. Uh, now, Mr. Pichai, you are now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Pichai, uh, are you on duty? Sorry, I my volume on. Chairman Doyle, Ranking Member Lata, Chairman Chairwoman Shakaski, Ranking Member Pilarakis, Full Committee Chair Pallone, and Full Committee Ranking Member McMorris Rogers and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. To begin, I want to express my sympathies to those who have lost loved ones to COVID or the recent gun violence in Boulder and Atlanta. In difficult times, we are reminded of what connects us as Americans, the hope that we can make things better for our families and our communities. And we at Google are committed to that work. 
I joined Google because I believed the internet was the best way to bring the benefits of technology to more people. Over the past three decades, we have seen how it's inspired the best in society by expanding knowledge, powering businesses, and providing opportunities for discovery and connection. I'm proud that anyone can turn to Google for help, whether they are looking for vaccine information, learning new skills on YouTube, or using digital tools to grow their businesses. In 2020, our products helped 2 million US businesses and publishers generate $426 billion in economic activity. We are energized by the opportunity to help people at scale and humbled by the responsibility that comes with it. Thousands of people at Google are focused on everything from cyber attacks to privacy to today's topic, misinformation. Our mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Core to that is providing trustworthy content and opportunities for free expression while combating misinformation. It's a big challenge without easy answers. 500 plus hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. And approximately 15% of Google searches each day are new to us. 18 months ago, no one had heard of COVID-19. Sadly, coronavirus was the top trending search last year. Staying ahead of new challenges to keep users safe is a top priority. We saw the importance of that on January 6th, when a mob stormed the US Capitol. Google strongly condemns these violent attacks on our democracy and mourns the lives lost. In response, we raised up authoritative sources across our products. On YouTube, we removed live streams and videos that violated our incitement to violence policies and began issuing strikes to those in violation of our presidential elections policy. We removed apps from the Play Store for inciting violence and stopped ads referencing the 2020 election or the Capitol riots as part of our sensitive events policy. We were able to act quickly because we were prepared ahead of the 2020 elections. Our reminders of how to register and vote were viewed over 2 billion times. YouTube's election results information panels have been viewed more than 8 billion times. We also work to keep campaigns safe from cyber attacks and protect platforms from abuse. After the December 8th safe harbor deadline for states to certify elections, we removed content from YouTube that alleged widespread fraud changed the outcome of the election. This past year, we've also focused on providing quality information during the pandemic. Globally, we've committed over $550 million in ad grants for COVID-related PSAs to governments, health organizations, and nonprofits. On YouTube, our COVID information panels have been viewed over 400 billion times. We also removed 850,000 videos and blocked nearly 100 million COVID-related ads throughout 2020. Across all of this work, we strive to have transparent policies and enforce them without regard to politics or point of view. Our ability to provide a range of information and viewpoints while also being able to remove misinformation is possible only because of legal frameworks like Section 230. It's foundational to the open web, which has been a powerful force for good for so many. I look forward to sharing more about our approach today and working together to create a path forward for the web's next three decades. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pichai. The chair now recognizes Mr. Dorsey uh, for five minutes. Thank you, members of the Energy and Commerce Committee and its subcommittees for the opportunity to speak with the American people about how Twitter may be used to spread disinformation and our solutions. My remarks will be brief so we can move to your questions and discussion. In our discussion today, some of you might bring up specific tweets or examples, and I'll probably have an answer like, my team will follow up with you. I don't think that's useful. I'd rather us focus on principles and approaches to address these problems. I'll start with ours. We believe in free expression. We believe in free debate and conversation to find the truth. At the same time, we must balance that with our desire to, for our service not to be used to sow confusion, division, or destruction. This makes the freedom to moderate content critical to us. Our process to moderate content is designed to constantly evolve. We observe what's happening on our service. 
We work to understand the ramifications and we use that understanding to strengthen our operations. We push ourselves to improve based on the best information we have. Much of what we're likely to discuss today are entirely new situations the world has never experienced before, and in some unique cases involve elected officials. And we believe the best way to face a big new challenge is through narrowing the problem to have the greatest impact. Disinformation is a broad concept. We needed to focus our approach on where we saw the greatest risk if we hope to have any impact at all. So we chose to focus on disinformation leading to offline harm and three categories to start manipulated media, public health, and civic integrity. Many of you will have strong opinions on how effective we are in this work. Some of you will say we're doing too much and removing free speech rights. Some of you will say we're not doing enough and end up causing more harm. Both points of view are reasonable and worth exploring. If we woke up tomorrow and decided to stop moderating content, we'd end up with a service very few people or advertisers would want to use. Ultimately, we're running a business and a business wants to grow the number of customers it serves. Enforcing policy is a business decision. Different businesses and services will have different policies, some more liberal than others. And we believe it's critical this variety continues to exist. Forcing every business to behave the same reduces innovation and individual choice and diminishes free marketplace ideals. If instead we woke up tomorrow and decided to ask the government to tell us what content to take down or leave up, we may end up with a service that couldn't be used to question the government. This is a reality in many countries today and is against the right of an individual. This would also have the effect of putting enormous resource requirements on businesses and services, which would further entrench only those who are able to afford it. Smaller businesses would not be able to compete and all activity would be centralized into very few businesses. So how do we resolve these two viewpoints? One way is to create shared protocols. Social media has proven itself important enough to be worthy of an internet protocol. One that a company like Twitter can contribute to and compete on creating experiences people love to use. We've started work on such a protocol, which we call Blue Sky. It intends to act as a decentralized open source social media protocol, not owned by any single company or organization. Any developer around the world can help develop it, just as any company can access its services. How does an open protocol address the concerns raised here? Greater transparency is the strongest benefit. Anywhere, anyone around the world can see everything that's happening in the network, including exactly how it works. One doesn't have to trust a company, just look at the source code. Second, since the base protocol is shared, it will increase innovation around business models, recommendation algorithms, and moderation controls, which are in the hands of individuals rather than private companies. This will allow people to experiment in a market-based approach. Finally, it will allow all of us to observe, acknowledge, and address any societal issues that arise much faster. Having more eyes on the problems will lead to more impactful solutions that can be built directly into this protocol, making the network far more secure and resilient. A decentralized open source protocol for social media is our vision and work for the long term. We continue the cycle mentioned earlier of constantly improving our approach to content moderation in the short term. I hope our discussion today will focus on more enduring solutions. One final note, we are a bunch of humans with a desire to make the world around us better for everyone living today and those that come after us. We make mistakes in prioritization and in execution. We commit to being open about these and doing our best to remedy what we control. We appreciate the enormous privilege we have in building technologies to host some of the world's most important conversations. And we honor the desire to create better outcomes for everyone who interacts with them. Thanks for your time, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Dorsey. Well, we have concluded witness opening statements. At this time, we will move to member questions. Uh, I wanna make sure that members are aware that our witnesses are being assisted by counsel and during questions, our witnesses may briefly mute themselves to seek advice, advice of counsel, uh, which is permitted. Uh, each member will have five minutes to start asking questions of our witnesses. Uh, I ask everyone to please adhere to that five minute rule as we have many people that uh, wanna ask questions. I will start by recognizing myself for five minutes. Mr. Uh, Chairman, gentlemen, point of order. Gentlemen, uh, who's, who's speaking? 
Jeff Duncan, point of order. Yes, sir. If the, witness, if the witnesses are advised by counsel and we're not swearing them in, why would they need counsel? In, in previous hearings, we've always uh, permitted uh, witnesses to have counsel. Uh, sometimes you'll see them uh, at a hearing just leaning back and talking to their counsel before question. Uh, but uh, it's allowed under our rules. And, and I just wanted to make members aware that they may mute themselves while that's going on. They should be sworn in, but I yell back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Gentlemen, my time is short, and I ask that you make your responses as brief and to the point as possible. Uh, if I ask you a yes or no question, I'm just looking for a yes or no, so please respond appropriately. I, I want to start by asking all three of you um, if your platform bears some responsibility for disseminating disinformation related to the election and the Stop the Steal movement that led to the attack on the Capitol. Just a yes or no answer. Mr. Zuckerberg. Chairman, I think our responsibility is to build systems that can I help. Just, Mr. Zuckerberg, I just want a yes or no answer, okay? Yes or no, do you, do you bear some responsibility for what happened? Congressman, our responsibility is to make sure that we build effective systems okay, to help the fight the Okay, the gentleman chooses not to answer the question. Uh, Mr. Pichai, yes or no? Well, we always feel a deep sense of responsibility, but I think we worked hard. Uh, this election effort was one of our most substantive efforts. Is that a yes or a no? Uh, Congressman, it's a complex question. Uh, we okay. We'll move on, uh, Mr. Dorsey. Yes, but yes. you also have to take into consideration a broader ecosystem. It's not Thank just you. about the technology platforms we use. Thank you. Thank you, and and uh, I agree with that, Mr. Zuckerberg. Independent analysis has shown that despite all the things that Facebook did during the election, users still interacted with election misinformation roughly 1.1 billion times over the last year. The initial Stop the Steal group started on Facebook and gained over 350,000 followers in less than a day, faster than almost any other in your platform's history. Uh, and they were immediately calling for violence. In mid-December, you stopped promoting high quality news outlets for election content at a time when the disinformation was at its height. And finally, the FBI has released numerous documents showing that many of the insurrectionists used Facebook to coordinate and plan the attack on January 6th. So my question is, how is it possible for you not to at least admit that Facebook played uh, a central role or, or a, a leading role in facilitating the recruitment, planning, and execution of the attack on the Capitol? Chairman, my, my point is that I think that the responsibility here lies with the people who took the actions to break the law and take and do the insurrection. And secondarily, also uh, the, the people who spread uh, that content, uh, in, including the president, but, but others as well, um, with repeated rhetoric over time, um, saying that the election was rigged and, and encouraging people to organize, I, I think that those people bear the primary responsibility as well. And that was the point that but, I was but, making. But you, I, I understand that, but your platforms supercharged that. Uh, you you took what what uh, a thing and, and magnified in twelve hours. You got three hundred fifty thousand people uh, in, in your site. You 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 gen this up. Your algorithms make it possible to supercharge these kinds of opinions. I I think we're here because of what these platforms enable. How your choices you know put our lives and our democracy at, at risk. And and many of us just find it uh, just just unacceptable. I want to ask each of you another question. Uh, do you think? Uh, vaccines that have been approved for COVID-19 work? Just yes or no. Do you think the vaccines that have been approved work? Mr. Zuckerberg? Yes. Mr. Pichai? Yes, absolutely. Mr. Dorsey? Yes, but I don't, I don't think we're here to discuss our own personal opinions. It's I just want to know if you think the vaccines work, yes? Yes, however. Thank you. Okay, so if you think the vaccines work, why have your companies allowed accounts that repeatedly offend your vaccine disinformation policies to remain up? I mean, according to report, just 12 accounts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram account for 65% of all the vaccine disinformation on your platforms. You're exposing tens of millions of users to this every day. I, I don't have the stats on YouTube, but my understanding is it's similar. So my, my question is, 
Why in the midst of a global pandemic that has killed over half a million Americans that you haven't taken these accounts down that are responsible for the preponderance of vaccine disinformation on your platforms? Uh, will you all commit to taking these platforms down today? Mr. Zuckerberg. Congressman, yes, we do have a policy against uh, allowing well, I know you have a policy, but will you take the sites down today? You still have 12 people up on your site doing this. Will you take them down? Congressman, I would need to look at the, and, and have our team look at the exact examples to make look sure they violate the policy. Look at and, and get back to us place tomorrow, place. because those still exist. We, we found them as early as last night. Uh, Mr. Pichai, how about you? Uh, we have removed over 850,000 videos. Uh, in we removed them all. You still have people that are spreading disinformation on your platforms. There's about 12 super spreaders. We have uh, clear policies and we take down content. Some of the content is allowed if it's people's personal experiences, but you know, we, we definitely- Okay, thank you. Mr. Dorsey, I see my time is getting expired. Mr. Dorsey, will you we take these sites down? You got yes, about 12 yes. super spreaders, will you take them down? Yes, we remove everything against our policy. Thank you. I see my time has expired. Uh, I will now yield to the uh, ranking member, Mr. Latta, for his five minutes. I thank my friend for yielding. Uh, Amanda Todd was just 15 years old when she hung herself. Amanda met a man, met a man online who took inappropriate screenshots of Amanda and proceeded to follow her around the internet and harass her for years. He found her classmates on Facebook he would send them the picture he took of her. To cope with the anxiety, Amanda turned to drugs and alcohol, but it came too much for her. Mr. Zuckerberg, clearly, Miss Todd was underage, so the photo that was shared to harass her was illegal. Do you believe that Facebook bears any responsibility for the role it played in her death, yes or no? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, Congressman, that is a, it's a incredibly sad story. Cool. And I, 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 I think that we certainly have a responsibility to make sure that we're building systems that can uh, fight and remove this kind of um, harmful content. And in the, in the case of um, child exploitation content, um, we've been building systems for a long time that use AI and we have, thousands of people working on being able to identify this content and remove it. And I think our systems are generally um, pretty effective at this. Um, well, and, and I think it's our responsibility to make sure my, that we I, keep improving. My, my time is pretty short, but would you say yes or no then? Sorry, can you repeat that? Well, in, in the question, uh, yes or no then, any responsibility? Congressman, I believe that the responsibility well, okay. of the platform- well, let, me, let me move on because uh, I've got uh, very short on time. Do you believe that Facebook should be uh, held accountable for any role in her death? Yes or no? Congressman, the responsibility that I think platforms should have okay. is to build okay. effective I'm, systems I'm, I'm, I'm to monitor this I'm, content. I'm going to have to take that just not responding to the question. Unfortunately, stories like Amanda Todd's are only becoming more common. While we often talk about how your platforms can be used for good or evil, the evil seems to persevere. Mr. Zuckerberg, you publicly stated that you support thoughtful changes to Section 230 to ensure that tech companies are held accountable for certain actions that happen on their platforms, such as child exploitation. What specific changes do you support in Section 230? Thanks, Congressman. I, I would support two specific changes, especially for large platforms. Um, although I, I, I want to call out that I think for, for smaller platforms, I think um, we need to be careful about about any changes that we make that remove their 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 immunity because that could hurt competition. So let me just call on these for for larger platforms. I think first, platforms should have to uh, issue transparency reports um, that that state the prevalence of content um, across all different categories of harmful content, everything from child exploitation to terrorism to incitement of violence to um, intellectual property violations to Pornography, whatever the, the different harms are, and well, let me also, ask you quick now: where, where are those transparency reports uh, be re, be reported to, and and how often do you think those should be going out? Well, Congressman, as as a model, um, Facebook ha has been doing something to this effect for 
um, every quarter, right, where we where we report on on the prevalence of each category of harmful content and how effective our systems are at identifying that content and removing it in advance. And and I think the the company should be held accountable for having effective systems to do that broadly. The second change that I would propose is um, is is creating accountability for the large platforms to have effective systems in place to moderate and remove clearly illegal content. So. Um, things like sex trafficking or child exploitation or terrorist content. Um, and, and I think it would be reasonable to condition immunity for the larger platforms on having a generally effective um, system in place to moderate clearly illegal types of content. Um, okay, let, me, let me interrupt real quick because I'm running really short on time because I know in your testimony you're talking about that you would you say that platforms should not be held liable if a particular piece of content evades its detection. So uh, again, uh, that's one of the areas when you're talking about the transparency and also the accountability, I'd like to follow up on. Let me I have to go on real quick. Uh, Mr. Chai, uh, yes or no, do you agree with uh, Mr. Zuckerberg's uh, changes to Section 230? There are definitely good proposals around transparency and accountability, which I've seen in various legislative proposals as well. Uh, which I think are important principles, and and we would we would certainly uh, welcome welcome legislative approaches in that area. Okay, uh, Mr. Dorsey, do you agree with uh, Mr. Zuckerberg? Yes or no? On I the changes on two thirty. I think the ideas around transparency are good. I think it's going to be very hard to determine what's a what's a large platform and a small platform, and it may incentivize the wrong things. Okay, okay. gentlemen's time has expired. Well, thank you very much. My time has expired. Now you back. Chair now recognizes Chair Schakowsky, Chair of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Commerce for five minutes. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Zuckerberg, um, immediately after the Capitol insurgency, um, Cheryl Sandberg um, did an interview in which she insisted that the uh, siege was largely planned on smaller platforms um, that, uh, but court filings actually show something quite the uh, quite the opposite. That the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers um, used Facebook to coordinate in real time during the uh, during the siege. And so my question for you is: Will you admit today um, that uh, Facebook groups, in particular? Um, played a role in the uh, in fomenting the uh, extremism that we saw, and that led to the uh, Capitol siege. Uh, Congresswoman, thanks for the, the the question on this. In in the comment that that, that Cheryl made, what what I, I believe that we were trying to say was, um, and 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 what I stand behind, um, is what was widely reported at the time that. Uh, it, after no, January sixth, you know, I'm sorry to to interrupt, as um, many of my colleagues have had to do, because we only have five minutes. But would you say that, and would you ad admit that Facebook played a role? Congresswoman, I think certainly there was content on our services, and um, and and from that perspective, I, I think that there's further work that we need to do to make our our services and, and moderation more effective. Uh, I, hear that. That would... I hear that. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Pichai uh, a, a question. Um, many companies have used Section 230 um, as a shield to escape um, consumer protection laws, and um, I have a bill that would actually not protect uh, companies that uh, that do that. And so, Mr. Pichai, would you agree? That uh, that would be a proper um, use to not allow um, liability protection for those who um, uh, violate consumer protection laws. Uh, Congresswoman, uh, consumer protection laws are very important in many areas, like 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 we comply with COPPA and HIPAA. Uh, I think the right approach is to have uh, legislation in applicable areas and have us. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to interrupt uh, again. Is that a yes? That if the, a law has been broken, a consumer protection law, that it would not, there would not be liability protection under Section 230 for 
you. We rely on the liability protections to actually take strong action in particularly new types of content. When the Christchurch shooting happens within a few minutes, our teams have to make decisions about the content to take down. That certainty is what we rely on. But I agree with you that we should have strong consumer protection laws and be subject to it and have agencies like the FTC uh, have clear oversight uh, over those uh, laws and how we comply with them. Let me just ask a real yes or thank you. A real yes or no quickly. Do you think that when you take money to run advertisements that uh, promote disinformation that you are exempt? from liability yes or no yes or no uh you know, section 230 mr zuckerberg yes or no uh congresswoman i don't i don't know the the legal answer to that but we don't allow misinformation in our ads and any ad that's been fact checked is false we don't allow it to run as an ad okay and mr dorsey uh Again, I'd, I also would need to review the, the legal precedent for it, but um, we would uh, we would not allow that. Okay, and Mr. Pichai. Uh, we are subject to FTC's deceptive ad practices, so there are statutes which apply to us. Uh, we removed over three billion bad ads last year alone. Okay, let me ask um, one more question. Um, do you think that Section Two Thirty should be expanded to trade agreements? that are being made, as happened in uh, the U.S. Uh, trade agreement with Mexico and Canada? Yes or no? Mr. Zuckerberg. Congresswoman, my primary goal would be to help update Section 230 to reflect the, the, uh, the, the kind of modern reality and what we've learned over 25 years. But that said, I do still think that Section 230 plays a foundational role in the development of the internet and uh, okay. the company is going to build. I, I, I so, so I do We're think talking, that we should I'm support it. I'm talking now about trade agreements, Mr. Uh, Pichai. Uh, Congresswoman, I think there's value in it, but if there are uh, evolution of Section 230, that should apply. And so in a flexible way, being able to do that uh, would, be, would be good, I think. Hmm. Mr. Dorsey. I, I don't fully understand the ramifications of what you're suggesting, so that any that. To, to have a liability shield that would be international and ratified in trade agreements. And I think it's a bad idea. Okay, General lady's time has expired. Okay. Thank you. I yield Thank back. You. Chair now recognizes Mrs. Mr. Bill Arrakis, uh, subcommittee on uh, ranking member of the subcommittee on consumer protection and commerce for 5 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Dorsey. You have heard briefly about what I'm hearing from, uh, again, in my district, my opening remarks, you've heard them. The other key part with these stories that we're hearing when we conduct these surveys is how we uh, empower law enforcement. In a hearing last year, we received testimony that since 2016, Twitter has intentionally curtailed sharing threat data with law enforcement fusion centers. Here's the question. You're well aware that on Twitter and Periscope, the traffic has increased from bad actors seeking to groom children for molestation, lure females into sex trafficking, sell illegal drugs, incite violence, and even threaten to murder police officers. Are you willing to reinstate this cooperation, retain evidence, and provide law enforcement the tools to protect our most vulnerable, yes or no? Well, first, child sexual exploitation has no place on our platform, and I don't believe that's true. We work with lo local law enforcement regularly. So you're saying that this is not true? Uh, what I'm telling you. Are you willing to reinstate, reinstate? In other words, it's not, it's not going on now. Reinstate this cooperation with law enforcement to retain evidence and provide law enforcement the tools to protect our most vulnerable. We, we would love to work with you in more detail on what you're seeing, but we work with uh, law enforcement regularly. We have, a, we have a strong partnership. So you're saying that, that this is not true, what I'm telling you? I don't believe so, but like we'd love to understand the specifics. 
Will you commit to, to doing what I'm telling you you're not doing uh, in the future and work with me on this? We'll, we'll commit to continue doing what we are doing. And what is that? You're saying that they're working so in other words, local law enforcement. OK, uh, well, let me go on to the next question, but I'm going to follow up with this to make sure you're doing this. I mean, our ch children's lives are in jeopardy here. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, we have heard you acknowledge mistakes about your products before. There are now uh, media reports of an Instagram for under 13 being launched. My goodness. Between this and YouTube Kids, you, uh, you and Mr. Pachai have obviously identified a business case for targeting this age bracket with uh, content, and I find that very concerning targeting this particular age bracket, 13 and under. Given these free services, how exactly will you be making money or are you trying to monetize our children too and get them addicted early? And will you be allowing your own children to use this site with the default settings? We're talking about the, again, the, the, the site that the, apparently is being launched uh, for children under 13 and under or under 13, actually. Can you please answer that question for me? Congressman, we're uh, early in thinking through uh, how this service would work. There is clearly a, a, a large number of people under the age of 13 who would want to use a service like Instagram. We currently do not allow them to do that. I think what would be, the what would be beneficial? What would be beneficial uh, for, to our children? To launch this kind of service. Well, uh, Congressman, I think helping people stay connected with friends and learn about different content online is broadly positive. There are clearly issues that need to be thought through and worked out, including how parents can control the experience of of kids, especially kids under the age of thirteen. And we we haven't worked through all of that yet, so we haven't uh, kind of formally uh, announced the plans, but. But I, I think that something like this could be quite helpful for Mr. a lot of people. Excuse me. Okay, my, I'll reclaim my time. Mr. Prashad, your company has had failures curating content for kids. What advice would you offer uh, your colleague here? Uh, Congressman, we've invested a lot in a one-of-a-kind product, uh, YouTube Kids. The content there is, uh, you know, we work with trusted content partners. Think Sesame Street. Uh, as an example of the type of channel you would find there, uh, science videos and cartoons, and we take great effort to make sure. Uh, oh, I need to reclaim my time. I have one more last one last question for Mr. Zuckerberg. Do you have concerns with what has appeared on your platform hosted by YouTube? For and and you know with regard to your children, but uh, in general, do you have concerns? Yes Sorry. or no? Congressman, are you asking me about YouTube? Yes, I'm, I'm asking you about YouTube. Um, con Congressman, I, I use YouTube to watch educational videos with my children. Do and yeah. Do you have concerns personally uh, for your children uh, and, and uh, your family personally? Do well, you have concerns? Congressman, my, my children are uh, five and three years old. So when, when I watch content on YouTube with them, I'm doing it and supervising them. So in that context, no, I haven't particularly had concerns, but, um, but I think it's important that if anyone is building a service for kids under the age of 13 to use by themselves, that there are appropriate parental controls. A uh, gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I'm gonna ask all members too, to try to stick to our five minute rule so that uh, we can get out of here before midnight. Uh, chair will now recognize Mr. Pallone, the full committee chair for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Doyle. My questions are of Mr. Zuckerberg and Mr. Pachai, but you know, I just want to say, after listening to the two of your testimony, you definitely give the impression that you don't think that you're actively in any way promoting this misinformation and extremism. And I totally disagree with that. You're not passive bystanders. You're not, you know, nonprofits or religious organizations that 
are trying to do a, a you know good job for humanity. You're making money. And the point we're trying to make today, or at least I am, is that when you spread this information, actual misinformation, extremism, act, actively promote it and amplify it, you do it because you make more money. And so I, you know, I kind of deny the basic premise of what you said. But let me get to the questions. Um, let me ask Mr. Zuckerberg, according to a May 2020 Wall Street Journal report, a Facebook researcher concluded that Facebook's own recommendation tools were tied to a significant rise in membership in extremist Facebook groups in Germany. I wrote to you last month requesting this research and related documents. I trust you'll fully cooperate with the committee's inquiry and provide all requested documents and information. But my question is, and please yes or no, were you aware of this research showing that 64% of the members in the extremist Facebook groups studied joined because of Facebook's own recommendations tool, joined these extremist groups in, uh, in Germany? Were you aware of that, yes or no? Uh, Congressman, this is something that we study because we want to make sure our products yeah, improve. But I'm asking whether you were aware of it. It's a simple question, yes or no. Were you aware of it? That's all I'm asking. Were you aware, aware of this? Aware at, at what time? After after we studied yes, that, that. I just asked if you were aware of it, Mr. Zuckerberg. Yes or no? If not, I'm going to assume that the answer is yes. Okay. Congressman, well, I've, seen, I've seen the study. It, it was about a, a right, content so leading up to the German yes, election. I, and we, we since made that. Let changes me go to, to the, the second platform. question which relates to that. You said yes. Okay. The troubling research I mentioned demonstrates that Facebook was not simply allowing disinformation and extremism to spread. It actively amplified it and spread it. This is my point. Nonetheless, Facebook didn't permanently stop recommending political and civil groups to the United States until after the January 6th insurrection, years after it was made aware of this research. The fact that Facebook's own recommendation system helped populate extremist groups compels us to reevaluate platforms liabilities. Now, back to that Wall Street Journal article. Facebook's chief product officer, Chris Cox, championed an internal effort to address division on Facebook and proposed a plan that would have reduced the spread of content by hyperactive users on the far left and far right. The article alleges, Mr. Zuckerberg, that you personally reviewed this proposal and approved it, but only after its effectiveness was, was decreased to 80%. Is that true? Yes or no, please. Congressman, we've made we've made a lot of of, of measures that did that aim to fight this content, it? including. Did you sorry, approve no. it after its effectiveness was decreased to eighty percent? Yes or no? Congressman, I I can't speak to that specific example, but we've put in place a lot of different did measures, and in the aggregate, I think that they're effective, including. You did. Including, did you review the proposal and approve it? Congressman, we do a lot of work in this area, and I review a lot of proposals, and we've moved forward on a lot of steps. It's not a difficult question. I'm just asking if you reviewed this internal proposal and you approved it, you and you won't even answer that. I, I don't. It's so easy to answer that question. It's very specific. All right, you won't answer, right? Yes or no? Congressman, that's not what I said. I, I said I did review that, you know, in addition to many other proposals and things that we've taken action on, you, including you shutting off it? recommendations for you civic and political it, groups. Did you approve it with the 80% decrease in effectiveness? Congressman, I, I don't remember that specifically, but okay. we've taken a number of different Mr. steps on, on, on Let this. Let me go to Mr. Pachai. Mr. Pachai, according to the New York Times, YouTube's recommendation algorithm is responsible for more than 70% 70 70 of the time users spend on YouTube. In fact, a former design ethicist at Google was quoted as saying, if I'm YouTube and I want you to watch more, I'm always going to steer you towards crazy town. Mr. Pichai, is, is YouTube's recommendation algorithm designed to encourage users to stay on the site? Yes or no? Is it designed to encourage users to stay on the site? Yes or no? Uh Content responsibility is her number one goal, so that trumps everything. So and so I'm only asking, very simple, whether your rec re YouTube's recommendation algorithm is designed to encourage users to stay on the site. Simple question, yes or no? Uh, that's not the sole goal, Congressman. That but it definitely is one of the goals. So the answer is yes. Okay. So the bottom line is simply put, your company's bottom line compels you to amplify extremist and dangerous content. You're not bystanders. And what happens on online doesn't stay online. It has real world consequences. That's why Congress has to act because you're you're not bystanders. You're encouraging this stuff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. Rogers, the full committee ranking member, for five minutes. We've tragically lost a number of young people to suicide in my community. 
in a three year period from 2013 to 2016, the suicide rate more than doubled in Spokane County. In the last six months, uh, one high school lost three teens. Right now, suicide is the second leading cause of death in the entire state of Washington for teens 15 to 19 years old. As I mentioned, it's led to many painful conversations, trying to find some healing for broken families and communities. And together we've been asking, what's left our kids with a deep sense of brokenness? Why do children, including kids we've lost in middle school, feel so empty at such a young, vulnerable age? Well, some studies are confirming what parents in my community already know. Too much time on screens and social media is leading to loneliness and despair. And it seems to be an accepted truth in the tech industry. Because what we're hearing today, making money is more important. Bill Gates put a, put a cap on screen time for his daughter. Steve Jobs once said in a quote, we limit how much technology our kids use at home. Mr. Zuckerberg, you've also said that your kids or you don't want your kids sitting in front of screens passively consuming content. So Mr. Zuckerberg, yes or no, do you agree too much time in front of screens passively consuming content is harmful to children's mental health? Congresswoman, the research that I've seen on this suggests that if people are using computers and, and could, social could you apps. Answer yes or no? I'm there, sorry, there's, could you use yes or no? I, I, I don't think that the research is conclusive on that, but I, I, I can summarize what I've learned if that's helpful. Um, I will, I'll follow up at a later time um, because I, I do know that Facebook has acknowledged that passive consumption on your platform is leading to people feeling worse. And you've said that going from video to video is not positive, yet Facebook yeah. is designed to keep people scrolling Insta Instagram is designed to get users to go from video to video. So I would like to ask you if you've, if you've said earlier that you don't want kids sitting in front of the screens passively consuming content and your products are designed to increase screen time, do you currently have any limitations on your own kids' use of your products or, or how, the, how do you think that will change as they get older? Sure, Congresswoman. My, my daughters are five and three, and they don't use our products. Um, actually, that's that's not exactly true. My eldest daughter, Max, I let her use Messenger Kids sometimes to message her cousins. But overall, um, the the research that we've seen is that using social apps to to connect with other people can have positive mental health benefits and well being benefits, like helping people feel more connected and, and less lonely. Passively consuming content doesn't have those positive benefits to well-being, but isn't necessarily negative. It just isn't as positive as connecting. And the way we design our algorithms is to encourage meaningful social interactions. So it's a common misconception that our teams are, are, are gold or, or even have goals of trying to increase the amount of time that people spend. The newsfeed team at Facebook Thank and you. the Instagram team Thank you. are- um, Mr. Zuckerberg, I do have a couple more questions. So do you agree that your business model and the design of your products is to get as many people on the platform as possible and to keep them there for as long as possible? If you could answer yes or no, that'd be great. Uh, Congresswoman, from a mission perspective, we wanna serve everyone, but our goal is not, uh, we don't, I don't give our, our newsfeed team, or our Instagram team goals around um, increasing the amount of time that people spend. I believe that if we build a useful product, just, which- Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, we all have limited time. Um, think the business model suggests that it is true. Um, it was mentioned earlier that you're studying extremism. I'd like to ask yes or no of all of you, uh, beginning with Mr. Zuckerberg, has Facebook conducted any internal research as to the effect your products are having on the mental health of our children? Congresswoman, I know that this is something that we that we try to study. Can you and say understand. yes or no? I'm sorry. Um, I, I believe the answer is yes. Okay. Mr. Dorsey has Twitter. I don't believe so, but we'll follow up with you. Okay. Mr. Pichai, has Google conducted any research on the effect your products are having on the mental health of children? Well, we consult widely with uh, expert third parties uh, on this area, including SAMHSA and other mental health organizations, and uh, invest a lot of time and effort in this area. Okay. I would like to see that 
It, it sounds like you've, you've studied extremism. Let's get focused on our, our children. Gentlemen, gentle ladies, time has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Rush for five minutes. Bobby, you need to unmute. There you go. No, nope, you're still muted. Morning. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. We all agree that social media sites should not be tools for stoking racial division or exacerbating racial injustices. However, there is a growing body of research that demonstrates the disproportionate effects of disinformation and white supremacist extremism on women and people of color, especially black people. We have seen and continue to see that too often social media sites put their earnings before equality. Simply stated, you, your corporations carelessly put profits over people. Misinformation, outlandish com conspiracy theories, and incendiary, incendiary content targeting minorities remains prevalent. And social media companies, your companies, are profiting from hate and racism on these platforms, platforms by harvesting data and generating advertising revenue from such content. There is only one comparison that remotely approaches the amorous and moral decrepitancy of your companies, and that, that is the slave chocolate buried of our nation's shameful and inhumane and, 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 and most difficult dark days in the past. This, this is the very reason why I asked Mr. Dorsey. I remember you at our 2018 hearing to commit to commissioning an independent third party civil rights audit on Twitter. This request and the hearing was followed up with my joint letter from Chairman Pallone and myself confirming that commitment. It is three years later, and I'm still waiting, Mr. Dorsey, for the results of that audit. Where is that audit, Mr. Dorsey? Thank you. We, um, we, we've taken another approach, which is to work with civil rights orgs on a regular basis. We have regular conversations with civil rights orgs multiple times a year. Where is, where is the audit that members of Congress, including the chairman of the committee, where is the audit that we ask you and you agree to forward? We, we don't have it. We, we thought a different approach. I, I, have not, I don't have it either. And I, I felt that you were being very, very disingenuous as a matter of fact, I thought that you had intentionally lied to the committee, and you should be condemned for that. And I can't wait until we can we come up with legislation that will deal with you and your cohorts in a very, very effective way. This was the nothing but an empty promise that you made. You haven't taken this issue seriously, and Mr. Dorsey, I as a Black man in America, my experiences are different from your experiences. These, this audit is very, very important to me and to those who are similarly situated just as I am. Facebook, to their credit, has completed an audit. And there's no reason. No, simply no reason on the sun that a corporation as large as yours should not have completed that audit. Mr. Dorsey, 
has Twitter evaluated the disparate impact from COVID-19 vaccination misinformation that, that, that uh, uh, affect on the African-American community? And secondly, has the company even attempted to identify methods to combat COVID-19 misinformation targeted at African-Americans and amplify relief, reliable, trustworthy, trustworthy vaccine information? Yes. yes, on both. And we review with civil rights orgs directly on a regular basis. That is the solution we chose. Gentlemen's time has expired. A chair now recognizes Mr. Upton for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, as I listen to this hearing, uh, like it or not, it sounds like everybody on both sides of the aisle uh, is not very happy. Um, I think we all believe that there is a lot of responsibility that should be shared for some of the issues that we've raised today uh, by the three of you. And I would just offer uh, or speculate, I guess you could say, that we're going to see some changes um, in Section uh, 230. Uh, you know, the, the president, uh, former President Trump, uh, vetoed a pretty big bill, the defense bill, uh, earlier uh, last year. Uh, over this very issue uh, because he wanted the total repeal and he didn't get it. Uh, but I know that the Senate now has got some legislation that's pending that's looking at a couple reforms. And um, my sense is that we may see something here in the near future as well. I serve on as one of only two House members on the Commission on Combating Synthetic Opioid uh, Trafficking. It's a multi-federal agency. Uh, uh, it's co-chaired by David Trone in, in the House and uh, Tom Cotton uh, in the Senate. And there is a lot of concern that we all have, not only as parents, but as community leaders uh, across the country uh, on opioids and the, the uh, inability to remove illegal offers of opioids, steroids, even fake uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, very troubling, I think, as we see some of these platforms push such content to a user in, in real search of it. So I guess my first question is to you, Mr. Zuckerberg, the sale of illegal drugs on your platform does violate your policy, yet it does remain a problem on your platforms. Can you explain the resources that you currently have devoted to addressing the issue and whether or not you plan to devote more and I, this is an issue that I intend to raise with the, with the, the commission as we look forward to this in, in the next uh, number of months. Thanks, Congressman. Uh, I think this is an important area and, and, and a good question. We have more than a thousand engineers who work on um, our, our what we call integrity systems that basically are AI systems that try to help find um, content that violates our policies. You're right that that content does violate our policies. And we also have more than 35,000 uh, people who work in content review um, who uh, basically are, are either responding to flags that they get from the community or, um, or, or checking things that our AI systems flag for them but aren't sure about. Um, and this is an area, you know, when we're talking about reforming Section 230, where I think it would be reasonable to expect that um, large platforms especially build effective systems to be able to combat and fight um, this kind of clearly illegal content. I think that there will be a lot of ongoing debate about how to handle content which uh, people find distasteful or maybe harmful but is legal. But in this case, when the content is illegal, I, I think it is pretty reasonable to expect that large platforms build effective systems um, for moderating this. So we saw earlier this week, of course, we don't know all the facts on this uh, terrible shooting in, in Boulder, Colorado. And it appears, at least some of the initial reports, that the alleged shooter uh, was in fact bullied. And I think I saw some press reports that it, it, some of it had happened uh, online as well. What, what process do you have to, that it would allow parents or families to, to be able to uh, pursue uh, anti-bullying uh, efforts uh, that might be on your platform? 
Thanks, Congressman. I think bullying is is a really important case to consider for Section 230 because, first of all, it's horrible and we need to fight it and we have policies that are against it. But it also is often the case that um, that bullying content is not clearly illegal. So when we talk about needing the ability under something like Section 230 to be able to moderate content, which is not um, not only clearly illegal content but broader, one of the primary examples that we that we have in mind is. Uh, making sure that we can stop people from bullying children. And you now here we work with with a number of, of advocacy groups. We work with law enforcement to help fight this. Um, this is is a huge effort and in, 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 in part of what we do, and I think it's extremely important. And uh, other than uh, taking the approach that you don't want to see any changes to 230, uh, what suggestions might you have for us as we examine this issue? Sorry, Congressman, I'm not saying that I don't think that there should be changes. I'm, I'm saying that I think 230 still broadly is important, so I wouldn't repeal the whole thing. But the three changes that I've basically suggested are one is around transparency, that large platforms should have to um, report on a, on, a, on a regular cadence um, for each category of harmful content, how much of that harmful content they're finding and how effective their systems are at dealing with it. The second thing I think that we should do is hold uh, large platforms to a standard where they should have effective systems for handling clearly illegal content like opioids um, or, or child exploitation or things like that. And the third thing that I think is an important principle is that these uh, policies really do need to apply more to large platforms. And I think we need to find a way to exempt small platforms so that way you know, when I was getting started with Facebook, if, if we'd gotten hit with a lot of lawsuits um, around content, it might have been prohibitive for me to get started. And, and I think none of us here want to see the next uh, set of platforms from being stopped uh, from, from, from kind of being able to get started and grow. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Chair Thank now you. recognizes Ms. Eshoo. Am I unmuted? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning. Uh, well, it's still, uh, we're Californian, so it's good morning for us. Uh, I want to start by uh, saying that content moderation, like removing uh, posts or banning accounts, is about treating symptoms. And I think that we need to treat symptoms, uh, but I also think that we need to address two underlying diseases. The first is that your products amplify extremism. The second is that your business models of targeted ads enable misinformation to thrive because you chase user engagement at great cost to our society. So to Mr. Pichai, uh, uh, last month, the Anti-Defamation League found that YouTube amplifies extremism. Scores of journalists and researchers uh, agree. And here's what they say happens. A user watching an extremist video uh, is often recommended more such videos, slowly radicalizing the user. YouTube is not doing enough to address recommendations, and it's why Representative uh, Malinkowski and myself introduced um, uh, the Protecting Americans uh, from Dangerous Algorithms Act to narrowly amend Section 230 so courts can examine the role of algorithmic amplification that leads to violence. And it's also why uh, I, along with 40 of my House colleagues, wrote to each of you about this issue. And Mr. Chairman, I ask uh, that those letters be placed into the record. So my question to you, um, Mr. Pichai, is are you willing to overhaul uh, YouTube's core recommendation engine to correct this issue? Yes or no? Uh, Congresswoman, we have overhauled our recommendation systems and uh, I know you've engaged on these issues before, uh, pretty substantially in pretty much any area but there, uh, uh, Mr. Pichai, yes or no, because we still have a huge problem. And I, I outlined what the, are, are you saying that the Anti-Defamation League doesn't know what they're talking about? Um, uh, we, you we, know, uh, 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 all these journalists and researchers, uh, there is a lot more to address. And that's why I'm asking you if you're willing to overhaul YouTube's core recommendation uh, engine to correct this. It's serious, it's dangerous. Uh, what more can I say about it? Yes or no? Congresswoman, if I may explain, we have- No, I don't have time to explain. So uh, 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 we, you know, let me just say this to uh, 
uh, uh, to the witnesses. We don't do filibuster in the House. That's something that's done in the Senate. So uh, a filibuster doesn't work with us. Uh, to Mr. Zuckerberg, your algorithms use unseemly amounts of data to keep users on your platform because that leads to more ad revenue. Now, businesses are in business to make money. We all understand that. But your model has a cost to society. The most engaging posts are often those that induce fear, anxiety, anger, and that includes deadly, deadly misinformation. The Center for Countering uh, Digital Hate found that the explore and suggested post parts of Instagram are littered with COVID misinformation election disinformation and QAnon posts. So this is dangerous and it's why Representative Shikowsky and I are uh, uh, doing a bill that is going to ban this business model of surveillance advertising. So are you willing to redesign your products to eliminate your focus on addicting users to your platforms at all costs, yes or no? Congresswoman, as I said before, the teams that design our algorithms. You know what, I new think. I, I, let me just say this, and it's. I think it's irritating all of us, and that is that no one seems to know the word yes or the word no. Which one is it? If you don't want to answer, just say I don't want to answer. So uh, yes or no. Congresswoman, these are nuanced issues. And okay, we're, so we're... I'm going to say uh, that's a no. Uh, to Mr. Dorsey, as the chairwoman of the Health Subcommittee, uh, I think that you need to eliminate all COVID uh, misinformation and not label or reduce its spread, but remove it. Uh, I, I looked at um, uh, a tweet this morning, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. Uh, links the death of baseball legend Hank Aaron to the COVID vaccine, even though fact checkers debunked the story. The tweet has 9,000 retweets. Um, will you take this down and why haven't you? And, uh, and also why haven't you banned uh, the 12 accounts that are spewing it's deadly COVID misinformation? This could cost lives. No, no, we won't take it down because it didn't violate our policy. So we have a clear policy in what place. What kind of policy is that? Is it a policy for misinformation? No. General lady's time has expired. Mm. Chair recognizes Mr. Scalise. Is Mr. Scalise here? Thank you. Uh, there yeah, we go, thank Steve. you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, want to thank you for having this here. I want to thank our three witnesses uh, for coming as well. Clearly, uh, you're seeing a lot of concern being expressed by members on both sides, both Republican and Democrat, about the way that your social media platforms are run, and especially as it relates to the, the fairness and, and equal treatment of people. I, I know I've had a lot of concerns, uh, shared it with some of you individually over the last few years, about whether it's algorithms that seem to be designed uh, sometimes to have an anti-bias against conservatives. Uh, but look, we all agree that uh, whether it's illegal activity, bullying, those things ought not be uh, permeated through social media. But there's a big difference uh, between uh, stopping bullying and, and violent type of social media posts versus actual censorship of political views that you disagree with. And, and I think I, I wanna ask my first question to Mr. Dorsey because there have been a lot of concerns expressed recently about that unequal treatment. And, and I'll just start with the New York Post article. I think a lot of people have seen this. This article was censored uh, by Twitter when it was originally sent out. This is the New York Post, uh, which is a newspaper that goes back to 1801, founded by Alexander Hamilton. And for weeks, this very credibly sourced article right before an election uh, about Hunter Biden was, was banned by Twitter. And then when you contrast that, you have this Washington Post article uh, that was designed to misportray a conversation between President Trump and the Georgia Secretary of State. Since been parts of this have, have been debunked, and yet this, this article can still be tweeted out. Uh, I want to ask Mr. Dorsey, uh, first of all, do you recognize that there is this real concern that, that there's an anti-conservative bias on Twitter's behalf? And, and would you recognize that 
uh, th this has to stop if, if this is going to be uh, Twitter is going to be viewed by both sides as, as a place where everybody's going to get a fair treatment. Yeah, we we made a total mistake with the New York Post. We we corrected that within 24 hours. It was not it was not to do with the content. It was to do with a hacked materials policy. We had an incorrect interpretation. Um, we we don't write policy according to any particular political leaning. If we find any of it, we write it out. But so we, regarding we make, the Washington we make Post, mistakes. we will make mistakes, and our our goal is to correct them as quickly as possible. And in that case, we did. Mm -hmm. And I, and I appreciate you recognizing that was a mistake. However, the, the New York Post entire Twitter account was blocked for about two weeks where they couldn't send anything out, not just that article. And uh, to censor, you know, we've got a First Amendment too. It just seems like to censor uh, a newspaper that's as highly respected as the New York Post. Again, 1801 founded by Alexander Hamilton uh, for their entire account to be blocked uh, for two weeks by a mistake. Uh, seems like a really big mistake. Was anyone held accountable uh, in, in your censoring department uh, for that mistake? Well, we don't have a censoring department, um, but I, I agree. Um, like it, well, who it, made the decision then to block their account for two weeks? We, we didn't block their account for two weeks. We required them to delete the tweet and then they could tweet it again. They didn't take that action, so we corrected it for them. That was that Even was, though the tweet was accurate. I mean, are you, are you now, look, the, you've seen the conversations on both sides about Section 230, uh, and, and there's going to be more discussion about it, but uh, you're acting as a, a publisher. If you're telling a, a newspaper that they've got to delete something in order for them to be able to participate in your account, I mean, don't you recognize that that you're no longer hosting a town square? You're acting as a publisher when you do that. It, it was it was literally just a process error. Um, this this was not against them in any particular way. We require if we remove a violation, uh, we require people to correct it. We change that based on um, they're not wanting to delete that tweet, which I completely agree with. I see it, but it is it is something we learn. Like we learn. Okay, well, let me go to the New York. Now let me go to the Washington Post article because this article can still be tweeted. I don't know if it was ever taken down. It contains false information. Even the Washington Post acknowledges that it contains false information. Yet their tweets today on your service that still mischaracterize it in a way where even the Washington Post admitted it's wrong, yet those mischaracterizations can still be retweeted. Will you address that and start taking those down to reflect what even the Washington Post themselves has admitted as, as, as false information? Our, our misleading information policies are focused on manipulated media, public health, and civic integrity. That's it. We, we don't have a job. Well, I, I would hope that you would go and take that down. And look, I know you said in your opening statement, Mr. Dorsey, that Twitter is running a business and you said, quote, a business wants to grow its customer, the, the customers it serves. Just recognize if you become viewed and uh, continue to become viewed as an anti-conservatively biased platform, there will be other people that step up to compete and ultimately take millions of people on Twitter. I would hope you recognize hey. that. And, and I would yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Gentlemen's Chairman. time has expired. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Butterfield for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zuckerberg, last year, in response to the police killing of George Floyd, you wrote a post on your Facebook page that denounced racial bias. It proclaimed Black Lives Matter. You also announced that the company would donate $10 million to racial justice organizations. And Mr. Dorsey, Twitter changed its official bio to a Black Lives Matter tribute, and you pledged $3 million to an anti-racism organization started by Colin Kaepernick. And Mr. Puchai, you, your company held a company-wide moment of silence to honor George Floyd, and you announced $12 million in grants to racial justice organizations. The CEO of Google subsidiary YouTube wrote in a blog post, quote, we believe Black Lives Matter and we all need to do more to dismantle systemic racism, end of quote. YouTube also announced it would start a $100 million fund for Black creators. Now, all of this sounds nice, but these pronouncements, gentlemen, these pronouncements and money donations do not address the way your companies own products. Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube have been successfully weaponized by racists and are being used to undermine social justice movements, to suppress voting in communities of color, and spread racist content and lies. And so, gentlemen, in my view, in my view, your companies have contributed to the spread of race based extremism and voter suppression. 
As the New York Times noted last year, it's as if the heads of McDonald's, Burger King, and Taco Bell all got together to fight obesity by donating to a vegan food co-op rather than lowering their calories, end of quote. Gentlemen, you could have made meaningful changes within your organizations to address the racial biases built into your products and donated to these organizations. But instead, we are left with platitudes and another round of passing the buck. America is watching you today. This is a moment that begins a transformation of the way you do business, and you must understand that. Perhaps a lack of diversity within your organizations has contributed to these failures. The Congressional Black Caucuses Tech 2025 initiative has been working for years to increase diversity and equity in tech companies at all levels, and you know that because we have visited with you in California. We founded this initiative in 2015 with the hope that by now, the tech workforce would reflect the diversity of our country. Here we are, 2021. I acknowledge that you've made some modest advancements, but not enough. There must be meaningful representation in your companies to design your products and services in ways that work for all Americans. And that requires public accountability. History has shown that you have talked the talk, but have failed to walk the walk. It appears now that Congress will have to compel you, compel you, perhaps with penalties, to make meaningful changes. And I'm going to try the yes or no answer, and hopefully I will have better results than my colleagues. Mr. Zuckerberg, I'll start with you, and please be brief, yes or no. Would you oppose legislation that would require technology companies to publicly report on workforce diversity at all levels? Congressman, I don't think so, but I need to understand it in more detail. Well, we have talked about that, and I hope that if we introduce this legislation, you will not oppose it. What about you, Mr. Dorsey? Would you oppose a law that made workforce diversity reporting a requirement? No, I wouldn't oppose it. Um, it, it does come with some complications in that we don't always have all the demographic data for our employees. Well, thank you for that. And we talked with you in your office some years ago, and you made a commitment to work with us, but we need more. Uh, what about you, Mr. Pachai? Are you willing to, to support? Well, would you be willing to commit to, a, to a, would you oppose a law that made workforce diversity reporting a requirement? Would you oppose it? Congressman, we were the first company to publish transparency reports. We publish it annually, and uh, so happy to share that with you and take any feedback. And But we do today provide in the U.S. Uh, detailed uh, demographic information on our workforce, and we are committed to doing better. Well, gentlemen, for the last six years, the Congressional Black Caucus has said to you over and over again, we need greater diversity uh, among your workforce from the top to the bottom, and we need for you to publish the data so the world can see it. That's the only way we're going to deal with diversity and equity. Thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman. I heard you at the beginning of the committee uh, gavel, and I yield back the 10 seconds that I have. Gentleman deserves a uh, commendation for doing that, and I hope uh, others follow his example. Uh, Chair now recognizes Mr. Guthrie for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the witnesses for being here. And, you know, big tech, big tech decisions have real impact on people, and that's why I ask my constituents using your platforms to share their experiences on your platforms with me as their representative, and I'm here to advocate on their behalf. I received 450 responses, and one major thing that I heard from my constituents was the experience they've had with sites taking down religious content, which is important because as a lot of religious organizations are now streaming their services due to COVID. I did have one instance where a constituent wrote to me, quote, and this is what she posted, I am thankful God's grace is new every morning, and then Facebook took it down, and then my constituent said she got a notice from Facebook that it violated their policies around hate. And, and so I just want to discuss about this. I could ask you yes or no questions, Mr. Zuckerberg, on that. And and but I I just want to talk about it a little bit. One, it just seems I know that we we don't want extreme language on the internet. I'm I'm with you on that. And you can't watch everything. And so you use algorithms to find that. So algorithms will flag things, some that are clearly obvious and some that you would say probably shouldn't have been flagged. Um, but it, it seems to me that it, it seems to be biased in that direction. And so instead of just giving you yes or no question, I want to read that quote again. And, and I sort of know a little bit about math, not a lot, but a little bit. 
about within that quote, what in there uh, would get tripped up and would this quote get tripped up and put into the flag category? And as it says, I am thankful God's grace is new every morning. And so I guess the question is what word or thought do you think would trip uh, an algorithm for that, that quote, Mr. Zuckerberg? Congressman, it's it is not clear to me why that post would be would be a problem. Um, I I would need to look into it in in, in more detail. Um, you know, sometimes the systems look at patterns of of posting. So if someone is posting a lot, then then maybe our system thinks it's spam. But I would need to look into it in more detail. Overall, you know, I mean, the the reality is is that any system is going to make mistakes. There's going to be content that we take down that we should have left up. And there's going to be content that we miss that we should have taken down that we um, that we didn't catch or, or that the systems made a mistake on. And at scale, unfortunately, um, you know, those mistakes can be a large number, even if it's a very small percent. But I think that that's why when we're talking about things like Section 230 uh, reform, I think it is reasonable to expect large companies to have um, effective moderation systems but not reasonable to expect that there are never any errors. Uh, but, but I think that transparency can help hold the companies accountable um, as to what accuracy and, and effectiveness they're, they're, they're achieving. Okay, they, well, to your spam comment, I think they did receive a, a, a notification that was for the hate policy. So, and, and I understand there's gonna be gray areas, whatever, but it, that, that, that quote, I don't see where the gray areas, how it could get caught up in that, but I want I to move agree. on. Thanks for your answer with that. I, I want to move on. So, Mr. Dorsey, uh, I want to talk about the RFK Jr. I didn't see that quote, but you said that didn't violate your policy. And, and, and just in the context of that, I know CDC just recently updated its school guidance uh, to make clear science says you can be three feet away and still be safe in schools. The issue, things are changing every day because we're learning more and more about this virus. So, how do you, how did the RFK come in not violate your policy? and uh, RFK Jr. And how did uh, we have a RFK3 that we all, JFK, JPK3, I guess we all like and as a former colleague, but RFK Jr. And, and uh, your the policy towards that, and, and then how do you keep up with what's changing so quickly, Mr. Dorsey? Yeah, we, we, can, uh, we can follow up with you on the exact reasoning, um, but I the, we have to recognize that our policies evolve constantly and they have to evolve constantly. So. Uh, as has been said earlier in this uh, in this testimony, we we uh, we observe what's happening as a result of our policy. We try to understand the ramifications and we uh, we improve it. Um, and it's a constant cycle. We're always looking to improve our policies and our enforcement. So, Mr. Zuckerberg, Mr. Pichai, just on all the continuously evolving information on COVID, uh, because we're learning more and more about it. And how do you keep up? Well, only about thirty seconds. So, if you could quick answers for each of you, if you can. Mr. Pratai, maybe since you haven't talked, asked, asked to answer the yeah. question. Uh, on on COVID, uh, we've been really taking guidance from CDC and other health experts, proactively removing information. One thing we get to do in YouTube is to recommend higher quality content. We have shown over 400 billion information panels on COVID alone last year, uh, including a lot from CDC and other health organizations. Okay, thank you. And I'll yield back four seconds, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Guthrie. Uh, chair now recognizes uh, Ms. Matsui for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing today. Today, we have another opportunity to hear from the leaders of Facebook, Twitter, and Google. And what has become a concerning pattern, the members of this committee are here to demand answers to questions about social media's role in escalating misinformation, extremism, and violence. Last week, I testified at a House Judiciary Committee hearing about the rise in discrimination and violence against Asian Americans. Horrifically, that hearing came on the heels of a violent attack in Atlanta that left eight people, six of whom were Asian women, dead. The issues we are discussing here are not abstract. They have real world consequences and implications that are too often measured in human lives. I'm worried, as are many watching this hearing that the companies before us today are not doing enough to prevent the spread of hate, especially when it's targeted against minority communities. Clearly, the current approach is not working, and I believe Congress must revisit Section 230. A recent study from the University of San Francisco examined nearly 700,000 tweets in the week before and after President Trump tweeted the phrase Chinese virus. 
The results show two alarming trends. There was a significantly greater increase in hate speech the week after the president's tweet, and that half of the tweets using the hashtag China virus showed an anti Asian sentiment compared to just one fifth of the tweets using the hashtag COVID 19. This empirical evidence backs up what the World Health Organization already knew in 2015, saying disease names really do matter. We've seen certain disease names provoke a backlash against members of particularly religious or ethnic communities. Despite this, Facebook and Twitter are still allowing hashtags like China virus, Kung flu, and Wuhan virus to spread. Mr. Zuckerberg and Mr. Dorsey, given the clear association between this type of language and racism and violence, why do you still allow these hashtags on your platforms? Any? Anyone answer that or is that not answerable? I think we're waiting for you to call on one of us. Um, we, we do have policies against uh, hateful conduct um, and that includes the trends. So when we see associated with uh, any hateful conduct, we will take action on it. it. It's useful to remember that a lot of these hashtags so do contain counter speech and people on the other side of it do own them and and show um, why this is so terrible and, and why it, it needs to stop. Well, can I just take my time back? The fact of the matter is, is I think you know how to develop algorithms to kind of get rid of this and examine this further. Um, Mr. Zuckerberg, any comment here? Thanks, Congresswoman. The the, the rise in anti-Asian hate is a, is a really big issue and, and something that, that I, I, I do think that um, we need to be proactive about. The um, I, mean, I agree with the, the comments that, that Jack made on this. Um, you know, any on, on Facebook, any of, of that context, if it's if it's combined with something that's clearly hateful, um, we, we will take that down. It violates the hate speech policy. Um, but one of the nuances that, that Jack highlighted that we certainly see as well um, in, in enforcing hate speech policies is that we need to be clear about when someone is saying something because they're using it in a hateful way versus when they're denouncing it. And this is one of the things that, that has made it uh, more difficult to, well, to, uh, to operationalize this at scale. An opportunity to really look at hate speech and what it really means particularly in this day and age when we have many instances of these things happening. You know, hate speech on social media can be baked in. And unfortunately, this also is a trend that maybe happened years and years ago, which it might have just been a, a latent situation. But with social media, it travels all around the world and it hurts a lot of people. And my feeling, and I believe a lot of other people's feeling, is, is that we really have to look at how we define hate speech. And, you know, you all are very brilliant people and you hire brilliant people. I would think that there is a way for you to examine this further and take it one step lower to see if it is something that is legitimate or not. And I really feel that this is a time, especially now when we're examining platforms and what you can do and should do. And as we're examining here in this committee, and as we write legislation, we really want to have the entire multitude of what can and can't be done. So with that, um, Mr. Chairman, I only have 12, 11 seconds left and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. General Lady yields back. Uh, let's see. The chair now recognizes Mr. Kinzinger for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you all for being here. Um, you know, in all this conversation, it's it's good to have. I think we also have to recognize that we need to. We're lucky to have all these companies located in the United States. You know, when we talked about the issues and concerns, for instance, with TikTok, uh, we can see that a, a lot of these companies could easily leave here and go elsewhere, and then we would have far less oversight. Um, I think the crackdown uh, on January sixth was correct. I think we need to be careful to not use that as a way to deflect from, you know, what led to January 6th, you know, pushing of this narrative of stop the steal. I think there are folks that are concerned, though, uh, that we also need to make sure that those same uh, levels of protection uh, exist when you talk about like Iran, for instance, and, and what the leaders there tweet. But let me go into specific questions. So over the years, we've obviously seen the rise of disinformation. It's not new. I remember getting disinformation in the 90s. Uh, but we've seen it spread on these platforms. So we live in a digital world where many people get their news and entertainment from the internet. 
from articles and posts that are often based off algorithms that can cater to what people see and read. So with those constant news feeds that simply reinforce people's beliefs or worse, that they can promote disgraceful and utterly ridiculous conspiracy theories from groups like QAnon, extremism and violence have grown exponentially as a result. And we know it's true specifically after January 6th. So Mr. Zuckerberg, let me ask you, according to Haney Fareed at Berkeley, numerous external studies and some of your own internal studies have revealed that your algorithms are actively promoting divisive, hateful, and conspiratorial content because it engages users to spend more time. Do you think those studies are wrong? And if, if not, what are you guys doing to uh, reverse course on that? Sure. Thank you, Congressman. This is a, an, an important set of topics. In terms of groups, um, we stopped recommending all civic and political groups, even though I think a lot of the civic and political groups are healthy, um, because we, we were seeing that that um, was one vector that that there, there might be um, polarization or, or, or extremism and groups might start off with one um, you know, set of views, but but migrate to, to another place. So um, so we removed that completely and we did it first as a in, a, in an exceptional measure during the election. And since the election, we've announced that we're going to um, extend that policy indefinitely. Um, for the rest of the content in newsfeed and on Instagram, the, the, the main thing that I'd say is I do think that there's quite a bit of misperception about how our algorithms work and what we optimize for. Um, I've heard a lot of people say that you know, we're optimizing for keeping people on the service. The way that we view this is that we are trying to help people um, have meaningful social interactions. People come to social networks to be able to connect with people. If we deliver that value, then it will be natural that people use our services more, but that's very different from setting up algorithms in order to just kind of uh, try to tweak and, and, and optimize and get people to spend every last minute on our service, which is not how we, how we design the, 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 the company or the services. Thanks, I don't mean to interrupt you, just, I do have another question. Mr. Chairman, I, I wanna ask unanimous consent to insert to the record an article from the Wall Street Journal uh, titled Facebook Executive Shutdown Efforts to Make the Site Less Divisive. Um, let me move on to the next one. For years, I've called for increased consumer protection from companies on fake accounts and bad actors who use them to exploit others. This issue affected me personally. In 2015, a woman from India spent all of her money on a flight to come see me because she claimed to have developed a relationship with me over Facebook. In 2019, I, I sent you, Mr. Zuckerberg, a letter highlighting the issue and your team provided a relatively inadequate response. Since then, I've introduced this two pieces of legislation, Social Media Accountability and Account Verification Act and the Social Media Fraud Mitigation Act, both of which aim to curb uh, this activity. So Mr. Zuckerberg, the last time you came before us, you stated that Facebook has a responsibility to protect its users. Do you feel that your company is living up to that and further uh, what have you done to uh, remove those fake accounts? Thanks. So fake accounts are one of the bigger integrity issues that we face. I think in the first half of, um, of or, well, in the, in the last half of, of last year, I think we took down more than a billion fake accounts, um, just to give you a volume, a sense of the volume, although most of those are, our systems are able to identify within um, seconds or minutes of them signing up because the accounts just don't behave in a way that a normal person would in using the service. But this is certainly one of the highest priority issues we have. We see a large prevalence of it. Our systems, I think at this point, are, are pretty effective in fighting it, but they're not perfect and there are still a few percent that get through. And, um, and it's a big issue and one that we'll continue working on. Thank you. Thank I'd you. love to ask the rest of the others a question, but I don't have time. So I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your attention. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Ms. Castor for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, since you were last here in front of the committee, uh, the illegal activity, the incessant surveillance of unwitting Americans, the rampant misinformation on your platforms have gotten worse. Uh, part of the reason for this toxic stew is that you employ manipulative methods to keep people cemented to the platform, uh, often amplifying discord, uh, and it boosts your bottom line. Uh, you enjoy an outdated liability shield that incentivizes you to look the other way or take half measures uh, while you make billions at the expense of our kids, our health, the truth, and now we've seen the very foundation of our democracy. Um, I, I've been working for over a year with advocates and other members on an update to the children's protections online. 
Uh, you all know that tracking and, and manipulation of children under age 13 is against the law. But Facebook, Google, YouTube, and other platforms have broken that law or have found ways around it. Uh, many have been sanctioned for knowingly and illegally harvesting personal information of children and profiting from it. Uh, I have a question for each of you. It's a quick yes or no. Did you all watch the social dilemma where uh, former employees of yours or other big tech platforms say they do not allow their kids on social media? Mr. Zuckerberg? Uh, Congresswoman, I, I haven't seen it, yes. but I'm, I'm obviously familiar with yes, it. Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Pichai, yes or no? Uh, yes, I've seen the movie. And uh, no, no. Okay, well, Mr. Zuckerberg, uh, there's a good reason that they have uh, the former exec say that. Are you aware of the 2019 Journal of the American Medical Association pediatric study that the risk of depression for adolescents rises with each daily hour spent on social media? And I'm not talking screen time, I'm not talking about FaceTime or or sending uh, text messages to friends. But are you aware of that research? Congresswoman, I'm not, I'm not aware yes, of that ma'am. research. All right, what about the 2019 HHS research that suicide rates among kids aged 10 to 14 increased by 56% between 2007 and 2017 and tripled, tripled for kids between the age of 10 and 14? Yes or no? Uh, Congresswoman, I'm, I'm aware of the, of yes. the issues. So, of yes, certainly you are also aware of the research that indicates a correlation between the rise in hospital admissions for self-harm and the prevalence of social media on phones uh, and the apps on platforms that are designed to be addictive and keep kids hooked. Yes? Yeah. Well, how about you, Mr. Pichai? Are you aware of the uh, JAMA Pediatric September 2020 study where they tested hundreds of apps used by children age five and under, many of which were in the Google Play Store's family section? The study found 67% of the apps tested showed transmission of identifying info to third parties in violation of the COPPA law. Are you familiar? extensively spent time on this area. We introduced a curated set of apps for kids on the Play Store. We give digital well-being tools uh, so that people can take a break, set time, parents can set time limits for children. So Let me ask you this then, Mr. Pichai, how much, how much are you making in advertising revenue from children under the age 13? Uh, most of our products, uh, other than a specific product designed for uh, kids in YouTube, uh, you know, most of our products are not eligible for uh, children under the age yeah, of so 30. Yeah, so you're not going to provide that. Mr. Zuckerberg, how much advertising revenue do, does Facebook, do you make uh, from behavioral surveillance advertising targeted towards kids under age 13? Uh, Congresswoman, it, it should be none of it. We don't allow children under the age of 13 on are any you, of the services that run advertising. Oh, are you saying that there are no kids on Instagram uh, under the age of 13 right now? Congresswoman, children under the age of 13 are not allowed on Instagram. Well, that's we find out that they're there, we, we I remove think them. It's, of course, every parent knows that there, there are kids under the age of 13 on Instagram. And the problem is that you know it, and you know that the brain and social development of our kids is still evolving at a young age. There are reasons in the law that, that we set that cut off at 13. But now, because these platforms have ignored it, they've profited off of it, we're gonna strengthen the law. And I encourage all of my colleagues to join in this effort. I've heard a lot of bipartisan support here today. We also need to hold the corporate executives uh, accountable and give parents the tools that they need to to take care and protect their kids. Thank you. General Mr. Lady, time is back. expired. Uh, chair recognizes uh, Mr. Johnson for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. You know, over a decade ago, Americans watched Facebook, Twitter, and Google emerge from humble beginnings. We were curious to see how these new innovative companies would improve our lives. The results are in, and they're deeply concerning. We've seen a surge in cyberbullying, child porn, radical extremism, human trafficking, suicides, and screen addiction, 
all of which have been linked to the use of social media. Our nation's political discourse has never been uglier, and we haven't been this divided since the Civil War. Yet, big tech marches on uninhibited. What's their newest target? Children under the age of 13. News outlets this week have reported that Facebook is planning to create an Instagram app designed for children under the age of 13. We've talked about it here already today. Elementary and middle school students. By allowing big tech to operate under Section 230 as is, we'll be allowing these companies to get our children hooked on their destructive products for their own profit. Big tech is essentially handing our children a lit cigarette and hoping they stay addicted for life. You know, in 1994, Democratic Congressman Henry Waxman chaired a hearing with the CEOs of our nation's largest tobacco companies. During his opening statement, he stated, and I quote, sadly, this deadly habit begins with our kids. In many cases, they become hooked quickly and develop a lifelong addiction that is nearly impossible to break. So, Mr. Zuckerberg and Mr. Dorsey, you profit from your companies hooking users to your platforms by capitalizing on their time. So, yes or no, do you agree that you make money off of creating an addiction to your platforms, Mr. Zuckerberg? Congressman, no, I, I don't agree with okay, that. Thank what you. We do thank is you. I, I, that's what I needed, a yes or a no, because you do. Uh, Mr. Dorsey. No. Okay. All right. Let me go on. Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman Waxman went on to say, and I quote, for decades, the tobacco companies have been exempt from the standards of responsibility and accountability that apply to all other American corporations, companies that sell aspirin, cars, and soda are all held to strict standards when they cause harm and that we demand that when problems occur, corporations and their senior executives be accountable to Congress and the public. This hearing marks the beginning of a new relationship between Congress and the tobacco companies. That's what Chairman Waxman said in 1994. So for all three of you, Mr. Zuckerberg, Mr. Dorsey, and Mr. Pichai, do you agree that the CEOs, that as the CEOs of major tech companies, you should be held accountable to Congress and the public? Mr. Zuckerberg. Uh, Congressman, I think we are accountable to, to Congress and to, and to the public. Do you think you should be held accountable? I, I, I'm not sure, I'm sure I understand what you mean, but I, I, it's a, it's I an think so. Question. Should you be held accountable to Congress yes. and the public? for the way you run your business? Yes, and we are. Okay, all right, thank you. Mr. Dorsey? Yes, accountable to the public. Okay, uh, accountable, well, no, I said accountable to Congress and the public. We represent the public. So you agree? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Pichai? Uh, yes, I'm here today uh, because I'm accountable to Congress and members of the public. Okay, great. Well, gentlemen, let me tell you this. And, and I think uh, I've heard it mentioned by several of my other colleagues. There's a lot of smugness uh, among you. Uh, there's this air of untouchableness uh, in, in your responses to many of the tough questions that you're being asked. So let me tell you all this. All of these concerns that Chairman Waxman stated in 1994 about big tobacco apply to my concerns about big tech today about your companies. It is now public knowledge that former Facebook executives have admitted that they use the tobacco industry's playbook for addictive products. And while this is not your first hearing in front of Congress, I can assure you that this hearing marks a new relationship between all of us here today. There will be accountability. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, he yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. McNerney for five minutes. Well, I thank the chair for organizing this hearing, and I thank the participants. This is a lot of work on your behalf and a long day for you. I appreciate that. Are you all aware that your platforms are behemoths and that the Americans are demanding that we step in and rein in your platforms? 
both in terms of how you handle our data and how your platforms handle disinformation that causes real harm to Americans and to the democracy itself. I understand the tension you have between maximizing your profits by engaging uh, to your platforms on the one hand, and by the need to, dis to address disinformation and real harm it causes on the other hand. Your unwillingness to unambiguously commit to enforcing your own policies and removing the 12 most egregious spreaders of vaccine disinformation from your platforms gets right at what I'm concerned about. Disinformation is a strong driver for engagement and consequently, you too often don't act, even though we know you have the resources to do that. There are real harms associated with this. And my questions, I hope I don't appear to be rude, but when I ask for a yes or no question, I will insist on a yes or no answer. Mr. Zuckerberg, yes or no, do you acknowledge that there is this information being spread on your platform? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, yes, there, there is, and we, we take steps to fight it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes or no, do you agree that your company has profited from the spread of disinformation? Uh, Congressman, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. People don't want to see disinformation on our services, and when we do, so I think it no, hurts no. our long-term business. Said, you said you don't agree with that. I appreciate your, your forthrightness, forthrightness on that. Uh, but we all know this is happening. Profits are being generated from COVID-19 and vaccine disinformation, election disinformation, QAnon conspiracy theories, just to name a few things. And it's baffling that you have a negative answer to that question. Approximately, well, let's move on to the next issue. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, you talk a lot about relying on third party fact checkers to combat the spread of disinformation, but you tell us very little about the process. I wrote you a letter nearly two years ago asking about it and you failed to answer my question. I asked this question again when an executive from your company testified last year and she failed to answer it. I'd like to get an answer today. On average, from the time content is posted to Facebook's platform, how long does it take Facebook to flag suspicious content to third party fast checkers, for third party fast checkers to review the content, and for Facebook to take remedial action after this review is completed? How long does this entire process take? I'm just looking for a quick number. Congressman, it can vary. If, if an AI system identifies something immediately, it can be within seconds. If we have to wait for people to report it to us and have human review, it can take hours or days. The fact checkers take as much time as they need to review things, but as soon as we get an answer back from them, we should uh, operationalize that and attach a label if the content is rated false okay. and uh, reduce well, okay. the distribution. I understand what you're saying. But what I do know is that this process isn't happening quickly enough, and I'm very concerned that you aren't motivated to speak things up because most problematic content is what gets the most views. And longer the content stays up, the more help, uh, the more this helps maximize your bottom line and the more harm that it can cause. Um, it's clear that you aren't going to make these changes on your own. Uh, this is a question for all of uh, the participants, uh, panelists. Would you oppose legislation that prohibits placing ads next to what you know to be or should know to be false or misleading information, including ads that are placed in videos, promoted content, and ads that are placed above, below, or on the side of a piece of content? Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, would you answer with a yes or no first, please? Congressman, that, that's that's very nuanced. I, I think the the questions to determine whether something is misinformation is a is is a process that I think would need to be um, spelled out well in in a in a law like that. Well, okay, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Dorsey. Yes, I would oppose it until we see the actual requirements and what the ramifications are. We need to understand that. Okay, Mr. Pichai, would you oppose the? Uh, a prohibition like this? Uh, the principle makes sense. In fact, advertisers don't want anywhere or near to be content like that. And so we already have incentives. Uh, you can imagine uh, reputable advertisers like consumer products advertisers do not want uh, any ads to appear next to uh, information that could turn off their uh, consumers. So we have natural incentives to do the right thing here. So you all say you want a safe and open platform for everyone. You say it's not in your company's interest to have disinformation on your platform, so you shouldn't oppose efforts uh, that, that would prevent harming American people. I yield back. 
Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Long for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Pachai, I'm going to ask you a yes or no question. And uh, just tell me if you know the difference in these two words. Yes and no. Yes. Yes. Mr. Zuckerberg, same question for you. Do you know the difference in yes and no? Yes, Congressman. And Mr. Dorsey, same question for you. Do you know the difference in two words, yes or no? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. Yes. yes I didn't it's another difference. Okay. Thank you. I just I want a steak dinner there from one of our my colleagues. They didn't think I could get you all to answer. All three of the answer yes or no question. I did it. Mr. Zuckerberg, let me ask you. Uh, how do you ascertain if a user is under 13 years old? Uh, Congressman, on services like Facebook, we have people put in a, a birthday when they when they register. That's handy. So a 13 year old would never, I mean, an 11 year old would never put in the wrong birthday by two years and say they were 13. Is that kind of your policy? Uh, Congressman, it's more nuanced than that, but I think you're getting at a real point, which is that people lie. Um, and we, we have additional systems that try to determine uh, what someone's age might be. So if we detect that someone might be under the age of 13, even if they lied, we kick them off. But this is part of the reason why we're exploring um, having a service for, for Instagram that, uh, that allows under 13s on, because we worry that kids may find ways to try to lie and evade some of our systems, but if we create a safe system um, where that has appropriate parent controls, then we might be able to get people in, into to using that instead. We're still early in figuring this out, but but that's a, a, a big part of the, the theory and what we're hoping to do here. But currently, they're not allowed to use Instagram, correct? That's correct. Our policies do not allow okay. people under the age of 13 from, to use it. I'm from Missouri, the show me state, and just to say that no one under 13 could get on to me doesn't pass the Missouri smell test of show me. So uh, sticking with you, Mr. Zuckerberg, you created the Facebook Oversight Board as a way to, to help hold Facebook accountable. They are currently looking at Facebook's decision to remove President Trump's Facebook account. If the Oversight Board determines that Facebook should have left President Trump's account up, what will you do? Uh, Congressman, we will respect the decision of the Oversight Board, and um, and and if they tell us that uh, former President Trump's account should be reinstated, then um, then then we will honor that. I don't know why people call Attorney General Ashcroft Attorney General, but when they speak of President Trump, they call him former president. But I guess I'll leave that for another day. Uh, sticking with you again, Mr. Zuckerberg. Uh, it's my understanding is that Facebook Oversight Board is comprised of members from all over the world. As you're well aware, the United States has the strictest protections on free speech on any other country. Since the decisions of the board are being made by a panel rather than the U.S. Court of Law, how can you assure members of this committee and the American people that the Oversight Board will uphold free speech and make their decisions based on American laws and principles? Congressman, the, the members of the Oversight Board were selected because of their views on free expression and strong support of it. Um, that's why we created the Oversight Board, to help us defend these, these principles um, and, and to help us balance um, the different aspects of human rights, including free expression. But each of the people on the Oversight Board was selected um, because of a strong commitment to free expression. And I think the decisions that the Oversight Board has made so far um, reflect that. Okay, let me uh, move on to Mr. Dorsey. Mr. Dorsey, I know you're from the show me state also. Uh, have you been vaccinated against COVID-19? Uh, not yet. Uh, Mr. Pachai, have you been vaccinated against COVID-19? Sorry, I'm sorry. I missed a question, Congressman. Have, have you, I know I bore a lot of people. Have you been uh, vaccinated against COVID-19? Uh, Congressman, I was very fortunate to have received it last week. So you have one shot, you have another one to go, or is it just Johnson & Johnson or you just need one? Uh, I, I still have one more shot to go. And Mr. Zuckerberg, same question. Have you been vaccinated against COVID-19? I have not yet, but hope to as soon as possible. 
Okay. It's not a personal preference not to get vaccinated. You just haven't got to your age group or. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, I just cannot believe Robert Kennedy Jr. is out there with his anti back stuff and it's allowed to stay up on Twitter with that. I yield back. Gentlemen yields back. Uh, let's see who's next. Um, I don't see a name. Can staff uh, show us who's next? Ah, Mr. Welch, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. What we're hearing uh, from both sides of the aisle are enormous concerns about some of the consequences of the development of social media. The algorithmic amplification of disinformation, election interference, privacy issues, uh, the destruction of local news, uh, and also some competition issues. And I have listened carefully, and each of the executives uh, has said that your companies are attempting to face these issues. But a concern I have is whether when the public interest is so affected by these decisions and by these developments, Ultimately, should these decisions be made by private executives uh, who are accountable to shareholders, or should they be made by elected representatives accountable to voters? Uh, so I, I really have two questions uh, that I'd like each of you, starting with Mr. Zuckerberg and then Mr. Pichai and then Mr. Dorsey to address. Uh, first, do you agree that many of these decisions that are about matters that so profoundly affect the public interest, should they be made exclusively by private actors like yourselves who have responsibilities for these major enterprises? And secondly, as a way forward to help us resolve these issues or work with them, would you support the creation by Congress of a public agency, one like the Federal Trade Commission or the Securities and Exchange Commission, one that had staff that's expert in policy and technology uh, it has rulemaking and enforcement authority to be an ongoing representative of the public to address these emerging issues. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg. Uh, Congressman, I, I agree with what you're saying. And I, I've said a number of times that I think that private companies should not be making so many decisions alone that have to balance these complicated social and public equities. And I think that the solution that you're talking about could be very effective and positive for helping out. Because what we've seen in different countries is um, around the world is there are lots of different public equities at stake here, free expression, safety, privacy, uh, competition, and these things trade off against each other. And I think a lot of these questions and, and the reason why people get upset at the companies, I don't think it's necessarily because the companies are negligent. I think it's because these are complex trade-offs between these different equities. And if you- Pardon my interruption. Saying, but I want to go to Mr. Pichai, but thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg. Congressman, if your question is, uh, I just want to make sure, uh, are you asking about whether there should be another agency? I defer to Congress on that. Uh, we are uh, definitely subject to a variety of statutes and uh, oversight by agencies like FTC. We have consent degree agreements with FCC and we engage with these agencies regularly. But do you believe that it should be up to the public as opposed to private interests uh, to be making decisions about these public effects? Uh, we, we definitely think areas where there could be clear legislation uh, informed by uh, the public. Uh, I think that definitely is a better approach. I would say the nature of content is so uh, fast changing and so dynamic. You know, we spend a lot of area hiring experts, consult with third parties and that expertise is needed, I think, based on the right. issue. And that's the, that's the problem we have in Congress, because an issue pops up and there's no way we can keep up with it. You all can barely keep up with it yourself. Uh, Mr. Dorsey, uh, your uh, view on those two questions, please. I, 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 yes, uh, I don't think the decision should be made by private companies or the government, um, which is why we're suggesting a protocol approach um, to help the people make the decisions themselves, have more control themselves. So does that mean that the creation of an agency that would be intended to address many of these uh, tech issues that are emerging uh, is something you'd oppose or not? 
Well, I always have an open mind. I want to see the details of, of what, what that means and, and how, it, how it works in practice. Well, of course. But the heart of it is creating an entity that has to address these questions of algorithmic uh, transparency, of algorithmic amplification, of hate speech, of disinformation, of competition, and to have an agency that's dedicated to that, much like the Security Exchange Commission was designed to stop the rampant abuse on Wall Street in the 30s, a public sector entity that is doing this, not just leaving it to private companies. I, 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 do do think, not? I do think there should be more regulation around the primitives of AI, um, but we focus a lot of our conversations right now on the outcomes of it. I don't think we're looking enough at the primitives. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Bashan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first of all, I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. It's going to be a long day and uh, appreciate your your testimony and your answering questions. I, I do think it's important to understand history. <coughs> Excuse me when you look at these situations. And you know, when it comes to the political side, when Thomas Jefferson wanted to get out an anti Adams message, even though he was his own vice president, he started his own newspaper because it was pretty clear that the newspapers that were being published weren't going to change their their view because there was no competitive reason to do that. And I think we're looking at potentially a similar situation here. A comp without competition, things don't change. I mean, it'd be interesting to know the conversations with uh, John D. Rockefeller in the early 1900s um, prior to the breakup of Standard Oil in 1911 and then, of course, AT&T in 1982. So, uh, I, you know, I understand that uh, these are businesses, they're publicly held companies. I respect that. I understand that. I'm, I'm a capitalist. That said, there is, these are these situations are a little different, I think, because there's some social responsibility here. And I appreciate your answers uh, that your companies are doing what you believe uh, are necessary. But so I want to add, I'm going to uh, take this the antitrust angle here, and Mr. Punchai, uh, what do you think? What, what's the situation when you have Google, 92% of the searches are Google, you basically can't get on the internet without some sort of Google service. What do you think, uh, what do you think is going to happen? What do you, you know, what do you think we should do about that? Congressman, um, I mean, we definitely uh, are engaged with conversations as well as uh, lawsuits in certain cases. We understand there will be scrutiny here. We are a popular general purpose search engine, but we compete vigorously in many of the markets we operate in. For example, a uh, majority of our revenue comes from product searches and one in two product searches originate with Amazon today in the US. So we definitely see a, a lot of competition by category. There are many areas as a company, we are an emerging player, be it making phones or when we are trying to provide enterprise software, we compete with other larger players as well. And if you look at last year and look at all the new entrants in the market, uh, new companies that have gone <clears> public <throat> and emerged strongly, uh, you know, in, in tech shows that the market is vibrant and dynamic. As Google, we have invested in uh, many startups. Uh, Googlers have started over, former Google employees have started over 2000 companies in the past uh, 15 years. And so, you know, I see, uh, highly dynamic, vibrant, competitive tech sector, and uh, we are committed to doing our part. Okay, fair enough. Mr. Zuckerberg, do you have some comments on that subject? Congressman, I would echo Sindar's comments. I think that this is a highly competitive market. I mean, if this is a meeting about social media, not only do you have the different companies that are here today that all offer very big services that compete with each other, but you have um, new entrants that are growing very quickly, like TikTok, um, which is is reaching a scale of, of hundreds of millions or billions of people around the world, um, and I think is growing faster than any of our services of, of of the companies that are that are up here today, and and certainly competitive with us. And that's just naming a few. Right? I mean, obviously, there's you know Snapchat and a bunch of other services as well. So it's a very competitive marketplace. Do you think, and I'll ask you this, Mr. Zuckerberg, you've, I think you've commented that some of the privacy things that maybe the Europeans did would kind of solidify your, your dominance as a company. So what should we do in, in the United States on, on this? Because it's a different subject, but similar. 
um, to the to uh, not do something that would stymie innovation competition and further in my view further create a monopolistic or at least a perceived monopolistic environment well congressman I, I do think that the u.s should have federal privacy legislation because i i think we need a, a national standard um and i and i think having a standard that that is uh, across the country that's as ham harmonized with standards in other places would actually create clearer um, uh, expectations of industry and make it better for everyone. But I think the point that you're making is a really important one, which is if we ask companies to lock down data, um, then that to some degree can be at odds um, with asking them to open up data to enable whether it's academic research or competition. So I think that when we're writing this privacy regulation, we just should be aware of the, the interaction between our principles on privacy and our principles on competition. And that's why I think a more holistic view, like what Congressman Welch was just proposing, I think is, is, is perhaps um, a, a good way to go about this. Okay, Qu quickly, Mr. Dorsey, do you have any comments on that? Um, one of the reasons we're suggesting more of a protocol approach is to enable as many new entrants as possible. Um, okay. We, we want to be a client on that. Uh, I, I want to make time expired. With that, I'll yield back. Chair recognizes um, Ms. Clark for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you, the, the chairs and the ranking members uh, for today's hearing. I also uh, thank our witnesses for appearing. In January, I call for a public comment for the discussion draft of my bill, the Civil Rights Modernization Act of 2021, a narrowly focused proposal to protect historically marginalized communities from the harms of targeted advertising practices. These harms can and have infringed on the civil rights of protected classes, and I'm proud to formally introduce this bill next week to diminish inequities in the digital world. For, the, for time's sake, I ask our witnesses to please answer the questions as succinctly as possible. The first question goes to Mr. Zuckerberg. Facebook currently provides their advertisers with insight on how to get their ads in front of people who are most likely to find their ads relevant by utilizing tools to use criteria like consumers' personal interests, geography, to fine tune the targeting. This is often used code that target or avoid specific races or other protected classes of people. Let me add that I'm aware of the updates to your special ad audience. However, why does Facebook continue to allow for discrimination in the placement of advertisements that can violate civil rights laws? Congresswoman, we've taken a, a number of steps to eliminate ways that people can target um, different groups based on racial affinity and, and different ways that they might discriminate, because um, this, this is a, a very important area. And um, we have active conversations going on with civil rights experts as to the, the best ways to continue improving these systems, and we'll continue doing that. Mr. Dorsey, Twitter allows advertisers to use demographic targeting to reach people based on location, language, device, age, and gender. In July, your company made changes to your ad targeting policy to advise advertisers to, uh, quote, not wrongfully discriminate against legally protected categories of users, end quote. What did Twitter mean by the phrase wrongfully discriminate? Are some kinds of discriminatory advertising permitted on Twitter? If so, would you please explain? No. no. I'm sorry, I, I didn't get that answer. No, none at all. Okay, and so can you explain what, what you meant by uh, uh, wrongfully discriminate? Uh, we, we mean that we you shouldn't just use our ad systems to discriminate. Oh, okay. Mr. Uh, Pichai, Google has recently announced a new approach in their targeting system called Flock, or Federal Learning of Cohorts, excuse me, Federated Learning of Cohorts, to allow an, an ad targeting to groups of people with similar characteristics. The new system will utilize machine learning to create these cohorts for the consumer's visits to websites. Given the potentially biased and disparate impact of learn machine learning algorithms, how has Google addressed the potential discriminatory impact of this new flock system? Uh, Congresswoman, it's an important area. Uh, 
we recently announced a joint collaboration with HUD to ban ads that would target a gender family status zip code in addition to race, which we've long disallowed. So we'll bring similar provisions, uh, particularly when we are using machine learning. And by the way, Flock is early. We haven't implemented it yet. We will be uh, publishing more technical proposals on it. And we will, they will be held to our AI principles, uh, which prohibit uh, uh, you know, discrimination based on sensitive categories, uh, including race. And we'll, we will be happy to consult and explain our work there. I appreciate that. Gentlemen, I just want you to be aware that the longer we delay in this, the more that the systems that you have created uh, bake discrimination into these algorithms. I think that is critical that you get in there and that you do what is in the best interest of the public of the United States of America and un, uh, undo a lot of the harm that has been created with uh, the bias that has been baked into your systems. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back 23 seconds and I thank you for this opportunity. And I thank the general lady for that. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Wahlberg for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the panel for being here. Um, you know, what I've, what I've listened to so far today, I'd have to say that uh, based upon what many of us in Congress say about the best legislation, when both sides don't like it, it's probably, probably good. And you've certainly hit that today. Um, I think from both sides, you, you have been attacked uh, for various reasons. But, uh, you know, I have to say the, the, the platforms that you've developed are amazing and they have huge potential. And they indeed have enabled us to go directions, uh, information, communications, um, relationships uh, that can be very positive and are amazing in what, what's been accomplished. I think we get down to how that is controlled um, and, and who controls it. Uh, going back to our foundations as our country, it was our second president, uh, John Adams, who said that uh, our constitution was meant for a moral and religious people and is wholly inadequate for any other. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of the problems that you're frustrated with as a result of parents and families, uh, churches, schools uh, that aren't taking the primary responsibility. I get that. Uh, so it comes down to the choice that's left for the people is really between conscience and the constable. We're either gonna have a conscience that self-controls and as you said, Mr. Zuckerberg, you know, in fact, what you said, I wouldn't mind my three and five year old granddaughters coming to your house. I'm not asking for the invitation, but I think they'd be safe there relative to the online capabilities from what you said. But that's conscience versus constable. But what I've heard today, heard today is that there will be some constable. And I'm not sure that we'll have success in moving forward. So I guess, uh, Mr. Chairman, unfortunately, we've been here before. Uh, we've been here many times. A few years ago, when Mr. Zuckerberg was here before this committee, I held up a Facebook post by a state senator in Michigan uh, that whose post was simply announcing his candidacy as a Republican for elected office, and yet it was censored as shocking and disrespectful or sensational in content. Just a few months ago, I posted my resolution that would add teachers to the vaccine priority list on Twitter, and it was labeled as quote, sensitive content and encouraged to be changed. Well, hiding behind section 230, all of you have denied that there's any bias or an inequitable handling of content on your platforms. And yet Pew Research Center found that, and this is where I have my problem, not so much with a platform or even the extent of what's on the platform, but they found that 72% of the public thinks it's likely that social media platforms actively censor political views that big tech companies find objectionable. Further, and I quote, by a four to one margin, respondents were more likely to say big tech supports the views of liberals over conservatives and vice versa, probably equaled only by higher education. That was my, my statement. And yet every time this happens, you fall back on blaming glitches in the algorithms. It was former uh, uh, Greg Coppola, former Google insider, who said before he was suspended by Google, he said, algorithms don't write themselves, 
we write them to do what we want them to do. That's my concern. Whether it's censoring pro-life pro groups like Live Action or pro-Second Amendment groups like the Well-Armed Women, their platforms continually shut down law-abiding citizens and constitutional discussions and commerce that don't align with big tech views and the worldview. And this includes the First and Second Amendments uh, that causes me to con be concerned uh, that you don't share the same freedom and constitutional concerns. It's not often I find myself agreeing with Bernie Sanders, but in an interview earlier this week, and I quote, he said, if you're asking me, do I feel particularly comfortable that the president of the United States should not express his views on Twitter? I don't feel comfortable about that. He went on to say, because yesterday was Donald Trump who was blamed and tomorrow it could be somebody else. Mr. Zuckerberg or Mr. Dorsey, do you think the law should allow you to be the arbiters of truth as they have under Section 230? Mr. Zuckerberg first. Uh, Congressman, I, I think that it is good to have a law that allows platforms to moderate content. Um, but I, I, as I've said today, I think that they're uh, that we'd benefit from from more transparency and accountability. Mr. Dorsey? I don't think we should be the arbiters of truth, and I don't think the government should be either. Gentlemen's time has expired. I agree. Uh, I go back. Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Cardenas for five minutes. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mr. Chairman and ranking members for having this uh, important hearing. I'd like to submit to the record a National Hispanic Media Coalition letter uh, against Spanish language disinformation on social media. And uh, if we could submit that for the record, I'd appreciate that. Um, and also, uh, my first question is to you, Mr. Zuckerberg. In 2020, Facebook uh, brought in approximately $86 billion of uh, revenue in 2020. Is that about right, give or take? Congressman, I think that's about right. Okay, thank you. Uh, good. Uh, how much of that revenue did uh, Facebook invest in identifying misinformation, disinformation in that portion of your business? Um, Congressman, I don't know the exact answer, but we invest billions of dollars in, in our integrity programs, including you know, having more than 1,000 engineers working on this and 35,000 people doing content review across the company. Okay. And how many people do you have uh, full-time equivalents in your company overall? Uh, Congressman, I don't know the exact number, but I think you know it's it's around sixty thousand. Okay, so you're saying uh, over half of the people in your company are doing the portion of content review, et cetera, which is the main subject we seem to be talking about today. Um, no, Congressman, because you, you you asked about full time employees and and some of the content reviewers are contractors. Okay, all right. Well. Um, there seems to be a disparity between uh, the different languages that are used on your platform in America. And as, for example, um, there was a study published in April by Avaz and over 100 items of dis, uh, misinformation on Facebook in six different languages was found that 70% of the Spanish language content analyzed had not been labeled by Facebook as compared to 30% of the English language misinformation that had not been labeled. So there seems to be a disparity there. Uh, what kind of investment is Facebook making on the different languages to make sure that we have more of a uh, of an accuracy of flagging those, those the disinformation and misinformation? Congressman, thanks. We have a, a an international fact checking program uh, where we work with fact checkers in more than 80 countries and in a bunch of different languages. In the U.S. specifically, um, we we have Spanish speaking fact checkers as well as English speaking fact checkers. Um, so that's on the misinformation side. But also when we create resources with authoritative information, whether it's on, around COVID information or election information, we translate those hubs so that way they can be available in both English and Spanish. Um, and we okay. make it so that people can see the content in whatever language they prefer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so basically you're saying it's extensive. Uh, Congressman, this is certainly something that we invest a lot in and it will be something okay. that we continue to invest more in. Okay, I, I like the last portion. I, I, I do believe and would love to see you invest more. Um, 
I, my 70 plus year old mother-in-law uh, who is primarily a Spanish speaker uh, commented to me the other day that her friends who communicate mainly in Spanish and they do use the internet, they do use some of your platforms, gentlemen, uh, that they were worried about the vaccine and that somebody's gonna put a chip in their arm. For God's sakes, I mean, that to me just was unbelievable that they would comment on that, but they got most of that information on the internet, on, on various platforms. Uh, clearly, Spanish language disinformation is an issue, and I'd like to make sure that uh, we see all of your platforms address these issues, not only in English, but in all languages. Um, I think it's important for us to understand that that a lot of hate is being spewed on the Internet, and a lot of it is coming through many of your platforms. For example, there are 23 people dead in El Paso because somebody filled this person's head with a lot of hateful nonsense, and he drove to specifically kill Mexicans uh, along the, the Texas-Mexican border. Um, eight people are dead in Atlanta because an anti-Asian hatred and misinformation has been per uh, permitted to spread and allowed on, on these platforms unchecked, pretty much unchecked. The spread of hatred and, and incitement of violence on platforms is a deadly problem in America, and I, uh, we, we need to see that it stops. Mr. Zuckerberg, do you believe that you've done enough to combat these kinds of issues? Uh, Congressman, I, I believe that our systems and that we've done more than, than basically any other company, but I think that there's still a problem and there's still more that needs okay. to be done. Okay, it's good. You, you'd like to do more. Thank you. I only have 15 seconds, so I'm going to ask this question to all three of you. Um, do you think that each one of your organizations should have an executive level individual in charge of this department uh, reporting directly to the CEO? Do you think do you agree that that should be the case? Mr. Secretary. Congressman, we, we have an executive level person who's in charge of the, the integrity team that I talked about, and he's on my management team. It reports directly to you. Uh, Congressman, he, he does not. I only have a few direct reports. Okay. A lot of people yeah. on the management team Thank report to them. Thank you. Um, to the other two witnesses, very quickly. Uh, Congressman, we have uh, senior executives, including uh, someone who reports directly to me, who oversees trust and safety across Thank all you. these areas. Thank you, Mr. Dorsey. We do. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Thomas, time has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Carter for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here. Mr. Zuckerberg, I'd like to start with you, and I wanted to ask you, you're aware, as all of us are, of the of the disaster that we have at the southern border. To indicate that human smugglers have been using social media including Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram, to coordinate their operations in transporting illegal immigrants into the United States. Things like, like what to say to authorities, transportation tips, and other forms of information that are being traded on your platform to evade authorities and contribute to the crisis, this disaster at the border. Mr. Zuckerberg, do you feel complicit in any way that your platform is, is assisting in this disaster? Uh, Congressman, first, let me say that what's happening at the border is, is it? I'm not, you know what's happening at the border. I'm asking you specifically about your platform. Do you feel complicit in what your platform is doing to assist in this disaster? Congressman, we're, we're, we have policies and we're working to, to fight this content. We have policies against scams and, and pages, groups, and events, um, like the content that you're talking about. We're also seeing, uh, the State Department, uh, use our platform to share factual information with people. Um, uh, about what is going on. I think that's well, I'm talking about I'm talking about coyotes who are using your platform to spread this kind of information to assist in this illegal activity that is resulting in in, in, in horrible conditions for these people who are trying to come across that border. Congressman, that's against our policies, and we're taking a lot of steps to stop it. And, and again, I mean, let me just say that I think that the situation at the border is really serious, and, and we're taking it very seriously. Well, and I hope you'll look into this, these reports that your platform is being used by these traffickers. This is something we need your help with. I hope you feel a sense of responsibility, sir, to help us with this because we certainly need it. Let me ask you something. You've dedicated a, a lot of your written re, um, um, testimony to election issues. And even today during this, during this hearing, you've been very public in pushing back about the election claims in November, yet when Facebook has been essentially silent on the attempted theft 
of the certified election in Iowa of Representative Miller Meeks. Why is that? Why are you silent on that, yet you're not silent on other elections? Congressman, I think what we saw uh, leading up to January 6th was unprecedented in, in, in American history, where you had a sitting president uh, trying to undermine the peaceful transfer of, of power. You determine which one is important and which one is not. This seat to these people who elected this duly certified representative, this is the most important thing to them as well. Congressman, I think part of what made the January 6th events extraordinary was not just the that the, the election was contested, but that uh, you what, had folks okay, like the president. Let me ask you this. What is it that makes this particular issue irrelevant? That you're not even covering it, Congressman. I didn't say that it's irrelevant, but it. it but in, on January sixth, we had uh, insurrectionists storm the Capitol, leading to the death of I, multiple I, Mr. people. Mr. Zuckerberg, I'm I'm aware of that. I was there. I understand what happened. But again, will you commit to treating this as a serious election concern? Uh, What's going on in I, uh, Congressman, we, we uh, I, I will commit to 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 that, and we uh, apply our policies to to all situations. and And I think that this is different from what happened on January sixth, but we apply our our policies equally in these cases. mr. Mr. Dorsey, you too have been very silent on this issue on your platform. Will you commit to make to treating this as a serious concern, the attempted theft of the certified seat in Iowa? Yes, we're looking for all opportunities to minimize uh, anything that takes away from the integrity of elections. Okay, Mr. Mr. Dorsey, while I've got you, let me ask you, you you've started a new program. It's called the uh, Bird Watch, and it allows people to identify information in tweets uh, that, that they believe is misleading and the right notes to provide context in an effort to stop misleading information from spreading. Have you seen, we've, we've seen mobs of Twitter users cancel others even when the information they share is accurate. Why do you think Birdwatch is gonna work given the culture that you created on your platform? Uh, well, it's an experiment. And we're, we're, we wanted to experiment with more crowdsource approach than us going around and, and doing all this work. Don't you think that's kind of a dangerous experiment when you're taking off truthful information? No, it's an alternative. And I think, I think we need to experiment as much as possible to get to the right answers. I think it's okay. Well, that's that's fine as long as you're not the one being experimented on. As long as you're not the one that the information, information time, can use it. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the chair announces that we're going to um, take a recess now for 15 minutes. So the committee will stand in recess uh, until 3:18, and then we'll come back promptly. Uh, I call the committee uh, in recess.
and ask all members and uh, witnesses to come back online. Okay, we'll get started. The chair recognizes uh, Ms. Dingle for five minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for having this hearing and to everyone for uh, testifying today. We can all agree that social media companies have a responsibility to reduce and eliminate the impact of disinformation on their platforms. Mr. Zuckerberg, in the fall of 2020, you made numerous assurances to Congress that you had a handle on militia and conspiracy networks. We know, however, that Facebook private groups and the algorithms that recommend them have assisted in radicalizing users and facilitated terrorism, violence, and extremism against individuals, including the governor of my state of Michigan. Racial and ethnic minorities, including Muslims and recently Asian Americans, are facing growing racist hate online and violence offline. Last year, I sent you multiple letters about these issues, so I know you're aware of them. In October of 2020, Facebook temporarily decided to stop recommending political or civic groups on its platforms, a change you've now made permanent. But to be honest, despite what you did in October, we had an insurrection that stormed the Capitol on January 6. I seriously question Facebook's commitment to actually stopping extremism. In a recent investigative report, a former Facebook AI researcher said he and his team conducted study after study confirming the same basic idea, models that maximize engagement increase polarization. And you yourself have said that the more likely content is to violate Facebook community standards, the more engagement it generally receives. Engagement is the key to Facebook's growth and success, and the stock markets rewarded you for it, even as you've been criticized for promoting extremism and racist content including in a 2020 Facebook civil rights audit. The two seem to go hand in hand, as Facebook was also the most cited social media site in charging documents that the Justice Department filed against the Capitol Hill insurrections. Mr. Zuckerberg, do you still maintain that the more likely user content is to violate Facebook community standards, the more engagement it will receive, yes or no? Congresswoman, thanks for, for raising this, because I think that there's been a bunch of, of um, inaccurate things about this shared today. Okay, there there seems to be a belief. Yes no? Sorry, sorry, this is a, a, a nuanced topic. So if, if you if, if you're OK with it, I'd like to explain what, keep what it, it short, but I'll give it a second since I'm sure. One of the so that's a top victim of this hate. Um, People don't want to see misinformation or divisive content on our services. People don't want to see clickbait and things like that. While it may be true that people might be more likely to click on it in the short term, it's not good for our business or our product or our community for this content to be there. It's not what people want. And we run the company for the long term um, with, with a view um, towards 10 or 20 years from now. And I, I think that um, we're highly aligned with our community in um, in, in trying to okay, uh, not show people the content that's not going to be meaningful to them. Okay, Mr. Zuckerberg, I'm gonna. I only have two minutes left. Do you still agree with the statement in Facebook's most recent 10K filing that the first risk related to your product product offerings is our ability to add and retain users and maintain levels of user engagement with our products? Just a yes or no, please. Uh, Congresswoman, I think that that's generally right. I mean, for any product, the ability to 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 build something that people like and use is um, is something that 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 is a risk okay. if we can't do that. So, do you still agree with the statement of your CFO on a recent earnings call that the changes to group recommendations so far wouldn't affect your engagement? Yes or no? Congresswoman, there are so many different parts of, of the service that I think it's yeah, probably I right that not, not, not recommending political or civic groups probably isn't going to meaningfully decrease engagement. But we've taken a lot of other steps, including you know, reducing viral videos by about 50 million hours of watching a day, which have had a meaningful impact on engagement. But we, we do that because we, it helps make the service better and helps people like it more, which I think will be better for both the community and our business over the long term. 
Okay, okay. Mr. Zuckerberg, I'm sorry to have to do this in five minutes, but given your promises in the fall, the events that transpired on January 6th, and your true incentives, as you yourself admit, I find it really difficult to take some of these assurances you're trying to give us today seriously. I believe that regulators and independent researchers should have access to Facebook and other large social media platforms, recommendations, algorithms, not just for groups, but for any relevant feature that can be exploited or exploit private user data collected by the company to support extremism. And I support legislation to do so. Mr. Zuckerberg, given your inability to manage your algorithms or your unwillingness to, to reduce controversial content, are you opposed to a law enabling regulators to access social media algorithms or other information technology that result in the promotion of harmful disinformation and extremist content? Well, Congresswoman, while, while I don't necessarily agree with your characterization, I do think that giving more transparency into the systems is an important thing. Um, we have people working on figuring out how to do this. One of the nuances here and complexity is that it is hard to separate out the algorithms versus um, people's data, which which kind of goes into that to make decisions and the data is private. So it's tough to make that private, public and transparent. But but I do think that this is an important area of study on how to audit and and, and make algorithms more transparent. Okay, the gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Duncan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Let me first say that Democrats are repeating disinformation about the motives of the murderer in Atlanta. During a hearing on disinformation is irony at its worst. The murderer admitted that he was a sex addict. The problem was addiction, mental illness. While my thoughts and prayers go out to the families who were impacted by this hideous crime, it was not a hate crime and to say so is disinformation. Mr. Dorsey, is it okay for a white male to tweet a picture of a KKK Klansman hood to a black woman? Uh, no, that would go against our uh, hateful conduct policy. Just this week, black conservative commentator Candace Owens was sent a tweet from a white liberal depicting a KKK hood, and your support center said that that racist har harassment of a uh, harassment of a conservative didn't violate your terms of service. What do you have to say about that? We have, we, we removed that tweet. Okay, thank you for doing that. Also this week, Syrian refugee Ahmad al Alawi Alisa, a Biden supporting Muslim allegedly murdered 10 people at a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado. Your support center told Newsweek that referring to uh, this gentleman as a white Christian terrorist wasn't a violation of your misinformation policy. What do you have to say about that? I, I don't know that case, but we can follow up with you on it. Thank you. Your promises uh, in the, from the last hearing that you'll work on this or make it better ring completely hollow sometimes, so I ask that you do. You've censored and taken down accounts of conservatives, Christian, and even pro-life groups. At the same time, liberals, tyrants, and terrorists continue to have unfettered access on Twitter. You're able to take down the account of a sitting United States president while he was still president, but you continue to allow state sponsors of terror to use Twitter as a platform, including the Ayatollah Khamenei, uh, Javed Zarif of Iran, or even Bashir Assad of Syria. You act like judge and jury and continue to hide behind the liability protections in Section 230 of the Communication and Decency Act, which Congress set up to foster a free and open internet. You think you're above the law because in a sense, Congress gave you that power, but Congress gave you that liability shield to one end. That was the protection of innocent children. Catherine McMorris Rogers knocked it out of the park today, hammering the point where children are vulnerable. But let's look at the John Doe versus Twitter case that's ongoing right now. According to the National Center of Sexual Exploitation, a teenage boy, a victim of child sex trafficking, had images of his abuse posted on Twitter. One of those videos went viral and he became the target of bullying to the point of being suicidal. He contacted you to alert you that his sex abuse images were on your platform. You failed to take them down. His mother contacted you to alert you, and again, you failed to take them down. They called the police and they followed up with you with a police report. Your support center told the family that after review, the illegal video was not a violation of your terms of service. In the meantime, the illegal video accrued over 167,000 views. It took a threat from Homeland Security agent to get Twitter to take down the video. Even then, you took no action against the accounts that were sharing it and continue to share sexually explicit videos of minors in clear violation of the law and in clear violation of your duties under Section 230 
of the Communications Decency Act um, as they were passed. So in the eyes of Twitter, it's better to be a pedophile pornographer, a woke racist, or a state sponsor of terror than it is to be a conservative, even a conservative president. You've abused Section 230, Liability Shield, we gave you to protect children and used it to silence conservatives instead. As we've heard today, your abuses of your privilege are far too numerous to be explained away and far too serious to ignore. So it's time for your liability shield to be removed. Your immunity shield and the immunity shield of other woke companies who choose to score political points with their immunity shields rather than protect children. My colleagues have been asking you if you deserve to continue to receive immunity under Section 230. Let me answer the question for you. No, you don't. Y'all think you do, but you don't because you continue uh, to do a disservice to that law and its intent. The United States Constitution has the First Amendment, and that should be your guide, protecting the speech of users of your platform instead of treating them like hostages and forcing things through algorithms um, to lead them down a path. The American people really are tired of you abusing your rights, abandoning their values. So one of the Christian leaders that you banned, Mr. Dorsey, had as her last post a scripture verse that you took down, and I want to leave it with you here today. Psalm 34, 14, depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Rather than silence that wise advice, I strongly suggest that you follow it. Now, I've heard a lot of stuff on this hearing today about 230 protections. I challenge my colleagues to really get serious about doing something about this liability shield so that we do have a fair and free internet and people aren't censored. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. The uh, chair recognizes Ms. Kelly for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you to the witnesses for testifying today. The business model for your platforms is quite simple. Keep users engaged. The more time people spend on social media, the more data harvested and targeted ads sold. To build that engagement, social media platforms amplify content that gets attention. That can be cat videos or vacation pictures, but too often it means content that's incendiary, contains conspiracy theories or violence. Algorithm algorithms and your platforms can actively funnel users from the mainstream to the fringe, subjecting users to more extreme content, all to maintain user engagement. This is a fundamental flaw in your business model that mere warning labels on posts, temporary suspension of some accounts, and even content moderation cannot address. And your company's insatiable desire to maintain user engagement will continue to give such content a safe haven if doing so improves your bottom line. I'd like to ask my first question of all the witnesses. Each of you acknowledge that your company has profited off harmful misinformation, conspiracy theories, and violent content on your platform. Just a yes or no. Starting with Mr. Dorsey, yes or no? No, that's not our business. Mr. Zuckerberg? No, Congresswoman, I don't think we profit from it. I think it hurts our service. Mr. Pinchow? Congresswoman, certainly not our intent, and we definitely do not want such content, and we have clear well, policies against it. Since you all said no, can you please provide to me in writing how you manage to avoid collecting revenue from ads either targeted by or served on such content? So I will be expecting that. There's a difference between a conversation in a living room and one being pumped out to millions of followers from discouraging voting and COVID-19 misinformation to encouraging hate crimes and violence. The harms are real and disproportionate. Do you acknowledge that such content is having especially harmful effects on minority and communities of color? Yes or no again? I don't have a lot of time, so yes or no? Mr. Dorsey. Yes. yes. Mr. Pichow. Uh, yes. Mr. Zuckerberg. Uh, yes, I think that's right. Thank you. If your financial incentives and human psychology lead to the creation of a system that promotes emotionally charged content that is often harmful, do you believe that you can address the rumors, or do you believe that you will always need to play more of a whack-a-mole on different topics? 
Mr. Zuckerberg. Uh, Congresswoman, I, I do think that we can take systemic actions that help to um, reduce a large amount of this, it, but there will always be some content that gets through those systems that we will have to react to. Mr. Dorsey? Uh, it's not our incentive, but I agree with Mark. We, you know, our, our model is to constantly iterate. We're going to miss some things and um, we'll go too far in some cases. Mr. Pinchai? Um, I, I agree largely with what Mark and Jack said. And, you know, we we terminated a lot of channels. We removed thousands of misleading uh, election videos. There are many evolving threats and we are very vigilant. Okay, more transparency and research into the AI models you use is needed. I understand that they are constantly evolving and proprietary. However, the, those obstacles must not be insurmountable. Would you agree to some type of test bed to evaluate your procedures and technology for desperate, disparate impacts? And would you welcome minimal standards set by the government? I only have 44 seconds. I'll go, you're not calling us, but we, um, yes, uh, we're, we're, we're interested in opening all this up and, and going a step further and having a protocol. I don't think that should be government driven, but it should be open and transparent that the government can look at it and understand how it works. And I agree that there, that this is an area where research would be, would be helpful. And, and I think some standards, especially, um, amongst the civil rights community would be helpful guidance for the companies. Congresswoman, we work with uh, many third parties. I just mentioned the hard collaboration we had uh, definitely would be open to conversations about minimum standards. It's an important area. Thank General, you. Time has right. expired. Uh, Chair now recognizes Mr. Dunn for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Many of the questions today deal with personal harms, but there are long-term economic and security harms to our country I'd like us to keep in mind as well. I represent Florida's second congressional district, which is proud to host a large presence of the U.S. military, including civilian support companies. One of these is Applied Research Associates, which is doing great work with our military in the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning. I agree with our nation's top national security experts on the critical importance of the United States maintaining its competitive edge in AI, and I share the concern of former Google CEO Eric Schmidt who warned just a few weeks ago of the grave consequences should we lose that edge to China. Leader Rogers led a bipartisan bill enacted last year, the American Compete Act to lay out clear AI strategy. We all recognize that China is not a good place to do business, evidenced by the fact that all of your respective main products and services are banned there. It's, uh, it's clear that the influence of the Chinese Communist Party permeates the entire corporate structure in China. Xi Jinping himself stated his goal of integrating the party's leadership into all aspects of corporate governance. Let's be clear with each other. It's impossible to do business in China without either directly or indirectly aiding the Chinese Communist Party. It's also important to state for the record that each of your business models involve collecting data from individuals who use your product and then using that data for some other purpose. Mr. Pichai. I'm deeply concerned with Google's pursuit of and investment in artificial intelligence research in China, widely reported over the last few years. First and foremost, can you assure Americans that their personal data, regardless of how you think you have de-identified it, data you collect when they use Google and which is central to your algorithms, is not used in your artificial intelligence collaboration with the Chinese government? Uh, Congressman, I want to uh, correct any misperceptions here. We do not have an AI research center in China now. We had a limited uh, presence working on open source projects, uh, primarily on open source projects and around K through 12 education, uh, a handful of employees. We don't have that anymore. Uh, compared to our peers, we don't offer our core services in China, products like search, YouTube, Gmail, et cetera. So, so uh, yeah, I'm going to have to reclaim my time because it's limited, but I want your team to follow up with me because 
I, I'm honestly somewhat skeptical of that. I think you had three centers there in China, and, and I want to know more about what they're doing and, I, and also what material they're using. And I want to be clear, I'm not just suggesting that simply doing business in a country means that you endorse all their policies. As a former businessman myself, I know the politics all too often get in the way of what we're trying to do. However, Google's own list of artificial intelligence principles states that it will not collaborate on technologies to gather or use information for surveillance, violating internationally accepted norms or contravenes widely accepted principles of international law and human rights. But we know that the Chinese Communist Party is using artificial intelligence technology to spread misinformation and suppress the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong, as well as using that technology in its genocidal crimes against the Uyghurs, including murdering them for their organ harvesting. Uh, you know, once again, can you be sure that none of the work you're doing in collaboration with China, Chinese government is not aiding them in this ability? Uh, Congressman, happy to follow up and clarify the limited work on uh, AI we undertake. It's primarily around open source projects and uh, very happy to engage and very specifically follow up on what we do. Well, I think that's great. I, and I know I'm running out of time here, but I, I ask that, that we continue this dialogue. And I think Google would be very well served by promoting greater transparency in all of its actions regarding uh, artificial intelligence in China. You know, your, your customers have a right to know about this. Uh, you know, in 2018, Diane Green, former CEO of Google Cloud, uh, noted, we believe the uses of our cloud and artificial intelligence will prove to be overwhelmingly positive for the world, but we also recognize we cannot control all downstream uses of our technology. Well, a good place to start would be to end this dangerous artificial intelligence research relationship with China. So. Um, so uh, with that, uh, Mr. Pachashi, thank you. Thank you all the members of the witness panel and uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. McEachin for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to you and uh, Chairman Pelo uh, and Chair Chairman Sikowski, thank you for convening today's hearing and for our witnesses for joining us. In July of last year, I led more than 30 of my colleagues, including several on this committee, in a letter to your companies asking what you are doing to halt the spread of climate change disinformation on your platforms. As my colleagues and I clearly expressed in our, in our letter, climate change is a real and urgent threat, and the spread of disinformation on your platforms is undermining that fact. For instance, the World Health Organization estimates that climate change causes 150,000 deaths annually, a number that will only increase in the coming years. All this begs a simple question. Why do your platforms not treat climate change disinformation with a sense of immediacy and alarm? Um, Mr. Zuckerberg, Facebook recently implemented the Climate Change Information Center, which directs users to a landing page which climate, with climate change facts from researchers and organizations. Are you able to share data on how widespread a problem climate change disinformation is on your platform and how much the Climate Change Information Center has reduced it. Sure, thanks, thanks, Congressman. Our approach to fighting misinformation, of which climate misinformation I think is a big issue, so I, I agree with your, your point here. Um, we take a, a multi-pronged approach. One is to try to um, show people authoritative information, which is what the Climate um, Information Center does. And then we also try to reduce the spread of misinformation around the rest of the service through this broad third party fact checking program that we have um, in which one of the fact checkers is, um, you know, is, is uh, specifically focused on science feedback and, and client, climate feedback type of issues. Um, overall, I'd be happy to follow up and, and share more details on, on uh, what we've seen across those, but this is certainly a, a an area that um, that I agree is extremely important and needs multiple tactics to address. Well, thank you. And it's my understanding that this climate center was modeled after your COVID-19 information center. However, different standards still apply for both organic content and paid for advertising for climate change versus COVID-19. Why does Facebook not apply the same standards of fact checking on climate change that it does on uh, COVID-19 content? 
Congressman, you're, you're right that the Climate Information Center was based off our work on the COVID Information Center and Election Information Center. Um, in terms of how we treat misinformation overall, um, we, we divide the misinformation into uh, things that could cause imminent physical harm, of which you know, COVID misinformation that uh, might lead someone to get sick or, or hurt or, or vaccine misinformation falls in the category of imminent um, physical harm, and we take down that content. And then other misinformation or things that are false, uh, but may not lead to imminent physical harm, um, we label and reduce their distribution, but leave them up. So that's the broad approach that we have, um, and that that, uh, that that sort of explains the um, some of the differences between some of the different issues and, and how we approach them. Mr. Pachi, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, sir. Um, YouTube has employed contextualization tools linking viewers to similar sources as Facebook's Climate Center. That being said, you restricted but have not removed some repeat offenders from your platform, such as Prager University, a non-accredited university producing climate change denial content. Are you not concerned that by restricting those videos and uh, by restricting those videos and not removing repeat offenders, that people who are determined to find those videos to validate their views will indeed find them and share them with others? Uh, Congressman, it's an incredibly important area. In general, in these areas, we rely on raising authoritative information, both by showing information panels, as well as raising scientific content, academic content, and journalistic content. So our algorithms rank those types of content higher for an area like uh, climate change, similar to election integrity and COVID. And, uh, you know, obviously it's an area where there, there, there is a range of uh, opinions people can express. We have clear policies, and if it's violative, we remove. Uh, if it is not violative, but if it is not deemed to be of high quality, we don't recommend the content, and that's how we approach it. And and uh, we're committed to this area. As a company, uh, you know, we lead in sustainability. Uh, we have committed to operating 24-7 on a carbon-free basis by 2030, and it's an area where we are investing significantly. Well, thank you. I've run out of time. Mr. Dorsey, I apologize to you. Perhaps we'll have an opportunity to have a conversation. Mr. Chairman, I give you my two seconds. I thank the gentleman. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Curtis for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, thank you to our witnesses. Uh, my first comment is to point out that in her 2019 presidential campaign, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Democrat, called for the breaking up of your companies. Several weeks ago in his speech at CPAC, Senator Josh Hawley, Republican, also said that big tech companies should be broken up. I don't think I need to point out the irony of Josh Hawley validating Elizabeth Warren at CPAC. There seems to be a train wreck coming. Unfortunately, the very few tools that we have in our tool bag are regulation and breaking up. Mr. Zuckerberg, I read through your terms of service, including the dense community standards document. In your terms of service, you state that you cannot control and do not take responsibility for content posted on your platform. The community standards document, which is frequently cited as why content is or is not censored, says you sometimes make content moderation decisions based off what's considered best for the public interest or public discourse. I know in your testimony, you said that companies need to earn their liability protections. That's great but that doesn't address the concerns people understandably share about your past or current views on what is or is not acceptable. How do you claim you cannot take responsibility and therefore should maintain your liability protections for content posted on your site, but at the but same time safe. state that your platform will monitor content based off what's in the public's best interest? That appears to be two-sided. Congressman, thanks. Uh, people use our services to share and, and send messages billions of times a day. And it would be impossible for us to scan or, or, or understand everything that, that was going on. And, and I don't think that our society would want us to take the steps that would be necessarily to, necessary to monitor every single thing. I think that we would think that that would infringe on our freedoms. So broadly, I think it's impossible to ask companies to take responsibility for every single piece of content that someone posts. And that I think is the wisdom of 230. At the same time, I do think that we should expect large platforms uh, to have effective systems for being able to handle, uh, broadly speaking, categories of content that are clearly illegal. So we've talked today about 
child exploitation and opioids and sex trafficking and things like that. And I think it's reasonable that uh, to expect that companies have um, systems that are broadly effective, even if they're not going to be exactly perfect, and there are still going to be some pieces of content that inevitably um, get through, just like no police department in a city is going to be able to eliminate all crime. I've got to jump in only because we're out of time. I would love to spend more time on that with you. Let me also ask you, uh, Utah is known for Silicon Slopes, our startup community. You've called for government regulation, but some view this with skepticism because larger companies tend to deal with regulation much better than small companies. If you think back to your college days, the early startup phase of Facebook, what challenges do you see for startups to compete and what cautions should Congress consider as we look at regulation that potentially could be a barrier for companies that just might be your future competition? Thanks. I think that this is a really important point whenever we're talking about regulation. And I want to be clear that the, that the recommendations that I'm making for Section 230, I would only have apply to larger platforms. I think it's really critical that a small platform, the, you know, the next um, student in a dorm room or in a garage, um, needs to have a relatively low, um, as low as possible regulatory burden in order to be able to um, to innovate and then get to the scale where they can afford to put those kind of systems in place. So I think that that's a really important um, point to make. But I think that that goes for the content discussions that we're having around 2.30. Um, it probably also applies to um, to, to the, the privacy law that I hope that Congress will pass in, in the in this year or next year to create a federal uh, U.S. privacy uh, standard. Um, and I also think that, 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 that we should be exploring proactively requiring things like data portability uh, that, that would make it easier for people to uh, take data from one service to another. Uh, thank you. I've got just a few seconds left. And Mr. Uh, Pachai, this is a little bit off topic. So I'm simply going to ask this question and submit it for the record and not ask for a response. Almost a decade ago, your company started Google Fiber. You introduced Google gig speed and free internet to all the residents of my home city, Provo, Utah. Sadly, it seems like your efforts to do this across the country were slowed down or even stopped by excessive government regulations. I'd love you to share off the record and, and um, I'll submit it for the record. Why government is making it so hard to expand internet across the country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield my time. Gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes Mr. Soto for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When television, radio, traditional newspapers, political blogs, and even private citizens spread lies, they can be sued and held liable for damages or FCC fines. But pursuant to 230, you all can't be sued. You have immunity. But it ain't 1996 anymore, is it? Meanwhile, lies are spreading like wildfire through platforms. Americans are getting hurt or killed. And the reason is your algorithms. I want you to all know I, I was held captive in the gallery during the Capitol insurrection. I was surrounded by domestic terrorists that killed the Capitol police officer, ransacked the Capitol, and almost disrupted a presidential election. And many of these domestic terrorists plotted on your platforms. I think we all understand by now this violence is real. And so this is why we're here today in the Committee of Jurisdiction with power to protect our fellow Americans. Mr. Zuckerberg had mentioned effective moderation systems. So now we know you have systems that can prevent many of these harms. Thank you for your statement supporting accountability today and even for championing support accountability in ads. So the question is, what specific changes to Section 230 do you support to ensure more accountability? Mr. Zuckerberg just mentioned categories of content that are clearly illegal. U.S. privacy standards and data portability is three standards we should be looking at. Uh, Mr. Pichai, should we be creating these standards and then holding on um, platforms accountable if they violate them under 230? Uh, Congressman, uh, first of all, there are many ways in there are many laws today which do hold us uh, liable. Uh, you know, FTC has oversight. Uh, you know, we have a uh, consent degree with the FCC, uh, COPPA, HIPAA, et cetera. And for example, areas where there are privacy laws and we have called for federal privacy legislation, but in Europe with GDPR in California, we have privacy uh, state legislation. Uh, we are bo both accountable as well as we are subject to private plaintiff uh, action uh, against these statutes. So uh, Mr. Pichai, you agree with these categories that were just allowed 
outlined by Mr. Zuckerberg. Is that correct? I definitely uh, think uh, what Mark is talking about along the lines of transparency and accountability are uh, good proposals to think through. Uh, there are various legislative proposals. Along those Mr. Dorsey, do you think we should be establishing categories of content that are clearly illegal, U.S. privacy standards and data portability, as well as uh, penalties for violation of those standards? I believe as, as we look upon 230 and um, evolutions of it, building upon it, I think uh, we need more transparency around content moderation practices, not just the policies. I think we need more robust appeals processes. And I, I think the real issue is algorithms and giving people more choice around algorithms, more transparency around algorithms. So if, if there's any one I would pick, it would be, it would be that one. It's a tough one, but it, it's the most impactful. Thank you, Mr. Dorsey. Mr. Zuckerberg, political misinformation spread rampantly, unfortunately, in Spanish in Florida's Hispanic community on Facebook in the 2020 presidential election. Even with the political ad ban, how do you think this happened? Mr. Zuckerberg. Congressman, it's, um, you know, I, I do still think that there's, that there's too much misinformation across all, all of these media that we've talked about today. Um, how did it happen? I mean, it's, you know, I, I think uh, we've talked a lot today about algorithms. I actually think a lot of this stuff happens in what we refer to as deterministic products like messaging, right? Someone sends uh, a, a text message to someone else. That's it's, There's no algorithm there determining um, whether that gets delivered. People can just send that to someone else. Um, a lot of the stuff, I think, unfortunately, was amplified on TV and in traditional news as well. Um, there was certainly some of this content on Facebook, and it's it's our responsibility to make sure that we're building effective systems that can reduce the spread of that. Um, I, I think a lot of those systems performed well during this election cycle, but there, it's an iterative process, and there are always going to be new things that we that we will need to do to keep up with the different threats that we face. Mr. Zuckerberg, will you commit to boosting Spanish language moderators and systems on Facebook, especially during election season, to help prevent this from happening again in Spanish language? Uh, Congressman, this is already something that we focus on. We we already beefed up and and added um, you know more capacity to Spanish language fact checking and Spanish language authoritative information resources, um, and uh, that's certainly something that we hope to build on in the future. So I, the, the answer to your question is yes. Gentlemen's time is expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. Lesko for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses. I represent constituents in the great state of Arizona, and most of my constituents just want to be treated fairly, equitably, impartially, and they want to make sure that their private information stays private. Um, Mr. Pachai, does Wikipedia influence Google's search results? Um, we, we do index and uh, Wikipedia is in our index and for certain queries, if, Wikipedia, if an answer from Wikipedia uh, rises to the top of our ranking, yes, we do, we do rely on it. Thank you. Mr. Dorsey, did you personally decide to ban President Trump from your platform? We have a, we have a process that we go through to, to get there and, and that came after a warning. And did you make the final decision? Ultimately, I have final responsibility. Thank you. And Mr. Pachai, in July 2018, the Wall Street Journal reported that Google let hundreds of outside developers scan the inboxes of millions of Gmail users. Mr. Chipai, Ch uh, Pachai, do Google employees review and analyze Gmail users' content? Congresswoman, I mean, we take privacy uh, very seriously. Uh, we, we don't use the data from Gmail for uh, advertising and our employees generally do not access it, only in narrow cases, either uh, to troubleshoot with the right consent and permissions. Uh, you know, uh, there are provisions uh, with enough uh, checks and balances. So I think what you're saying is occasionally your Google employees do uh, review and analyze. I have another question regarding that. Do, does Google share uh, Gmail users' emails or analysis of your emails with third parties? 
we do not sell any data. I think what you're referring to is users could give API access uh, to third party developers. For example, there were applications which could give travel related information. So this is a user choice and it's an API on top of the platforms. We have done numerous steps to make sure users have to uh, go through multiple steps before they would give consent to a third party. Um, and so I've looked through your Google privacy statements and user content, and I still have concerns um, about that. I'm very concerned. I have Gmail accounts just like millions of people, and I don't know if you're looking at them. I don't know who's looking at them. I don't know who's sharing them. I don't know what you're doing with them. If it I, makes me concerned. Uh, um, Mr. Uh, I if only I have clarify a, one thing I said there. Only yeah. if a user asks us to troubleshoot an account, with that user permission, but we do not uh, look into uh, users' email contents, and we do not share the contents with anyone else without the users asking us to do so. Uh, however, the Wall Street Journal had this article saying that hundreds of developers were reviewing the email contents. So I have to move on to another question because I only have a short time. Uh, Mr. Dorsey, Twitter denied the Center for Immigration Studies the ability to promote four tweets that contained the phrases illegal alien and criminal alien, even though those are the correct legal terms. Mr. Dorsey, if there is a warning posted related to a border threat, how will Twitter algorithms react to the use of the word illegal versus undocumented? Well, it's not, it's not about our algorithms. It's um, uh, interpretation against our policy and if there's violations, but we can follow up with you on how we'd handle situations like that. Well, it, you know, this is the legal term is illegal alien. That is in law, the legal term. So I don't understand why you would not allow that. That is the legal factual term. And with that, uh, I'm going to ask another question. Um, Mr. Zuckerberg, this has been brought up before. Do you believe that your platform harms children? Uh, Congresswoman, I, I, I don't believe so. Um, this is something that we study and we care a lot about. Designing products that improve people's well-being is very important to us. And what our products do is help people stay connected to people they care about, which I think is is one of the most fundamental and important human things that we do, whether that's um, for teens um, or for, for people who are older than that. And, and again, our policies on, on the main apps that we offer um, generally prohibit people under the age of 13 from using the services. General Lady's time has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. O'Halloran for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I am enlightened. Uh, thank you to the panel today. I'm enlightened by what I've heard today. Uh, three of the most uh, knowledgeable business people in the world uh, with beautiful profit centers, uh, business models, uh, a sense of the future direction that your companies want to go in, uh, standards uh, that are in many cases uh, reliable, but others not very much so, uh, and a, a very big concern by the Congress of the United States on the direction you want to go in uh, versus what's good for our nation in total. Uh, Mr. Zuckerman, uh, last October, uh, Facebook announced uh, it removed a network of 202 accounts, 54 pages, and 76 Instagram accounts for violating your coordinated um, in a in a inappropriate behavior uh, policy. Really, the Forge Net, really Forge Network uh, was based in Arizona and ran its disinformation operation from 2018 to 2020 by creating fake accounts and, and co commenting on our other people's content about the 2018 midterm election, the 2020 presidential election, COVID-19 and criticism for and, and praise of creation certain political parties and presidential candidates. Sadly, Facebook only acted after 
a Washington Post investigation reported its findings. While your testimony states since 2017, Facebook has removed over 100 networks of accounts for engaging in coordinated inauthenticated behavior. Where did Facebook fail by not finding this network over a course of a number of years? Well, Congressman, we have a team of, you know, I think it's more than 300 people who work on counterterrorism at this point, and um, and and basically trying to work with law enforcement and and across the 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 industry to to basically find these um, networks of of fake accounts and, and authentic accounts that are trying to spread behavior. And I think we've gotten a lot more effective at this. It's, um, you know, I, I I can't say that we catch every single one. Um, but, but certainly I think we've gotten a lot more effective, including, you know, just this week, we announced that we took down a, a network of, of Chinese hackers that were targeting Uyghur activists, um, outside of China. So uh, we've gotten more sophisticated at this. Um, sometimes when we start finding a lead, we, um, we need to wait to kind of see the full extent of the network so we can take down the whole network. So that's a, a trade-off that, you know, sometimes we, um, we were able to discuss with law enforcement and other times not in terms of how we do enforcement. But, but overall, I think um, this effort has gotten a lot more sophisticated over the last four years. So you're happy with the amount of personnel that you have working on these issues? Congressman, I think we have one of the leading teams in this area. You know, we went from more than are you happy years with ago. The question was, are you happy with the amount of people you have working and the capacity that you have to take care of these issues? Uh, Congressman, I, I think that the team is is well staffed um, and and well funded. We spend billions of dollars a year on on these kind of content and integrity and security issues across the company. Um, so I think that that is appropriate uh, to meet the challenge. And there are always things that we're going to want to do to improve the tactics of of how we find this. And a lot of that over the last several years has been increasing the work that we do with law enforcement and the and the intelligence community. I'm going to move on to another question, Mr. Zuckerman. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and and I, I do want to say that, uh, again, you're a bright, intelligent CEO. You know in advance what you want. Your algorithms are created by your company and, and the other companies. You have control over their algorithms. And so the idea that, that you kind of have to work maybe in this direction, uh, Mr. Zuckerman, Facebook's mo most recent community standards enforcement report states that 2.5 million pieces of content related to suicide and self-injury were removed in the fourth quarter of 2020 due to uh, increased review, reviewer capacity. You can do this if you want to do all this stuff. Uh, very briefly explain what policies Facebook put in place to increase reviewer capacity, not just on that issue, but across the perspective, how much over time has this occurred that you continue to increase reviewer capacity? Sure, Congressman. The, the biggest thing that we've done is automated a lot of this by building AI tools to identify some of this. So you know, now, you know, for example, more than 95% of the hate speech that we take down is, is done by an AI and not by a person. Um, you know, I think it's 98 or 99% of the terrorist content that we take down is, is identified by an AI and not a person. And you mentioned the suicide um, content as well, which you know, I think a high 90s percent is identified by AI. Um, rather Mr. Than Zuckerman, I'm over my time. I want to thank the chair. And I also want to state very briefly uh, that you have a lot of work to do and you and your, your other cohorts on this panel. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Chair recognizes Mr. Pence for five minutes. Thank you, Chairs Doyle and Schakowsky, and Ranking Members Lada and Bilirakis for holding this joint subcommittee hearing. And thank you to the witnesses for appearing before us today. The extent to which your platforms engulf our lives is reminiscent to the all-encompassing entities we've seen over the past century. In the early 1900s, Standard Oil had a monopoly over 90% of our country's refining business. By the 1970s, if you used a telephone, it was going to be Ma Bell system. In each instant, you could choose not to use either product, but participation in society demanded that you use both. In a similar sense, it is difficult, if not impossible, to participate in society today 
without coming across your platforms and using them. We could choose not to use them, but like oil and telecommunications, it's considered essential and so many other people do use them. Even the government has become an equal contributor. Each member of Congress and every senator is all but required to use your platforms to communicate with their constituents while we're in Washington, D.C. I know you understand that your platforms have a responsibility to act in good faith for Hoosiers and all Americans. Unfortunately, regularly, my Facebook and Twitter accounts, like many of my peers and other people I know, are littered with hateful, nasty arguments between constituents that stand in complete opposition to the ideas of civil discourse that your platforms claim to uphold and that you've referenced today. I'm sure you are aware that official government accounts have restrictions that significantly limit our ability to maintain a platform that is a productive resource of information to the public. They have essentially become a micro town hall without a moderator on social media. I agree with all your testimonies that a trust deficit has been growing over the past several years. And as some of you have uh, suggested, uh, we need to do something about it now. The way in which you manage your platforms in an inconsistent manner, however, has deepened this mistrust and devolves the public conversation. My constituents in Southeast Indiana have told me they are increasingly mistrustful of your platforms given how you selectively enforce your policies. Here's just a few examples of how this has occurred. Members of the Chinese Communist Party have verified Twitter accounts to regularly peddle false and misleading claims surrounding the human rights violations we know are occurring in Northern China. Twitter gives the Supreme Leader of Iran a megaphone to proclaim derogatory statements endorsing violence against the US and Western culture. Twitter accounts associated with the Supreme Leader have called Israel a cancerous tumor and call for the eradication of the Zionist regime. This happens as he also bans the service for his own people to restrict their free expression. Mr. Dorsey, clearly you need to do more to address content that violates your policies. I have two questions for you. Why is the Chinese Communist Party allowed to continue the use of your platform after pub pushing propaganda to cover up human rights abuses against Muslims in Northern China? And two, why does the Supreme Leader of Iran still have a platform to make threats against Israel and America? Um, so, so first and foremost, we, we do label those um, Chinese accounts so that people have context as to where they're coming from. That's on every single tweet. Um, so people understand the, the source. We think that's important. We are reviewing our world leaders policy. Um, we're actually taking public comment review right now. Um, so we're enabling anyone to give us feedback on how. It's if I may interrupt you quickly, Mr. Dorsey, on, on that very point, you know, uh, Iran has been supporting, supporting Hezbollah and it's not just saber rattling as, as you've made the statement or your company has made the statement. They have uh, done serious damage to whole countries and people. And as I served in the military, uh, they, they killed hundreds of Marines many years ago. So I don't know what you have to study about this. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes Ms. Rice for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dorsey, what is winning, yes or no, on your Twitter account poll? Yes. Hmm. Your multitasking skills are quite impressive. Um, in December of 2020, the House Committee on Veterans Affairs released a report entitled Hijacking Our Heroes, Exploiting Veterans Through Disinformation on Social Media. I ask unanimous content, Mr. Consent, Mr. Chairman, that this report be submitted for the record. So ordered. 
Thank you. I bring up the report today because uh, it's very disturbed, deeply disturbing, um, the involvement of our veterans and military service members in the violence that took place on January 6th. It's estimated that one in five people charged in connection with the attack have served or are currently serving in the U.S. military. It should come as no surprise to those testifying today that for years, nefarious actors have learned how to harness the algorithms on all of your platforms to introduce content to veterans and military service members that they did not actively seek out for themselves. Veterans and military service members are particularly targeted by malicious actors online in order to misappropriate their voices, authority, and credibility for the dissemination of political propaganda. We have to do better for those who have served our country. Mr. Zuckerberg, do you believe that veterans hold a special status in our communities and have military training, making them prime targets for domestic terrorists and our adversaries seeking to foment insurrection? Uh, Congresswoman, I, I certainly believe that veterans hold a special place in our in our society. I, I haven't seen you. much did research. You see on the national, did you see on the National Mall and at the Capitol, there were rioters who arrived in combat gear who were armed with tactical equipment. Did you see those images? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Have you personally talked to the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, IAVA, about disinformation campaigns targeting veterans? No, Congresswoman, I have not personally, although our, our team certainly is, is in contact with, with a number of these groups as we set up our policies. Have, have you talked to the Vietnam Veterans of America about disinformation campaigns targeting veterans? Uh, Congresswoman, I can get back to you on whether our team has, has uh, consulted with them specifically, but broadly Please when our do. teams- Please do. Can you believe that veterans and military service members are just like other Americans in that they are susceptible to the impulses in human psychology that Facebook exploits to drive engagement? Do you believe that they are susceptible oh. in that way? Yes or no? Congresswoman, right? there's, there's a lot in, in, in your characterization there that I disagree with. Um, no, no, so the but, question of do you, do you think they're susceptible to that kind of um, information coming at them? Yes or no? Uh, Congresswoman, I, I believe that, that, that- Okay, so given your answers, I'm not convinced that you have the appropriate resources devoted to the problem of mitigating the real world effects of content that is designed to mislead and radicalize your users, especially those who are veterans and military service members. Would you support legislation that would require you to create an Office of Veterans Affairs that reports to the CEO and works with outside veteran service organizations to ensure our enemies don't gain ground trying to radicalize our um, brave men and women who serve in our military. Would you support that le legislation? Uh, Congresswoman, I think the details matter a lot. So I, I would be happy to follow up with you or have our team follow up with your team to discuss this. But, it, but in will, general, I, I do think that- I up on that, Mr. Zuckerberg. It's just a broad stroke. Do you believe that you could find your way to support legislation that would have as its goal the protection of our military active duty and veterans? I think in well, principle, right. I think something like that could, could certainly make sense. So um, I wrote to you, Mr. Zuckerberg, last month requesting information about Facebook's efforts to curb disinformation campaigns that specifically targeted American service members and veterans. Um, I'm just curious if you know how many public groups with the word veteran or public pages with the word veteran did you remove from your platform after January 6th in association with misinformation about the 2020 election or the attack on the Capitol? Congresswoman, I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but I'd be happy to get back to you with that. Thank you, thank you. I We believe that you should be tracking that information. Your platform was in fact a crime scene after January 6th, and we need that information and data to understand how the attack happened. I wanna thank all three of you for coming here today and spending so much time with us. I yield back, Mr. Chairman, thank you. General lady yields back. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Armstrong for five minutes. Is Mr. Armstrong here? Ah, you need to you need to unmute, Kelly. All right, sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Thank you. No other industry receives such bipartisan scrutiny. 
disinformation, content moderation, deep platforming, antitrust, privacy, and the list continues to grow. We discuss these things too often in isolation, but they are all related. And it starts with the fact that your users aren't your customers, they are the product. More specifically, the data that you collect from your users is the product. You are incentivized to collect and monetize user data for behavior advertising. This results in the collection of even more user data. And data is, data is unique as a business asset. It doesn't deplete. Data is perpetual and reinforcing. Data begets more data. Massive data collection expands your market share, which harms competition. That's why censorship is so concerning to all of us. Your platforms have a stranglehold on the, on the flow of modern communication. And I think we absolutely have to resist the urge of content moderation and censorship. In 1927, Justice, Brand, or 1927, Justice Brandeis wrote, the remedy to apply to, is more speech, not enforced silence. I think that statement still holds true today. Yet your platforms don't simply silence certain speech. Your algorithms are designed to reinforce existing predispos predispositions because you profit by keeping users locked into what they already enjoy. This leads to information silos, misinformation, extremism on both sides, and even more data collection, which, which repeats the cycle. Mr. Pichai, you testified before the House Judiciary Committee last year, and at that hearing, I raised several examples of Google's consolidation of the ad, ad tech stack. Your answers largely reiterated the privacy justifications, which I understand and support. However, my question was whether Google's consolidation of both the buy and sell sides of digital advertising would further harm competition. Since then, I have reviewed Google's privacy sandbox and the Flox proposal, which is an alternative group identifier to replace third party cookies. Again, I understand and I appreciate the privacy justification. But, and this is my question, how will these actions not further entrench Google's digital advertising market share and harm competition? Uh, Congressman, uh, as you rightfully point out, privacy is really important and we are trying to get that correct. Users are giving clear feedback in terms of the direction they would like to take. Advertising allows us to provide services to many people who wouldn't otherwise be able to use services and, and we are trying to provide relevant ads protecting their privacy. And that's what Flock is working on. We will- I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, oh, I'm gonna move on because I understand the privacy. I, I understand the privacy. And I understand the rationale of eliminating individual level tracking in favor of cohorts and the potential privacy benefits of user data at the, at, in Chrome at the device level. But this, but this is still eliminating competitors access to user data at a time when you already control 60% of the browser market. I have real concerns that Flox will incentivize more first party data collection, which will not actually benefit user privacy. Instead of spreading it amongst a lot of different companies, it will just all be, it'll all be with you. And so I guess my point is Congress needs to, to conduct careful oversight as the privacy sandbox and flocks are introduced. And we need to ensure that the user privacy increases and that competition is not stifled further. But I do have one question and it's important. I'm gonna ask all three of you. Uh, when we're conducting co competition analysis in the tech industry, should non-price factors like privacy be considered? And I'll start with you, Mr. Pichai. Uh, I think so. I think uh, privacy is very important. And uh, you know we've called for comprehensive federal privacy legislation. And to clarify, Google or Google doesn't get any access to flock data, which other, I mean, it is protected, uh, you know, and then we will publish more papers on it. I, I, and I understand completely, but you're forcing, I, I mean, you're forcing advertisers into the ad stack. I mean, that's, I mean, it's, I, I don't discount it. It increases privacy. That's, not, I think this is a real problem because I think they're in contact, conflict with each other. But Mr. Dorsey, do you think when we're conducting competition analysis in the tech industry, non-price factors should be considered? Um, not sure exactly what you mean, but open to a further discussion on it. All right, how about you, Mr. Zuckerberg? Yes, Congressman. I mean, my understanding is that the law already includes the quality of products in addition to price. And I will just say, I appreciate you talking about the difference between big platforms and small platforms, because I think when in our history of trying to regulate big companies, 
Uh, Congress has always done a really good job at harming the smaller companies worst. And with my last six seconds, because this isn't the appropriate hearing, but I'm going to ask, please all do a better job of making sure artists get paid for their work on your platforms. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. VC for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's often been said that lies travel faster than truth. And we've seen that play out with devastating consequences on social media platforms today. Uh, this concerns me greatly, not just as a father or a lawmaker, but as someone uh, ready to see the past divisions that have dominated our country for the past several years uh, and, and, and really decades, really. Uh, but it's hard to see how this can change uh, when the CEOs of the largest social media platforms repeatedly say they will fix their ways only to keep spreading harmful lies and misinformation. I want to give you an example. Uh, last August here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the North Texas Poison Control Center felt the need to warn people against ingesting bleach or other disinfecting products as a cure uh, to prevent COVID-19. Uh, despite uh, efforts of your companies to take down such harmful uh, myths or disinformation calls uh, to the North Texas Poison Control Center about disinfectant, uh, uh, ingestion rates were much higher than usual, and statewide calls about bleach products were up over 70% compared to the year before. Uh, the North Texas Poison uh, Center pointed out largely to pointed this out largely to misinformation. Uh, online as the cause for these increases. Uh, and as we know, in the lead up to last elections, black communities were specifically targeted for disinformation campaigns designed to suppress the vote, uh, especially in battleground states. And right now there are sites up that are discouraging black people from getting the COVID-19 vaccination. I know a lady that was put in Facebook jail for 30 days because all she did was repost one of the faulty posts uh, one, saying, Black folks, black folks aren't falling for this BS, and she was put in Facebook jail for 30 days. Uh, now, now uh, even if these posts were eventually taken down or otherwise labeled as false, uh, uh, again, uh, lies travel uh, a lot faster uh, than, than truths. Uh, your companies have been largely flat-footed when it comes to getting out ahead of these issues, uh, and it's time for something to change. Uh, that's why I'm exploring legislation that would establish an independent organization of researchers and computer scientists who could help identify and warn about misinformation trends before they become viral. Uh, this early warning system would help social media sites, the public, and law enforcement so that when dangerous conspiracies or disinformation is spreading, they can be on alert and hopefully stop and hopefully slow its effect. Mr. Zuckerberg, would you support legislation that would alert all Facebook or Instagram users of harmful disinformation and conspiracy theories spreading across your platforms? Uh, Congressman, I think we need to look into that in, in, in more detail to understand the nuances. But I, in general, I, I agree that it's our responsibility to build systems that can help slow the spread of this kind of misinformation. And that's why we've taken all the steps that I've outlined today from building in unprecedented independent fact-checking program to taking down content that could cause imminent physical harm to the uh, work in the COVID information center and the voting information center and the climate information center to promote authoritative information across our services. So I, I, uh, I certainly think that there's a lot to do here. Mr. Dorsey, would you support legislation for an early warning system across Twitter? I'd be open to reviewing the details. I just don't think it'll be effective. Um, and uh, it'll it'll be very much whack-a-mole. I, I, I think the, the more important thing is to, as I said in my open remarks, like get much more of an open standard and protocol um, that everyone can have access to and review. Uh, and Mr. Pachai, uh, for Google and YouTube, as, and, and, and I have a 14-year-old at home that watches YouTube, what about uh, you for, uh, for those platforms? We already today in many of these areas, we show proactively information panels. So for example, on COVID, we showed a lot of information from CDC and other experts, and we had uh, views of over 400 billion. And so, uh, you know, conceptually showing proactive information, uh, including information panels, uh, I think I think makes sense to me. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. I appreciate uh, uh, the time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm just, I'm worried. I, I think that, 
that uh, that we need to act quickly and that uh, we're running out of time and that we need these companies to take uh, uh, affirmative action on addressing some of these issues. I yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now yields five minutes to Ms. Craig. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Zuckerberg, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. As co-chair of the LGBT, LGBTQ Equality Caucus in the U.S. Congress, I'd like to ask you a few questions about an incident that occurred several weeks ago now. And I would appreciate uh, a simple yes or no answer. Uh, most of these have absolutely no room for nuance. These aren't trick questions. I'd just like to clarify a few facts. So on February the 25th, Facebook took down a video posted by my colleague, Representative Marie Newman, in which she places the transgender flag outside her office. Is that correct to your knowledge? Yes or no? Uh, Congresswoman, I'm, I'm not aware of this. You're not aware of this? No. Well, the, 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 the answer is yes, Facebook uh, took her video down. Uh, according to Rep Representative Newman, the reason Facebook gave for taking down the video was that it violated Facebook's community standards on hate speech and inferiority. Does that seem right to you, uh, that if someone put up a trans flag and took a video of it and posted it on your platform, uh, that it should be put down? Uh, yes, Congresswoman, no, that doesn't seem that doesn't seem right to me, but I would need to understand the specifics of the case in, in more details. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, the answer is no, it's absolutely not right. Meanwhile, across the hall, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene from Georgia posted a video to Facebook. Her video showed her putting up a transphobic sign so that Representative Newman, the mother of a trans child, could quote, Look at it every time she opens her door, close quote. Facebook allowed Representative Green's video to remain online. Is that right? Yes or no? Congresswoman, I'm not aware of the specifics, but as I've said a number of times today, we do make mistakes, unfortunately, in, in our content moderation, and, and we hope to uh, fix them as quickly as possible. Reclaiming my time, um, reclaiming my time, the answer was yes. Representative Green's video was allowed to remain online. Representative Newman reached out to Facebook and a few hours later, her video was restored with a perfunctory apology, but Representative Green's video was never taken down. I'm not even gonna ask you if I'm getting that right as I was because uh, you obviously don't know. Uh, are you aware that Facebook has repeatedly flagged the transgender flag as hate speech and that trans positive content ends up being taken down while transphobic content like Representative Green's video is not taken down and is often shared widely? Yes or no? Uh, Congresswoman, I'm not aware of that specifically, but this is an, an instance of a, of a broader challenge in identifying hate speech, which is that there's often a very nuanced difference between someone uh, saying something that's racist I'm, versus saying something to denounce something that someone else said that was racist. And yeah, we yeah. need to build systems that handle this content in more than 150 languages around the world. And and we need to do it quickly. And unfortunately, there there are some mistakes in, in trying to um, to, trying to, to do this quickly and, and effectively. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, I'm going to give you your nuance uh, this uh, one time. Uh, as it exists today, do you think your company is going to get these content moderation decisions right on the first try eventually? Congresswoman, if, if what you're asking is, are we ever going to be perfect? The answer is no. I think that there will always be some mistakes, but I think we will get increasingly accurate over time. So, for example, a few years back, Mr. we Zuckerberg, identified about I, I, I only have a couple of minutes or one minute left, so I'm going to continue here. As it's been mentioned repeatedly throughout today, we just don't have faith that your companies have the proper incentives to proactively contemplate and address basic human rights. With that in mind, would you support legislation requiring social media companies to have an office of civil rights reporting to the CEO, and that would mean you would have to reconsider your corporate structure, uh, including the civil rights and human rights of tran the trans community? Congresswoman, we took the unprecedented step of hiring a VP of civil rights, and I think we're one of the only companies that has actually done something similar to what you're to what you're saying. 
Well, I, I, I hope that, uh, that you do better then, because this example I'm giving you was completely unacceptable. Um, this panel has done something uh, truly rare in Washington these days. It's united Democrats and Republicans. Your industry cannot be trusted to regulate itself. And with that, I yield back. General Lady yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, Ms. Trahan for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to turn the focus back to our children. You know, my husband and I have five. Our, our, our oldest is 27, our youngest is six. And over the years, I've noticed how technology has been increasingly designed to capture their attention. The more time my first grader spends scrolling through an app, the less time she is playing outside or enjoying face-to-face -face interactions with us. Google and Facebook are no, not only doing a poor job of keeping our children under 13 off of YouTube and Instagram, as my colleagues have already mentioned today, but you are actively onboarding our children onto your ecosystems with apps like YouTube Kids, Facebook Messenger Kids, and now we're hearing Instagram for kids. These applications introduce our children to social media far too early and include manipulative design features intended to keep them hooked. Mr. Pichai, when a child finishes a video on YouTube or YouTube Kids, does the next video automatically play by default? And I think this one is a yes or no. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, Congresswoman, I have children too. I worry about the time they spend online and I agree with you, it's an important issue. Yes. We right. design the YouTube. Play, the autoplay function by default, that's a yes. On the main app, uh, it yeah. is there, and for each video, there's an easy on-off toggle. Users yeah. have preferences. But the, def the default setting is yes. Um, when a user who is predicted to be a teen is watching a YouTube video, are the number of likes displayed by default? Yes or no, please. Uh, on all videos, I think we do have, uh, across yeah. all videos, we have. Great. And Mr. Zuckerberg, Will the recently uh, reported Instagram app for kids have endless scroll enabled, yes or no? Sorry, uh, Congresswoman, we, we are not done finalizing what the app is gonna be. I think we're actually still pretty early in designing this, but you know, I, I, I just wanna say that- are you, not, are you not sure or you're not sharing features? Um, because, or, uh, and look, another feature of concern is the filter that, adds an unnatural but perfect glow for my 10-year-old to apply to her face. Is that feature going to be part of Instagram for kids? Congresswoman, I, I don't know. I haven't discussed this with the team yet. Well, um, you know, I, uh, look, I please expect my office and many others to follow up. Given what we know about Instagram's impact on teen mental health, we, you know, we're all very concerned about our our younger children. And, you know, just, uh, I just want to speak mother to father for a moment, fathers, uh, because leading experts all acknowledge that social media sites pose risks to young people, inappropriate content, oversharing of personal information, cyberbullying, deceptive advertising, the list goes on. And those risks are exacerbated with more time uh, children spend in these apps. Now, Mr. Pichai, you mentioned that you have children uh, and that I've also read you limit their screen time. Uh, what do you say when one of your children doesn't want to put their phone down? Uh, Congressman, uh, the struggle is the same, uh, particularly through COVID. Uh, it's, been, it's been hard to moderate it. And I do take advantage of the parental controls and the digital well-being tools. We can limit the time on their apps. And so we have provisions in place. Uh, I don't mean I don't mean to cut you off, Mr. Pichai, you know, but the last thing overworked parents need right now, especially right now, are more complex to do's, which is what parental controls are. I mean, they need child centric design by default. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, I understand your children are younger, but when they start using social media, what will you say when they're craving their tablet over spending time face to face with you or with friends? Well, Congresswoman, we haven't gotten to that point yet, but we're designing all of these tools. We designed Messenger Kids that the parents are in control. I think we've proven that that can be a good and safe experience. And I think that was one of the things that that made us think that uh, we should consider doing this for Instagram as well by having it so that um, we have a parent controlled experience um, 
And as you Sir, say, child-centric uh, experience I'm, for people I'm under the age of 13. I'm, I am going to reclaim my time only because connecting with others uh, is one thing. Adding filters, no breaks for uh, for kids to take, um, and you know, manipulating the design of these apps for our children is is another. Look, this committee is ready to legislate to protect our children from your ambition. You know, what we're having a hard time reconciling is that while you're publicly calling for regulation, which by the way comes off as incredibly decent and noble, you're plotting your next frontier of growth, which deviously targets our young children and which you all take great stri great strides with infinite infinitely more resources in protecting your own children. This playbook is familiar. As some of my colleagues have already pointed out, it's the same tactic we saw from alcohol companies and big tobacco. Start them young and bank on them never leaving, or at least never being able to. But these are our children, and their health and well being deserve to take priority over your profits. General Thank Lady's time has expired. Chair now recognizes uh, Ms. Fletcher for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Doyle, and thanks to you and Chairwoman Schakowsky and Ranking Members Latta and Villarakis for holding this hearing today. I agree with my colleagues. There's a broad consensus on a range of issues, and I appreciate the discussion. As we've discussed extensively today, one of the big challenges of this rise of dangerous disinformation is that it denies us a basic set of shared facts to enable informed debate like what we are having here today. Um, and it's absolutely vital that we take charge and that we uh, address this. You know, what we've seen is that countries whose interests are not aligned with ours, extremist organizations and others have used online social media platforms to engage and to amplify extremist content and disinformation from the COVID-19 pandemic to the January 6th insurrection, both of which we've talked about extensively today. You know, we've seen that the real world cost of this unchecked spread of disinformation is in lives. And like my colleagues, I worry that the structure of many social media companies, including those we have before us today, prioritize engagement, including engagement with provocative or extremist content over responsible corporate citizenship. So you know, one of my greatest concerns regarding how extremist content and disinformation is allowed to spread on your platforms is the lack of data transparency when it comes to independent analysis. You know, everyone has claimed they have an internal system, that it's about the systems, that you need good systems to remove and delete disinformation and extremist content, but we have no way to verify how effective those systems are. And that's a, a huge part of the challenge before us. And I think we all would agree that we need data and information to make good policy and to write good legislation, which will be coming out of this committee. So that, that brings me to a follow-up on um, my colleague, Ms. Rice's questions about data. As she mentioned, and it's my understanding that all three of your platforms chose to remove content that was posted regarding the Capitol insurrection on January 6th. And I think we can all understand some of the reasons for that, but as a result, it's unavailable to researchers and to Congress. So my question for each of you is, will you commit to sharing the removed content with Congress to inform our investigation of the events of January 6th and also of the issues before us today about how to respond to extremist and dangerous content online. And I'll, I'll start with Mr. Zuckerberg. Thanks, Congresswoman. When we take down content that might be connected to a crime, I think we, we do, um, as a standard practice, try to maintain that so we can um, share with law enforcement if necessary. And, and I'm, I'm sure our team can follow up to discuss that with you as well. Sure, I appreciate that. And I understand that you have a legal obligation to cooperate with authorities and law enforcement in these cases. And I think that, um, you know, what I'm talking about is, is also sharing it with us in Congress. And I appreciate um, I appreciate your response there. Mr. Dorsey. We would like to do this, actually. Um, we've we've been thinking about a program for researchers to get access to actions that we had to take. Um, but all of this is subject to local laws, of course. Well, and that may be something that we can help craft here. So I think that, you know, it is consistently something we've heard from researchers as well um, is, is a real area of challenge and not having the data. So I appreciate that. And uh, Mr. Pichai, do you also agree? Oh, Congresswoman, sorry, I was muted. Uh, we are working with law enforcement and happy to connect with your office and, uh, you know, we cooperate as allowed by law uh, while balancing the privacy of the people involved. 
Well, thank you. So I, I appreciate all of your willingness to uh, to work with us and to assist Congress in addressing this attack on, on our capital and, and on our country. Another uh, idea that I would like to touch base with you on in the time I have left, uh, just over a minute, is the difference we see in how your platforms handle foreign extremist content versus domestic content. And by all accounts, your platforms do a better job of combating posts and information from foreign terrorist organizations or FTOs like ISIS or Al Qaeda. Um, and others where the posts are automatically removed, depending on keywords and phrases, um, et cetera. But FTOs are designated by the State Department through rigorous criteria to identify groups that wish to come, cause harm to Americans. Currently, there's no legal mechanism or definition for doing the same for domestic terror and hate groups. Would a federal standard for defining a domestic terror organization similar to FTOs help your platforms better track and remove harmful content from your sites? Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg? Congresswoman, I'm not sure. I think in, in domestically, we do classify a number of white supremacist organizations and you know, militias and conspiracy networks like QAnon um, as the, the same level of problematic as, 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 um, as, as some of these other organizations that are able to take decisive action. I think where this ends up being more complicated I, is where I hate the to cut content you off, but I'm going to run out of time. So your answer was, I'm not sure. Uh, can I just get a quick yes or no from Mr. Dorsey and Mr. Pichai? Yes, and then we'll very quickly, because your time has expired. Oh. Just very quickly. We, we need to evaluate it. We need to understand what that means. I think as, as domestic agencies focus on it, I think we are happy to work and uh, cooperate there. Okay, well, gentlemen, thank you very much, Mr. Expired. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, it's my understanding we have, let's see, eight members who are requesting to wave on for the hearing. I believe we have uh, uh, given all members of the subcommittees uh, their opportunity to speak. So we'll now start to recognize uh, the members waving on. And first on the list here, I see Mr. Burgess. Doc Burgess, are you with us? Yeah, I am. Good. Okay. You're Sorry, recognized. Find my cursor. Th thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to our to our witnesses for spending so much time with us. And this is clearly a very important issue to every member of this committee, uh, regardless of which political party they identify with. And I, I guess, Mr. Zuckerberg, let me just ask you a question because it strikes me, listening to your answers to both our colleague Jeff Duncan and our colleague Angie Craig both coming at uh, the issue from, from different directions, but uh, the concern is that there was, uh, there was the exercise of, of editorial authority over the postings that were made uh, on, on, on your website. Is that a fair assessment? Congressman, I'm not sure what you mean, but I think content moderation and enforcing standards, I, I don't think that that's the same kind of editorial judgment that, for example, a newspaper oh, makes yeah. when writing a post. Yeah, but maybe it is because Mr. Duncan eloquently pointed out there was restriction of conservative speech and uh, our colleague Angie Craig eloquently pointed out how there was restriction of, of trans affirming speech. So that strikes me that we're getting awfully close to the line of exercising editorial discretion. Uh, and forgive me for thinking that way, but if if that is, and, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, it does call into question then the immunity provided under section 230, maybe it is not uh, the problem with the, the, the law itself, section 230, maybe the problem is that the mission has changed in in your organization and other organizations. Congressman, I'm not sure what you what you mean, but we have clear standards against things like terrorist content, child exploitation, incitement of violence, intellectual pop property violations, pornography, things that I would imagine all, that you agree with. And all, spell, we all, spelled out, all spelled out in the plain language of Section 230. And, but again, you're putting restrictions on conservative speech. Mr. Duncan eloquently pointed out how that is occurring. Angie Craig eloquently pointed out how you're putting restrictions on trans affirming speech. None of those fall into any of the other categories that you're describing. So to the, uh, just to the casual observer, it appears that you're exercising editorial authority. And as such, maybe you should be regulated as a publisher, as opposed to simply someone who is carrying 
who is indifferent to the content that they're carrying. Congressman, I think one of the virtues of Section 230 is it allows uh, companies to moderate things like bullying that are not always clearly illegal content, but that I think you and I would probably agree are harmful um, and, and, and bad. So I, I think it's important that companies have the ability to go beyond what is legally required. I do not think that that makes um, these internet platforms the same thing as you know a news publisher who is literally writing the content themselves. Um, you know, I, I do think we have more responsibility um, than maybe a telephone network where uh, okay. let, let me let me interrupt you in the interest of time because I did I want to pose the same question to Mr. Dorsey, Mr. Dorsey. Every presidential tweet that I read following the election had a an editorial disclaimer appended to it by by you. Uh, how does that not make you uh, someone who's exercising editorial discretion on your uh, on the content that you're carrying? Our our goal with our labels was was simply to provide connection to other data and provide context. Yeah, but you don't do that uh, routinely with with other tweets. It, it we, seemed to be a singular assignment that someone had taken on to to look at whatever the president is is publishing. We're going to put our, our our own spin on that. And that again, that strikes me as an editorial exercise. And the only reason I bring this up, and and you know, we are going to have these discussions. I recognize that smaller companies just starting out, the protection of Section 230 may be invaluable to them. But you all are no longer just starting out. You're established. You're mature companies. You exercise enormous, enormous control over the thought processes of not just an entire country, but all, literally an entire world. You are exercising editorial discretion. I do think we need to revisit Section 230 in the terms of have you now become actual publishers as opposed to simply carriers of information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Tonko for five minutes. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for allowing me to wave on. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us today. Well, there are many issues I would like to raise with you. My most pressing unresolved questions revolve around in what I saw and experienced on January 6th when I had to die for cover in the House Gallery as violent insurrectionists attempted to break down the doors and take the chamber. The rioters were breached, the cap, uh, who breached the uh, Capitol building were propelled by at least one belief that the election had been stolen from uh, former President Donald Trump. They reached the, this false and dangerous conclusion without evidence, yet somehow in massive numbers. Their assault was not disorganized or isolated, and it was not coincidence. So, Mr. Zuckerberg, you and your colleagues have downplayed the role Facebook played in helping the rioters mobilize on January 6th. In light of growing evidence that suggests otherwise, including the fact that Facebook was the most cited social media site in charging documents the Department of Justice filed against insurrectionists, do you still deny that your platform was used as a significant megaphone for the lies that fueled the insurrection? Congressman, to, to be clear, I think part of the reason why we're why our, our, our services are very cited in the charging docs is because we worked closely with law enforcement to help identify the people who were there. So I don't view that that collaboration with law enforcement should be seen as a negative reflection on our services. And as I've said a, a number of times to, to, to today, um, there was content uh, on, on our services um, from some of these folks. I think that that was problematic. But by and large, I, I also think that by putting in place um, policies banning QAnon, banning militias, um, banning other conspiracy networks, we generally made our services inhospitable to a lot of these folks. And that had the unfortunate consequence of, of, of having those folks not use Facebook and use, and use other places as well. So there's certainly more for us to do. Um, but I, I, I stand behind the work that we've done with law enforcement on this and, and the systems that we have in place. Thank you, Mr. Pikai. Uh, can you affirmatively state that YouTube did not recommend videos with stop the steal content, uh, white supremacy content, and other hate and conspiracy content that were seen by rioters at the Capitol? Uh, Congressman, we had clear policies and we were vigorously enforcing this area. Just leading up to the election, we had removed hundreds of thousands of videos and we had terminated 8,000 channels. and 
on the day of the riot, uh, we were successfully able to take down uh, inappropriate live streams. We gave precedence to journalistic organizations covering the event, and that's the content we raised up uh, on YouTube uh, that day. And uh, since then, we have been cooperating with law enforcement as well. So you're you're indicating that you did not recommend videos with Stop the Steal. We, uh, we were rigorously enforcing, we had clear policies uh, around content that undermined election integrity. Once the state certified the election on December 8th, we uh, introduced a sensitive events policy and we did take down videos which were violative. And so we've been monitoring it very closely. And thank you. And Mr. Dorsey, are you confident that the conspiracy theorists or other purveyors of electoral misinformation and stop the steal on Twitter were not recommended to others? Uh, um, I, I can't say that with confidence, but we I know we did work really hard to make sure that if we if we saw any amplification that went against the term of service, which this would, uh, we took action immediately. Um, we, we didn't have any upfront indication that this would happen, so we we had to react to it quite quickly. All right, thank you. So who and what content your platforms recommend have real world consequences and the riot caused five deaths and shook our democratic foundations. But I believe that your platforms are responsible for the for the content you promote and look forward to working with my colleagues to determine how to hold you accountable. Uh, Mr. Pekai and Google and YouTube often slip under the radar as a source of disinformation. But in the last election, bad actors used ads on Google search to scam people looking for voting information. And YouTube failed to remove videos that spread misinformation about the 2020 vote results. So, Mr. Pekai, when journalists pointed out in November that election misinformation was rampant on Google's YouTube, the company said it was allowing discussions of election processes and results. A month later, YouTube said it would remove new cont content alleging widespread voter fraud in the 2020 election. Why did YouTube wait a month to take action on election misinformation? Uh, if I could clarify here, we, we were taking down videos leading up to the election. We did, there is obviously a month from the date of election till there are due processes, court challenges, and we waited till this, you know, we consulted with CISPA and the Association of Secretaries of State. And on December 8th, when the states certify the election, uh, you know, we started enforcing newer policies on December 9th. To be very clear, we were showing information from the Associated Press, and we were proactively showing information high up in our search results to give, uh, you know, relevant information throughout, throughout this uh, election cycle. Gentlemen's time is expired. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. McKinley for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and this, this panel, you all have to be exhausted after being grilled all day long like this. So my questions are to Mr. Zuckerberg. Uh, when you came before our committee in 2018, you acknowledged that Facebook had, had used what you just said, clear standards preventing the sale of illegal drugs on your site. But you were shown, uh, you were shown examples of active posts the traffickers were still using that platform unlawfully to sell prescription opioids. Now, uh, you, you did apologize and confirm that, quote, social media companies need to do a better job of policing these posts, close quote. Now, three years later, it appears a shell game is emerging. Facebook seems to have cleaned up its act, but you're now allowing Instagram, one of your subsidiaries, to become the new vehicle even though Instagram has, has the same policies against the sale of illegal substances, you're still allowing bad actors to push pills on your site. Look, it didn't take long for our staff to find numerous examples. For example, here's uh, oxycodone that, that, that was, is being sold on your site. Here's Ritalin that's being sold on your site. Here's Xanax and Adderall that's being sold on your site. So. I, I, th these posts, have, they're not new. They've been active since last fall. If we can find posts this easily, shame on you for not finding them for yourself. Apparently, you're not taking the warnings of Congress seriously. After drug manufacturers dump millions of pills into our community, killing thousands, ravaging families, and destroying livelihoods, 
Congress responded by passing laws to hold them liable. If a retail store is selling cigarettes or other to underage kids, that store is held liable. So why shouldn't you be held liable as well? Don't you, do you think you're above the law? You're knowingly allowing this poison to be sold on your platform into our communities, to our children, to our vulnerable adults. Look, I've read Scott Galloway's book before. I encourage all the members on this committee to, to read as well. It's a perfect depiction of the arrogance of big tech companies like Facebook, Google, Apple, and Amazon. He develops a very compelling argument as to why big tech companies should be broken into smaller companies, much like that occurred in AT&T in 1984. Maybe it's time for Congress to have an adult conversation about this loss of liability protection and the need to reform our antitrust laws. I don't think Congress wants to tell you how to run your company, but maybe it should. So Mr. Zuckerberg, let me, let me close this one question. And so don't you think you'd find a way to stop these illegal sales on your platforms if you were held personally liable? Keep on getting muted. Um, Congressman, we don't want any of this content on our platforms. And I agree with you that this is a huge issue. We've devoted a lot of resources and have built systems that are largely quite effective at, at finding and removing the content. But I just think that what we all need to understand is that at the scale that that, that these communities operate, where people are, are sharing millions or, or, or in messages, billions of things a day, it is inevitable that we will not find everything, just like a police force in a city will not stop every single crime. Um, I agree, so I think that we I should ask you the question very directly, Mark. I did it. Like, should you not be held liable when people are dying because your your people are allowing these sales to take place? We did it with manufacturers. We do it to the stores. Why aren't we doing it to the salesman that allows this to take place? Well, Congressman, I, I don't think we're allowing this to take place. We're we're building systems that take the vast majority of this content off our systems. And what I'm saying. This Three years, Mark. We've been doing three years. This has been going on, and you said you were going to take care of it last time. But all you do is switch from Facebook over to Instagram. They're still doing it now, and you're saying we need to do more. Well, how many more families are going to die? How many more children are going to be addicted while you still study the problem? I think you need Cut. to be held liable. Congressman, we're, we're not we're not sitting and studying the problem. We're building effective systems that work across both Facebook and Instagram. But what I'm saying is that. I don't think that we can expect that any platform will find every instance of harmful content. I think we should hold the platforms to be responsible for building generally effective systems at moderating these kinds of content. Gentlemen's time is expired. I'm not going to get an answer, Mike. Thank you. Gentlemen yields back. Uh, the chair recognizes Ms. Blunt Rochester for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to wave on to this important hearing and thank you to the witnesses. Uh, I wanna focus on two areas. Uh, first, a consumer protection and safety issue. And second, more broadly, uh, manipulation and privacy of our data. Uh, on consumer protection and safety, earlier this year, two infants from two different families ended up in the intensive care unit in Wilmington, Delaware, after being fed homemade baby formula based on instructional videos viewed on YouTube. One infant suffered from cardiac arrest that resulted in brain damage. For years, the American Academy of Pediatrics has warned parents against homemade baby formulas because it puts infants at risk of serious illness and even death. And since at least 2018, the FDA has recommended against the use of homemade formula. Even as recent as 29 days ago, the FDA issued an advisory against homemade formula. In February, my office informed your team, Mr. Pichai, uh, and as a follow-up, I've sent a letter requesting information and action on this issue um, and hope in the hopes of a response by April 1st. Uh, Mr. Pichai, this is just a yes or no question. Uh, can I count on a response to my letter by the deadline of April 1st? Congresswoman, uh, definitely yes. Heartbreaking to hear the stories. We have clear policies. My understand. Thanks for your uh, 
highlighting this area. I think our, the videos have been taken down and we are happy to follow up and update with you. We, we, we checked today. Um, for years, these videos have clearly violated your own stated policy of banning the videos that endanger the, as you say, quote, physical well-being of minors. And so I'm, I'm pleased to hear that we will be hearing back from you. And while we're considering Section 230, what's clear from this hearing is that we should all be concerned by all of your abilities to adequately and just as importantly, rapidly moderate content. In some of these cases, we're talking life and death. Uh, second, um, as many of my colleagues have noted, your companies profit when users fall down the rabbit hole of disinformation. The spread of disinformation is an issue all of us grapple with from all across the political spectrum. Disinformation often finds its way to the people most susceptible to, be, to it because the profiles that you create through massive data collection um, suggest what they would be receptive to. Um, I introduced the Detour Act to address common tactics that are used to get such personal data um, as possible. And these tactics are often called dark patterns, and they are intentionally deceptive user interfaces that trick people into handing over their data. For the people at home, many of you may know this as when you go on an app, it doesn't allow you to have a no option or it will insinuate that you need to do something else, install another program like Facebook Messenger app to get on Facebook. You all collect and use this information. Um, Mr. Pachai, uh, yes or no, would you oppose legislation that banned the use of intentionally manipulative design techniques that trick users into giving up their personal information? Uh, we definitely are happy to have oversight on these areas and explain Thank what you. to do. I have to go to Mr. Dorsey. Mr. Dorsey, yes or no? Open to it. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg. Congresswoman, I, I think the principle yes, no, makes please. sense and the details matter. Okay. Mr. Zuckerberg, your company recently conducted this massive ad campaign on how far the internet has come in the last 25 years. Great ad. Um, you ended with the statement, we support updated internet regulations to address today's challenges. Um, unfortunately, the proposal that you direct your viewers to fails to address dark patterns, user manipulation, or deceptive design choices. Mr. Zuckerberg, will you commit now to include deceptive design choices as part of your platform for better internet regulations? Congresswoman, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. My my initial response is that I think that there are other areas that I, I think might be more just, urgently in need. That that might be your, if you say this is a, a, a desire of yours to address the issues that we face today, dark patterns goes back to, you know, um, 2010, the, you know, this whole issue of deceptive practices. And I hope that you will um, look into it. Um, I, I will say, um, Ms. Trahand and others have mentioned, she mentioned our children, others have mentioned seniors, veterans, people of color, even our very democracy is at stake here. We must act and assure you, we will assure you, we will act. Thank you so much. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back six seconds. I thank the general lady. Uh, general lady yields back. And now the chair recognizes Mr. Griffith for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. According to new data from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, Cyber Tip Line found that the vast majority of child exploitation reports were on big tech sites. Facebook had the most, 20.3 million. Google was second with 546,000 plus. Twitter had 65,000 plus. Put in perspective, MindGeek, the Canada-based parent company of major porn websites, had 13,229. Facebook claims 90% of the flag incidents were duplicates. All right, let's accept that. That still leaves over 2 million incidents. 2 million incidents. Mr. Zuckerberg, yes or no? Does Facebook have a problem with child exploitation on its platform? Uh Congressman, this is an area that we work on a lot, but the reason why those numbers are so high is because we're so proactive about trying to find this and, and send it to Nick Mick and, and others um, who, who are doing good work in this area. We um, send, send content and flags over to them um, quite liberally whenever we think that we might see that something is an issue. 
And that's, I think, what the public should want us to do, not criticize yeah. us for sending over a large number of flags, but um, but, sure. but, uh, but, uh, but should encourage the companies to do it. You're admitting that you all have a problem, and, you're, and you're, this is one way you're trying to work on it. Uh, Mr. Pichai, yes or no, do you agree with Mr. Zuckerberg that you all have a problem? Are you there? Congressman, uh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, this is an area which we invest very heavily. We have been praised by several authorities. Uh, we work proactively. So the answer is yes. Mr. Dorsey, yes or no? Do you agree? If we see any problems, we try to resolve them as quickly as possible. But you do have problems, and that's why you're trying to resolve them. I, I get that. The problem is when you're talking about millions of incidents and we take 90 percent of them as duplicates from the facebook data that's millions of incidents that are happening where our children are being e exploited with child pornography on you all sites we got to do better uh i think you all need uh, for everything that we've talked about today an independent industry-wide review team like uh electronic um the electronic industry did with the underwriters laboratory nearly 150 years ago i told you all that uh when you were here before Nobody's done anything. I don't think it needs to be within your company. I think it needs to be outside. And, and on that vein, I would say to Google, special permission uh, was given to uh, Moonshot CVE to target ads against uh, extremists keywords. Moonshot then directed thousands of individuals who searched for violent content to videos and posts of a convicted felon who who espouses anti-law enforcement, anti-Semitic, and a anarchist viewpoints. Mr. Pachai, are you aware of this problem? Uh, Congressman, I'm not aware of the specific issue. Last year, we blocked over 3.1 billion uh, bad ads, 6,000 ads per minute, and so we enforce vigorously. But I'm happy to look into this specific issue and follow up back with you. Well, here's what happened. You partnered with an outside group that didn't do their job. What are your standards when you partner with an outside group? What are your standards and what are your philosophy? Because they sent people who were already looking for violence to an, a convicted felon with anarchist and anti-Semitic views. There is no place for hate speech. And, you know, I uh, am disappointed to hear of uh, this. We will definitely look into it and follow back with you. Well, and I appreciate that. I, I, I recognize that, but I had the same concerns that Mr. McKinley had, and you weren't here last time, but we heard these same kinds of things about how we're going to work on it and how we're going to get these problems resolved. Uh, and I forget when that hearing was, but a year or so ago, and yet we continue to have the same problems where political candidates uh, information is being taken down uh, because for some reason it's it's flagged. Uh, where conservatives and people on the left are being uh, hit and taken down. And I agree with many of the sentiments on both sides of the aisle that if, if, if you all aren't doing anything and it appears that you're not moving fast enough, we have no choice in Congress but to take action. I don't want to. I'd rather see you all do it like the electric industry did with Underwriters Laboratory. But nobody's doing that. Nobody's coming up with a group that both sides of the aisle and the American families can feel comfortable with. And so we're going to have to take action, and it's probably going to be this year. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes um, Ms. Schreier for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Uh, I'm a pediatrician, and I've spent my life calming patients who are nervous about vaccines because of online misinformation. Um, in fact, that's why I introduced the Vaccines Act when I was a new member of Congress. Did you know that there are doctors who, after spending their entire day on the front line fighting this virus, they come home at night and spend their scarce free time and family time fighting misinformation about vaccines online? And this misinformation, of course, comes primarily from Facebook and Twitter. So the question is, why do they do that? Well, they do it because of things like this that happened after I introduced uh, the Vaccines Act. Here are some overt threats. Keep shoving this vaccine mantra down people's throats and expect riots. 
be careful, you will answer for this tyranny one day. She needs to just disappear. Can we vote her out of office? I'm enraged over these poison pushers. We have weapons and are trained to fight off possible forced vaccinations. I will die protecting my family. And then there's just the misinformation. It says safe and effective many times, yet no vaccine has been studied in a double blind study. False. Who's gonna take this vaccine? I heard rumors that it changes a person's DNA. False. Uh, you do not give, excuse my language, you do not give a shit about the health and welfare of our children. This horrid vaccine has already killed 600 people. You're deplorable. And of course that again is false. So while the overt threats are unsettling, particularly after January 6th, I think about this whole ecosystem, your ecosystem that directs a hostile sliver of society en masse to my official Facebook page. And these are not my constituents. In fact, most came from two specific groups that directed their members to my page. Um, Mr. Zuckerberg, I have some questions for you. I know you understand these issues are important and sometimes misinformation can be very hard to spot. Would you agree? Congresswoman, I agree with both of those. This is important and, and the enforcement processes can be difficult. Thank you. And I heard your answer earlier to Representative Upton's question that um, there are 35,000 people doing content review of posts that have been flagged by users in AI. Can you tell me what content review means and how many of those 35,000 are dedicated to topics regarding health? Uh, Congresswoman, Yes, what, what the people are doing overall is, you know, content gets flagged either by the AI systems or by another person in the community. And if the AI can't by itself determine that something either violates or doesn't, um, then it gets flagged for, for human review and human judgment. And the 35,000 people go through all those different cues um, focused on all of the different types of harms that we've discussed today. I don't have the number off the top of my head about how many of them are focused on vaccine misinformation. But as you know, we have a policy that doesn't allow vaccine misinformation, and we work with the WHO and CDC to take down false claims around COVID um, and, and the vaccines around that, that that could cause harm. That's where it really gets tricky because you have to have experts and healthcare professionals who really understand, are, they, are your people trained in healthcare to really even be able to discern what's real, what's fake, and what to take down? Congresswoman, the people who set the policies either are experts in these areas or engage in a consultative process where they talk to a lot of these different folks. In this case, we largely defer to the CDC and WHO on which claims they think are going to be um, harmful. And then we try to break that down into kind of very simple protocols that the 35,000 people can follow and that we can build into AI systems to go find as much of that content proactively as possible without requiring all those people to be medical experts. So with my short time remaining, I would love to jump to that part about, about the CDC because um, I want to turn my attention to the, the COVID Resource Center that you describe as a central part of your efforts to fight misinformation. You directed over 2 billion people to the COVID-19 Information Center. But on that information page, almost all of the content links to additional Facebook pages. It looks to me like an extension of Facebook's walled garden that just keeps users on the site instead of link directly to authoritative trusted sources like the CDC. So knowing that uh, your platform is a large source of misinformation, did you consider just referring people directly to sites like the CDC rather than keeping them within your platform? Congresswoman, I, I think we have considered both and I think we have done both in different cases. Um, I, the team is is very focused on on building this in the way that's going to be most effective at getting people to actually see the content. And I, I believe that they've concluded that um, showing content from you know, people who, who within a, a, a person's community that they're going to trust on the services is one of the most effective things that we can do. General Lady's time has expired. Thank you. I yield back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Crenshaw for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. It's been a long one. Look, I've been on social media longer than anyone in Congress, I think. I was one of the first schools to have Facebook back in 2004. And it seemed to me that the goal of social media was simply to connect people. 
Now, the reason we're here today is because over time, the role of social media has expanded in an extraordinary way, and your power to sway opinions and control narratives is far greater than the U.S. government's power ever has been. And so I noticed a trend today. There's a growing desire from many of my colleagues to make you the arbiters of truth. See, they know you have this power, and they want to direct that power for their own political gain. Mr. Zuckerberg, since you know, Facebook was my first love, uh, I'm going to direct questions at you. And this isn't a trick question, I promise. Do you believe in the spirit of the First Amendment, free speech, robust debate, basic liberal values? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. See, my colleagues can't infringe on the First Amendment. The American people in their speech are protected from government as they should be. My colleagues, this administration, they can't silence people they disagree with no matter how much they want to. But I do think they want to. Just in this hearing, I've heard Democrats complain about misinformation, by which they clearly mean political speech they disagree with. They've complained today that Prager University content is still up. I've heard them accuse conservative veterans of being tinfoil hat wearing extremists, and that opinions on climate change that they disagree with should be taken down. This is quite different from the Republican complaint that illegal content needs to be addressed. There's a growing number of people in this country that don't believe in the liberal values of free speech and free debate. I promise you the death of the First Amendment will come when the culture no longer believes in it. When that happens, then it becomes okay to jail or investigate citizens for speech, like has happened in Canada and throughout Europe. Their culture turned against free speech. You all sitting here today as witnesses are part of the culture. You can stand up for the spirit of open debate and free speech, or you can be the enemy of it. And your stance is important because it's clear that many want to weaponize your platforms to get you to do their bidding for them. Mr. Zuckerberg, do you think it's your place to be the judge of what is true when it comes to political opinions? Uh, Congressman, no, I, I don't believe that we should be the arbiter of truth. Thank you. And look, I promise you this, as long as you resist these increasing calls from politicians to do their political bidding for them, I will have your back. When you don't, you become an enemy of liberty and longstanding American tradition. You might all agree in principle with what I just said, Mr. Zuckerberg, you clearly do, and I appreciate, I have a feeling the others would answer it as well, I just don't have time to ask everybody. But the fact remains that community standards on social media platforms are perceived to be applied unequally and with blatant bias. Mr. Dorsey, in just one example, I saw a video of that from Project Veritas that was taken down because they confronted a Facebook executive on his front lawn. But here's the thing, I can show you a video of CNN doing the exact same thing to an old woman who was a Trump supporter in her front yard. I've looked at both videos. It's an apples to apples comparison. CNN remains up, Project Veritas was taken down. I'll, I'll give you a chance to respond to that. I have a feeling you're gonna tell me you have to look into it. I, I, I don't have an understanding of the, of the case, but I would imagine if we were to take a video like that down, it would be due to a doxing concern, private address. The, the, the address was blurred out. I, look, it, it, you don't have it. You don't have the case in front of you. I get that. The point is, is there's countless examples like this. I, I, I just asked. I just found that one today. There's countless examples like this. So even if we agree in principle and everything I just went over, you guys have lost trust. And you've lost trust because this bias is seeping through. We need more transparency. We need better appeals process and more equitable application of your community guidelines because we have to root out political bias in these platforms. I, I think, and, I, and I've talked with a lot of you uh, offline, or at least your, your, your staff, and I think there's some agreement there. And I haven't heard in this hearing anybody ask you what you're doing to, 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 to achieve these goals. So I will allow you to do that now. Maybe Mr. Zuckerberg will start with you. Sorry, to achieve which goals? More transparency, more more feeling that the better appeals process for content yeah. taken down, more equitable application of community guidelines. So for transparency, we issue quarterly community standards enforcement reports on how, like what prevalence of harmful content of each category from you know, terrorism to incitement of violence to child exploitation, all the things that we've talked about, how much of it there is and how effective we are at, at, at finding that and, um, and, and stats around that. For appeals, the biggest thing that we've done is set up this independent oversight board, which is staffed with people who all have a strong commitment to free expression um, for whom people in our community can ultimately appeal to them. And, and that group will make a binding decision, including overturning several of the things that we've taken down and telling us that we have to take them, that we have to put them back up. And then we respect that. 
gentleman's time has expired. Uh, chair now recognizes uh, last but not least my fellow Pennsylvanian, Mr. Joyce. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you for yielding and thank you, Mr. Chairman and the ranking members for convening this hearing. I thank you all, it's been a long day, but this is an incredibly important day. We have heard consistently during this hearing about alarming accounts of content policing, censorship, and even permanent deplatforming of individuals. I've also been concerned about the lack of transparency and consistency in Facebook's application of Facebook's own standards. As you mentioned, I'm a representative from Pennsylvania. And in my district, Facebook shut down the personal pages of Walt Tuchalski and Charlotte Schaefer, as well as the Adams County Republican Committee Facebook page that they administered in historic Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And this all occurred without warning. Since the pages were taken down in December, these Pennsylvanians haven't received an acceptable answer from Facebook about why they were banned nor have they been given the opportunity to appeal this decision. Mr. Zuckerberg, could you please explain how something like this could happen? Congressman, I'm, I'm not familiar with those specific details, but in general, I agree that building out a better appeals process and better and more transparent communication to people about why specific decisions were made is one of the uh, most important things that we need to do next. And, and that's um, one of the big things on our roadmap for for this year and next year, and I, um, I I hope we can we can dramatically improve those experiences. Mr. Zuckerberg, may I get from you a commitment that a more concise and transparent appeals process will be developed? Uh, Congressman, yes, we're working on on uh, a more transparent communication to people and um, and more of an appeals process as part of our product roadmap now, like I just said. And will you commit to getting my constituents answers as to why they were banned? Uh, Congressman, I can certainly have uh, my, my team follow up with them and, and, and make sure that we, can, that we can do that. Thank you for that. I am also concerned by potential partisan bias in Facebook's enforcement of its content policies. Shutting down the Adams County Republican Committee Facebook page strikes me as an infringement on speech and that is normally protected in the public domain. Mr. Zuckerberg, does Facebook maintain data on how many Democrat and Republican County Committee pages that you have banned from your platform? No, Congressman, we don't. We, we don't generally uh, keep any data on, on, the, on whether the people who use our platform are Democrats or Republicans, so it's hard for us to- Then let me, any, and any I know the time is running short here and it's a long day, but Mr. Zuckerberg, you say you have not maintained that data. Would you consider gathering such data to, there, to verify that there is no political bias in your enforcement algorithms? Congressman, I'm not sure uh, that that's a that that's a great idea, and that I don't know that most people would want us to to collect data on whether they're a Democrat or a Republican, and 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 have that be a part of our. our I think our there's a system. huge disparity as I represent Pennsylvania, and I think that that data would be appreciated if shared with us in a fair manner. My next question is to Mr. Dorsey: Does Twitter maintain data on the political affiliations of accounts that you block? No. Have you determined that any political bias is necessary for your enforcement? I'm not sure what you mean, but no. I think that these discussions today are so important. I think that you all recognize that the platforms that you represent have developed an incredible ability for Americans to connect and contact. But these free speech that we hold so dear to us must be maintained. Again, I thank the chairman. I thank the ranking member for bringing us together and allowing us to present what I feel are sincere concerns to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman yields back. Uh, everyone who wanted to ask a question has asked one. Uh, and I wanna thank all of you for your patience today. Uh, I request unanimous consent to enter the following records, testimony, and 
other information into the record. A uh, letter from Asian Americans Advancing Justice, a letter from the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, a letter from New America's Open Technology Institute, a letter from New York Small Pharma Limited, a statement from the Alphabet Workers Union, letters from National Black Jacks Justice Coalition, a letter from Seeks for Justice, a letter from state AGs, a letter from the Computer and Communications Industry Association, a letter from AVAAZ, uh, opening statement from Anna Eshoo, a blog from Neil Freed of Digital Frontiers Advocacy, a letter from the music community, a letter from the Disinfo Defense League, a letter from Consumer Reports, a report from the Center for Countering Digital Hate called the Disinformation Dozen, a letter from the Coalition for a Secure and Transparent Internet, a letter from the Seek American Legal Defense and Education Fund, a letter from Gun Violence Survivors, Faces of Tech Harm Congress, Letter to YouTube from Rep. Eshoo, letter to Facebook from Rep. Eshoo, letter to Twitter from Rep. Eshoo, a longitudinal analysis of YouTube's promotion of conspiracy, vid video, conspiracy videos, a letter from the Alliance for Safe Online Pharmacies, a CCIA statement, a comment by Donovan et al. from the Technology and Social Change Team, a Wall Street Journal article titled Facebook Executives Shut Down Efforts to Make Site Less Divisive, a Voice of America article titled FBI Surge in Internet Crime Cost Americans $4.2 Billion, a Global Research uh, Project report, an opinion article titled Google is not cracking down on the most dangerous drug in America, an MIT technology review article titled How Facebook Got Addicted to Spreading Misinformation, an article from The Independent, an article from The New Yorker, a letter from the Coalition of Safer Web, a New York Times article titled Tech Companies Detect the Surge in Online Videos of Child Sex Abuse, an MIT review article titled Thank You for Posting Smokers Lessons for Regulating Smoke Social Media, <clears throat> an article from Imprimis, an article from The Atlantic, a New York Times article titled Square, Jack Dorsey's pay service is withholding money merchants say they need. A response letter from Twitter to Rep. Rogers, a response letter from Google to Rep. Rogers, a response letter from Facebook to Rep. Rogers, an article from Engadget, a letter regarding Spanish language misinformation, data from the Centers for Disease Control, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and the Mercado, Holland, Lima, Stone, and Wang regarding teen mental health, a report from the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, without objection, so ordered. I want to thank our witnesses today uh, for appearing. We appreciate it. Um, we appreciate your patience uh, while you answer these questions from all members. I, I hope you can take away from this hearing how serious uh, we are on both sides of the aisle to see many of these issues that trouble Americans address. Uh, but thank you for being here today. I want to remind all members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by the witnesses who have appeared. And I would ask that each witness to respond promptly to any questions that you may receive. At this time, this hearing is adjourned. Oh, no, Mr. Mr. Chairman.